This is going to be the first ever live reading online simulcast across Facebook Live and Periscope of a novel by its author. So um, let's uh, dive back into it here and start back from the beginning. So confession, name of the book, and we start out with a quote from Aldous Huxley. In silence, an act is an act is an act. Verbalized and discussed, it becomes an ethical problem. Aldo Huxley from The Genius and the Goddess. Chapter 1. Am I a good person? I like to think so. I mean, I think I am. What is good, anyway? My life, like anyone else's, has had its share of rough patches. Times when I've done differently than I'd preferred in hindsight. But is it bad to make a mistake? No, I don't think so. What's most important is that we recognize our missteps and take responsibility for them. I guess that's why I'm talking to you. Let me be clear. My life hasn't been marred by evil. It barely contains a stain, and even those have mostly faded, cleaned away by time and numerous washings. But there are some things I've done that I wish I hadn't, and quite a few other things that were probably just outright bad. That's why I'm talking to you. You can judge me when all has been said and done. That's what this whole conversation is for. But please do me the courtesy of waiting until I've finished. I've lived a fairly uneventful life, as far as lives are concerned. I haven't done great things, I haven't scaled mountains, written great missives, or stood arm in arm with my brothers on the battlefield. But like any other man, I have lived, and during my 46 years, I've done both good and bad. The question now, of course, is where to start. My birth would have been of little interest, as would my childhood, I fear. They were both normal, or as normal as anyone else's. Yes, I know I'm rambling, I'm just trying to get my bearings here. There's a lot to tell, and it's just overwhelming to think of where to start. I guess I can just start anywhere and go from there. Let's start where it's easiest. Back in my 20s, I thought I knew everything, just like most young men do. I had yet to experience failure, and I had yet to be humbled. My life in front of me, I was certain I already had the important parts all worked out. This, however, didn't stop me from cavorting with my share of unsavory characters. No, I still did that. I guess I did even more of that in my youth than I do now. Probably because I felt so invincible. I didn't fit in with them exactly, but I did get along with them just fine. Their lives were vulgar and undesirable, but still I spent many a night wasted on their sofas, listening to music and pumping my body with whatever drugs happened to be pulled from the lint of someone's pocket. I never did anything alone, but I did do enough of it to with my friends to say I was teetering on the edge of a habit. Did I know these people were unsavory at the time? Absolutely. And I presume that's why I spent the time with them that I did. One can bring himself up to great heights by simply surrounding himself with others who are lower. It's just an illusion of perspective, to be fair. But it does pad the ego. They were a dirty, foul bunch with no future in front of them. I, on the other hand, held great promise. They wouldn't amount to anything, yet I would, and that gave me solace. I could watch them slowly wither away in front of me. Their self-destruction was no cliché, watching their hopes and dreams go down the drain. No, they had no hopes or dreams to begin with. They were born losers, destined to fail even if they had put any effort into life. But that wasn't me. I was elevated by my very nature and impervious to such downfalls. My presence, while not unwelcome, was for them an act of convenience. I had money, they didn't, and most nights I simply had nothing better to do with my time. The money? Oh, yeah, I definitely was what you might consider a financier. I liked to help them out, and I got great pleasure by simply being an investor in their pain avoidance. Though I admit I succumbed to the simplicity of those chemical solutions quite often as well. It wasn't charity. Oh, God, no. It was compatriotism. They weren't my friends, but they helped me pass the time. I figured sooner or later that I'll be dead anyway, and I could then just move on with my life. Either that or I'd just walk out when I felt like it. I remember one night in particular, splayed out on a crusty brown sofa that reeked of beer and bong water, listening to them all blabber. I had no idea what they were saying. It was just gibberish. Gibberish from a bunch of rats who crawled out of the sewers into society where they feigned human humanity for a while until they slunk back into their holes and died. Why spend time with them then? I already told you, they lifted my spirits. There's nothing as uplifting as watching another person suffer, especially if he's ignorantly happy in his suffering. That's the thing with these people, they weren't unhappy. They were honestly much happier than me. But it was 
It's just so invigorating watching them flounder about with their meaningless jobs, delivering pizzas to college kids, or styling businessmen's wives' hair that I couldn't fathom them actually being happy. They thought they were, or at the very least appeared to be, but I knew that one day, maybe soon, or maybe on their deathbed, they'd realize it. Their lives had been complete wastes, and they'd done nothing good for anyone. Then they'd be back at the bottle or the pill, back into the ignorance and disgust they called life. No, they weren't all bad. They had their positive qualities, and they all did appear to be genuinely caring for each other. There was a bit of security there, knowing that should any of us fall, another would be there to pick us back up. But the thing of it is, there really wasn't a lot of heavy lifting involved in putting us back where we fell from. Happy in ignorance, drugged up and living our lives, they were the reason for my own. I hated being with them, but I couldn't live without them. Until one day I decided I just didn't want to see him again. Late one muggy night in late summer, my friends and I were coming down listening to massive attacks protection. We'd been out late, partying, dancing our cares away, and making spiritual connections under the influence of some choice E and a soundtrack of 808 State, Orbital, Future Sound of London, probably some Prodigy too, and their earliest stuff, none of that Firestarter bullshit, or whatever else was hot at the party scene at that time, I don't, I don't know. The clock showed it was well past three, and Tracy Thorne was guiding us back to reality, when all of a sudden our blissful malaise was inconveniently interrupted. The door shuddered in its frame from the hammering. I seriously thought the lock was going to break. The drywall cracked, thin spiderwebs at the pounding, and bits of dust and plaster fell to the floor. I looked at the door, then to the others. I wasn't about to answer it. I arched my eyebrows and gestured with my head. Someone see who it is, I said. Well, the idiot who opened the door didn't think to look through the peephole first. He opened the door a crack, and even that was too far. The door kicked open hard, knocking my friend down, and a stout, bloody Latino stood there looking straight at me. At least he seemed to be looking at me. One eye was swollen completely shut, and the other seemed to have a hard time focusing on anything. His windbreaker was torn to shreds, and a big red gash marred his left cheek. Let me in, he yelled as he pushed his way past the guy at the door. A few of his friends, whose presence I hadn't even noticed, followed obediently and surrounded him like ten-cent bodyguards as he dropped himself on my coach. Some fucker tried to jump me. He looked at me like I cared. I cared all right. I cared that he was bleeding all over my furniture. But we stopped him. It was some guy from his posse. A big shitty grin spread over his face. Luis, that was the bleeder's name. He glared at his amigo, shutting him up, and turned his eyes to me. Listen, I need some place to crash for a while. I have to wash up. I just wanted him out of the apartment. Now, that minute. Preferably sooner. There was no way I was going to get my couch clean. You need to do more than wash up. You need some serious medical attention, I said. Want me to call the hospital or something? His friends perked up at the suggestion, gathered around me like a pack of feral dogs. Probably thought that by hospital I meant police. No way, man, it's fine, he dismissed them with a wave of his hand. Just let me clean up. I begrudgingly let him and his friends spend the next few hours at my place. Kicking him out wasn't an option, and I didn't have the fight in me to try anyway. He cleaned himself up with my dish rags and dried himself with my kitchen towels, staining them all crimson with his blood. While he dressed his wounds, I noticed his beating was much worse than I originally thought. His body was covered in bruises. And he had what looked like a pretty serious knife wound in his arm. From shielding himself from his attacker, I assume, he wrapped the gash in gauze, which quickly soaked through. I was pretty sure he needed stitches, but I felt it was probably smarter to keep my mouth shut. As the night progressed, my mind slowly cleared from the drugs. I remember standing in my living room, looking at him asleep on my couch with his friend, snoring away on my floor. I thought to myself, why the hell is my drug dealer here? Why did he come to my house? And how does he even know where I live? He left early the next morning, just after the first pinks of sunrise lit the sky. But that night, while he slept, staining my couch with his blood, I decided I was out. This was not the life I had signed up for, or at least not the life I wanted to stay part of. Things had gotten way too close to home. They'd actually come home, and I wasn't about to let them get any worse. I stopped buying from this guy. In fact, I stopped buying drugs completely. For a few minutes, I still, or for a few months, I still hung out with the crowd and financed many a purchase, but I pretty much extricated myself from any contact with the sellers. In addition to keeping me out of harm's way and my house free from gangs of hemorrhaging drug dealers, 
It allowed me to gradually wean myself off the stuff. By relying on others and not having stashes of my own, I forced myself to slowly give it up. The, re the relationships faded. They faded away along with my usage. Once I wasn't using, they weren't really that much fun to be around anymore. I don't even know if they noticed I stopped showing up. I still think about the band of failures from time to time, and I don't think of them fondly. I think of them as they were, sad and pathetic, unaware of the place they inhabited, and unaware that they would never succeed, that they would never be someone worthwhile other than maybe heroes to others of their creed. I got out, but none of them did. It was easy for me, because I was never in. I was never one of them. I knew better. So now that we're on the subject, I guess I can admit it. I've done bad things to my body. I've also broken the law. And I suppose those infractions could be considered sins. I'll leave that up to you. But I just thought I should start with something simple. We can go from here. Thanks again for taking the time to listen. Drink of water here quick. Chapter 2. Rainy days really are a drag, aren't they? We're stuck inside here with nothing to do but talk. At least it's a dreary day today, though. Because honestly, if the sun were shining, I'd much rather be outside than in here with you. And as autumn sighs its dying breaths, and the days turn cold, one has to take advantage of the sunny times, right? At least this gives me an excuse to stay in. Oh, but a sunny autumn day. I just love to hear the crunch of leaves beneath my feet, like beetle shells on an ancient cave floor. Don't you think? Also, fall has a special smell to it. And it's just that, that autumny smell. I don't know for certain, but it's probably just a smell of rot and decay tricking us into thinking of something special. But it smells so fresh and crisp, and we all love it. I know I do. A hike on a warm November day, that's what we live for. And it's not too late in the season that you'll get a chill, but it's cool enough that you get a bit of a bite in your lungs. It's invigorating to be outside this time of year. But not today. Today is just unseasonably cold and rainy. It's really a waste of a day. So, we're inside. Fire's warm. The air feels toasty. Like a blanket. Wrapped snug and tight around your shoulders. The heat of fire this time of year is such a welcome thing. It's not like summer where on a hot day you're sweaty and uncomfortable from the oppressive weight of it. The man-made warmth and the glowing embers of a well-kept fire. They avoid those sweaty discomforts of a summer day. It's enveloping and safe. And made even more comforting by a view out the window. Yeah, the shutters are closed. We can't see outside, but we can still hear the, hear the rain. It's tapping on the roof above us as it drones on with its job. It makes us aware that it exists, whether we see it or not. And we're safe from the chill and shivers it would otherwise bring. We're here. It's warm. Outside, it's cold and wet. Thank God for matchsticks and thank God for houses. Chapter 3. Around the same time, I had a friend who... Let, let me clear this up. I need to make sure you're not misunderstanding me. I wasn't a complete deadbeat during this time. Those potheads and dropouts I hung out with, they weren't the only people I surrounded myself with. I had plenty of friends and acquaintances who were basically normal. They had their jobs, like I had mine, and they had their little picnics and Saturdays at the dog park and Sunday family barbecues. And I went to a lot of them. I just wasn't just a man of one world, I was a man of many. And that one foot in the door socially accepted reality gave me a leg up and the confidence that I always had a way out of the other. One summer I was invited to a party at an acquaintance's house. The fireworks that night made me think it was the 4th of July, although I can't be certain of the date. Regardless, it was a summer night and I had been invited to a family gathering, though not my own family, someone else's. The day began, well, not the day, since I didn't get to the party until late afternoon or early evening, but I remember slipping on the wet, dewy grass as I walked across the lawn, struggling to see who was who. I got to the party just as the sun was setting and the smoky air held reminders of meats fresh off the grill. I ate a bit and spent some time talking to other people there, getting to know them. While we're on the subject, I'll let you in on a little secret. I never actually get to know people. I just pretend to. I talk to them. Share a laugh, listen to their stories, smile and nod. There's something trite about conversation. But still, everyone has to have it. 
if we were just all sitting around in one room together not talking to each other, it would be pretty uncomfortable. So we make up things to say, even though we're, they're meaningless. Hey, what about that sports game? Wow, sounds like a really fun trip. What do you do for a living? Look at the face, shake the hand, remember the name, and file away what you've learned until next time so you'll have something to talk about and continue your, meaning, and continue your meaningless relationship for who knows how long. It keeps up appearances, though. Sorry about that. Uh, it keeps up appearances, though. You're normal. They're normal. We all have normal lives. We all do our boring things, and we all care about them, and they're, oh, so interesting. Then we get home, sleep, and forget about everyone else and worry about ourselves again. And worry about ourselves again until the next time we have to interact with others. It was the same kind of situation at this get-together. I don't know who I talked to. I made a show of interest in their lives, but after the night was through, I had no plan on ever talking to these people again. I feigned concern, they engaged, and social interaction was born. On this point, I do admit, I am rather good at these interactions. The easiest way to have someone think you're interesting is to simply listen to what they have to say and act like you care about it. Ask questions, let them show how worldly and benevolent they are, and they'll be on your side for the remainder of the evening. Make false promises. Oh, yes, we must get together. Let's meet up for lunch sometime. They're gestures merely for show. And in the off chance someone takes the offer seriously and attempts to make contact in the future, well, that's what excuses are made for. Unless, of course, it's in your interest to continue the relationship further. There was one person that night, however, who I did find genuinely interesting. She was pretty in a meek, slouch-shoulder kind of way. A pretty little made-up, yet still, still pale face, decorated by a simple brunette, Bob, worth talking to you for the evening. Besides, one never knows where simple conversations can lead. Our conversation had off just fine, following the same protocols as any other conversation, but with additional tricks of flirtation added in. A smile, a touch on the arm, a laugh at a joke. Here, let me get you another drink. Then reality came in, rearing its ugly head. Reality in this instance being history and baggage and all the other things no one needs to know about someone until the time is right, which is preferably never. The host of the party, as I should have guessed, was related somehow to this woman who I have devoted the better half of my evening. To this day, I'm not quite sure how it came up. Perhaps it was simply due to another act of obligatory, ob obligatory conversation. But I learned from our host while filling our glasses with another round of wine that her father was a preacher. A preacher? Can you imagine that? <laughs> I think I did a good job hiding the look of shock on my face, although from the widening of my eyes and the abrupt change of tone in my, in my end of the conversation, meaning I killed it, uh, pretty clearly showed my host this shift in news would have, or pretty clearly showed the host the shift this news would have on my evening. Now, as you can guess, I'm not exactly a religious man. But that doesn't mean I know the answers to everything. I am here talking to you, after all. But what I cannot stand is one who believes what he, that he, what he or she believes without having any sort of real reason for it other than upbringing and momentum. I feared this was the case with the preacher's daughter. Above all, I can't stand self-righteousness. And that, in all honesty, is what I'd already been taught through experience to expect from those who build their shelter too closely to God. Back at her plaid blanket on the lawn, I placed a glass of wine in her outstretched hand. With the liquor already in my system working as a vocal lubricant, I jumped right into the topic. So, I heard your father's a preacher. That's right, she replied, leaving a healthy pause between us. She tugged at her earlobe, looking, expectant at, looking expectantly at me to continue with whatever point I was trying to make. I'm sure I asked her next what she thought of it and if she went to church. A nonchalant conversation using the tools of social discourse by showing interest in her and her background. It was an intimate moment, taking her conversation to a level of privacy not regularly explored at surface-level barbecue party banter. Talk of religion and politics is always said to be avoided, but I found that when one wants to bring things to a more personal level, one can do no better than to bring up discussions of what is core to a person's being. This wasn't the point of my interest, however, even though from the way she moved closer to me as we spoke, it was clear this was a topic dear to her, and one she longed to find a kindred spirit in. As often does in these instances, the conversation continued on civilly, 
until several drinks later, when, fully aware that the night would end lonesome, I tired of the dalliances and just went on with my destruction. Why do you believe? Can you give me proof? All the silly arguments one makes in philosophy classes as to why God must not exist. I didn't care if God existed, but what I did care about then was that this woman have reason for her beliefs. Why? Why do you believe in something that isn't there for you? Why haven't you found love, and why are you so alone? Silly woman. She cried a lot that night, I learned later. I can picture her in my mind. Her face streaked with runs of mascara at her father's side, bawling, Why? He was there that night, her father. I had said my hellos to him earlier, putting on my best proper young man face so I, could, so I wouldn't arouse his, his concern when I later showed interest in his daughter. So I could talk to her as an adult, without interference, and let the night go on as I hoped it would. I could only hope since she's thought about what I had to say and has questioned the reasoning for her beliefs. If I got her that far, at least the destruction of the other friendship, the host and I never spoke again after that incident, wasn't in vain. She's probably happier now than she's ever been because she was forced to think and then believe. Sometimes you have to break someone down to nothing just so they can rebuild. And when they rebuild, maybe they'll think about what they're building this time around. Never let a good crisis go to waste. So, create a crisis. I sometimes wonder if I shouldn't have been, if I shouldn't have been so hard on her. But was I really? I only asked her. I only asked that she helped me understand what it was that she knew so deeply in her heart to be true. Perhaps she could have saved me at the time, had she revealed some great unknown truth I had yet to discover. She didn't, though, and I haven't discovered it. Her tears made it pretty clear that she broke that night. But I'm sure she's doing fine. Here I am going on about nonsense that doesn't really seem to matter much in the greater scheme of things. Why do I even bring these events up? Maybe I feel a little bit of regret for the pain I brought upon her that night, but maybe I'm just proud of what I've done. It's the point of my whole reason for talking to you. It's the bigger riddle I'm hoping you can help me unravel. Am I a good person? What makes us good? Does simply doing what makes others feel does simply doing what makes others feel good make one good? Or does one need to challenge, tear down, build up, tear down, and recreate until the other has made his life his own? And not just the sum of the parts that have been preached as right and holy and just throughout their lives. Isn't the better option to help one see himself more clearly? With a lucidity that can only be brought through introspection. Is it my job to do this? If not me, then who? Why do I even bother? It's because I care about others and I want them to be happy and fulfilled in a truthful, authentic way of being. Not delusion, not blissful ignorance. Truthful happiness. That's our purpose, isn't it? To help our fellow man. It's in great service that my actions stem, though at times I do question the effectiveness of it all. I do good, people may see me as bad. Perhaps I'm just a martyr. I'll be back in just a second. Sorry about that. It's one of the things that happens when you're live. It means you have to deal with things. So I am back, and I need a drink of something here because my throat's starting to hurt. Only about 270 pages to go, people. Ready? Let's see where we left off. Alright. 
Chapter 4. Me? A preacher? No, I couldn't have been one. I'm definitely more on the martyr end of the religious spectrum. If I live anywhere on it at all. True, I do at times have quite a bit to say, like now. But it's not up to me to preach, no matter what gospel it would be. Guide people along a path when they're lost. Maybe. But preaching? Ugh, the idea alone just disgusts me. I mean, no, no offense, of course. Such a calling just doesn't really speak to me, and it wouldn't be truthful to myself to force my thoughts and knowledge onto others in such a heavy-handed manner. Besides, what do I know anyway? Yes, there are other ways more in line with my nature to do good. Charity and goodwill are always looked upon fondly. Philanthropy is quite often considered the truest, truest form of kindness. The nice thing about charity is that it's usually out in the open. Public service has its name for a reason, after all. It's for the benefit of the public, to be sure, but it's also visible to the public. A fact which, although a negative strike against altru the altruism, does give one the benefit of reaping rewards from what appears to be a purely selfless act. Give some of your time to a soup kitchen, or use your knowledge to tutor young children, and you'll be heralded as someone who cares. Really, that's the benefit of public work. No, no, there's also that. The act in itself is good, which means you're doing good, but you're also bringing benefit upon yourself, which is simply an added bonus. If someone is going to act out of charity, why not throw in a little self-fulfillment and reap the rewards, however meager they may be, for yourself? Positive actions in society lead to a more productive society, one with less fear or oppression or violence, and that in the end is a benefit to the benefactor, isn't it? We all want a better place to live, so I say yes, give yourself to charity, but still it's all the better if you can do it where someone will see you. They'll say, what a kind and generous man. He puts others be before himself and is absolutely a positive force in our little town. If only I could be more like him. No, it's not dishonesty. Your actions are still born out of good intentions, but why not pad oneself a little as payment for one's time? I do say, if I were charitable, I'd definitely avoid things like helping in soup kitchens and answering phone calls at emergency hotlines. No, those are acts of charity, among others, predisposed to charity. The only people who will see you while you're extolling virtue are others of the similar ilk, or those in need of the help, both of which you'd likely never be commiserating with outside of such an event in the first place. Charitable people tend to be so self-righteous and so boring. I'd much prefer to have the company with those who can discuss things other than their own benevolence, or how great it was to see each other at church on Sunday. This is why traditional charity, though beneficial in its own right, is something I steer clear of. Acts of kindness in public, opening a public restroom door for a cripple, tossing a lot of bills into a busker's guitar case in a subway station, or simply drowning a loud amount of spare change into the Salvation Army kettle at the grocery store, ideally with one's neighbors within hearing distance, are much more preferable. I do, however, try my best to avoid the simple act of giving financially, as you can't buy virtue. And such a blatant act comes off as cheap and simple to anyone else who is looking. A much lower return on investment. When presenting a sandwich... It's a much lower return investment. When presenting a sandwich to a hungry man, it would be much more dramatic than a dollar bill in his pocket. That's the biggest problem with pure philanthropy, I've found. It's the simplest way to do good. Just give a large sum of money towards some cause that others have deemed worthwhile, and you're a good person. But then the question festers in the back of others' minds. Did he do this for good? Or did he do this to have his name on a wall? It's a path to immortality, I suppose in some way or another, to get one's name on the wall or have a school or boulevard named after you. The John F. Kennedy Airport, the Lincoln Center, the Kodak Theater. It's really all just advertising in the end. Tonight's good deed brought to you in part by, insert last name here. What a grand and great man he was to give so selflessly. Let us praise him forever more for his generosity. Do you sense my sarcasm? Truly to give when one can is a noble act. But wouldn't the most noble act be to give without anyone knowing? But where's the benefit in that? This is why I tend to shy away from philanthropy myself. It's such a struggle to give. Pretend to remain anonymous, but make sure everyone knows it was you who gave in the first place. It feels deceptive, but public knowledge of what you've done isn't hurting anyone either. 
It's an act pure and true done for others, and you had nothing to do with it. But not so secretly, you did. And everyone will then remember how great and noble you were, all without looking like a paid placement in a television program. Yes, in time, people might forget, but that's of little consequence to anyone other than your kin. Just leave them a bit of money for themselves to squander after you've gone, and they'll remember you fondly as well. John Jr.'s Life, brought to you by John Sr. Oh, what a great man he was. But maybe it's best not to even care about that. When you're dead and gone, it makes no difference if, any, if anyone remembers you or not. For your benefit, is completely impossible to realize. By this time, you've been judged at the gates of heaven, haven't you? What matters is it to how people remember you afterward, so long as you did the right thing while you were here? Would it be better to give your money to philanthropy or to your offspring? Which one holds more moral value? Could I be faulted for helping countless strangers, but leaving my own children, should I have any, high and dry? For that matter, should I just let my kids starve at the same level as those who are starving, then give them all the same bits of food that I can provide in a, some sort of moral feeding approximation of socialism? These are questions which, of course, I don't have an answer to. But I look to you for some sort of guidance on what is the right and what is wrong. I only hope that you can give me some direction. Or just hold your tongue and let me continue to work this out on my own. If you'll excuse me for being so... Oh, this is chapter 5, sorry. If you'll excuse me for being so bold, how should I put this? I did honestly think this whole exercise would be a little bit easier. Truthfully, I did start this without knowing exactly what I was going to say but I figured it would all just kind of flow out of me I didn't have a box of note cards or lines or scars marking every one of my misdeeds I did however think this would be a little bit more like therapy but with absolution rather than the nonsense where you just talk and talk to someone while they nod and pretend to listen while they're really just counting the minutes until you leave so they can go spend the money you paid them on booze and women you know what I'm talking about a type of therapy where you're just uh, as well off as having talked to yourself for an hour? As you've worked through the solutions to your problems and achieved clarity completely on your own without having them utter a single word other, other than, go on, or how does that make you feel? No, this isn't like that at all. It's different somehow, but it's still not easy. Like I said, I don't have a list of misdeeds and I don't have some grand finale of a horrible secret I need to share with you. What I have is a life full of events, which in hindsight hold a moral weight. I find myself unable to measure it, though. I tried to start out earlier at a random place in my life, but the discussion has really taken me nowhere other than to fill you in on random musings and thought processes. A little goading might be helpful, but I can see that's not the way this interaction is going to work. You won't judge me until I'm finished. And then you can give me my penance. But the question currently rattling in my brain, this desultory abattoir of my skull, is where do we go next? There's still a lot to say, but none of it is a single act like, I killed a kitten, or I punched someone in the face. No, these are much subtler acts, with deeper underlying indications of right and wrong and one's place in the echelons of humankind. Yes, I've stolen. But it was in my youth, and I'm not proud of it. I've already prostrated myself before others, much like yourself, for those microscopic misdeeds, and I've done my penance to make up for them. My concern, rather, is that I have since done something much more horrible, made all the more horrible for not even recognizing its repugnance. Clarity is something we all seek, but often lack until it's either too late or, thank God, someone shines a light on the truth for you. What a tragedy it would be to live life thinking one was Mother Teresa but actually being Hitler in disguise. It wouldn't even have it wouldn't have even been a disguise, this Hitler mask. It would have been the true face seen by many, if not all, except for the one looking in the mirror. Hitler must have never thought himself a bad person. To have such conviction for one's belief that you'd be willing to go to the horrendous lengths he and his brethren did to push what they felt was moral and right? Good intentions and all that, I suppose. But I digress. I tell you, I'm trying to find focus in this confession, but you understand the weaknesses of people, for you, you're you one yourself. 
So I pray you'll continue to do the honor of humoring me while I continue with my confession. If that's even what this is. Again, I leave it up to you to decide. This whole business of not knowing reminds me of a terrible dream I have night after night. No, you're not. You're right. It's not literally night after night. But it is a dream, however, that I have quite regularly. Often enough that at times I can't help but believe it's quite possibly real. And the dreams are just memories surfacing of some monstrous exploit from my past, buried so deep that I have no choice but to forget them. But back it comes, night and night again in my sleep, reminding me of what I've done or telling me to be cautious of what I could do. For I honestly can't say if I did these deeds or not. No, that's not quite right. I know, or at least I'm pretty sure I know, that I never did these things. But the fact that confusion can come upon us as to if we did something or not, when that certain something is quite terrible, does call into question one's own sanity and moral compass. For a dream so vivid, I'm surprised I can even remember exactly how it begins. Perhaps it's because it begins in a different permutation every night, depending on what the plotline of the previous dream had been or whatever worries have been in the subconscious from a previous day. There's always a turning point, not exactly a denouement, but more of a revelation that everything is quite different from what it seemed. That moment is always in the basement, in the storage area, in the freezer. I honestly don't know what I'm doing there, at my childhood home, or what I'm looking for. Something simple like a pizza or some ice cream, probably. But then, after digging through the frozen layers of food, I find some large lump of something in freezer paper. I pull it out to see if perhaps I've located a roast or a turkey and the head of someone and find the head of someone I had long forgotten. I react in expected horror. This is quite a change of events, and no matter what the dream was leading up to this point, I'm not prepared for my discovery. Then the questions start. Do I confront my parents and ask them why there's a man's head in the freezer? Do I put it back and pretend I never saw it, for fear that should my discovery be known, I'd be next to join them in the frozen ice casket. Or do I call the police, turn my parents in for their crime? It makes no matter, for before I have time to act, my father comes into the room and sees what I have on display there under the sole bulb of the other eye's blackened room. We didn't know what to do with it, he says. I'm in shock and I don't respond. Your mother wanted to throw it in a lake, but I was worried it would float to the top. We're not experts in hiding this type of thing, he explains. I still have no idea what he's talking about or how the conversation is so nonchalant. Oh, I forgot. We never cooked that roast. What's that, then? There's a head in the freezer. Don't worry. It wasn't taking up much space. Then, as dreams often do, somehow time skips ahead and the story continues, but at the start of this next scene, I've come to the realization that I was the one who killed this person, and my parents were helping me hide the last remaining evidence of the crime. Yes, it was a pretty stupid way to hide the evidence and put them into much greater danger than they ever would would have risked had all this happened in reality but the fact that or the fact remains this is a dream in dreams and in real life for that matter people do completely irrational things and in this dream i am a murderer what's worse i don't remember being a murderer i can't remember what happened or any of the details of the event that is until i start looking back into my f past to figure out when and where it might have happened i of course don't ask anyone to explain it to me that would be insane, a man killing another than forgetting about it and asking for a quick recap. Previously on, whatever show is my life. Here's what you missed. Only a fool or an imbecile wouldn't tune in every week to his own show, and each of the plot details would definitely be remembered. There would be no refresher course on my life, not without it being a flashback episode of my own making. Trying to make sense of our dreams, however, is a fool's errand and a meaningless, meaningless exercise in self-psychoanalysis. There are probably reasons for the dream. Most likely, I'm grateful to my parents for risking what they have to help make me who I am and able to lead such a happy and productive life. Their risk, my reward, and I've not even noticed that they've gone out of their way to make it, me comfortable. Or maybe it's something much simpler than that. Maybe I've just killed someone and simply forgotten about it. And this is my brain reminding me that there is some proof out there that could get me in trouble. And I need to stay ever vigilant and never trust anyone because to do so would be to put myself at risk. That's the thing with this dream. In it, I dig deeper, trying to unravel what happened. Did I really do this? Of course I must have. 
why would my parents lie about such a thing? And even more so, why would they have my friend's head in their freezer? I find it rather unlikely they'd have done such a thing themselves. But I can't believe they'd be there. But I can believe they'd be there to help me out of this kind of jam. So, Occam's razor, I killed somebody and forgot all about it. I think about it more, and memories begin to surface of the event. It must have been at least a dozen years ago. Why are they keeping the head so well preserved for so long? And why have I never come across it all before, and all my holiday visits back home is beyond me? But I do start to remember. Something about a dark night, an accident of some sort, or was it on purpose? Or was that a plot of a movie? Everything is so fuzzy in retrospect. I just, I'm still unclear as to what happened that night so many years ago. I just decided to give up and quit trying to unravel the mystery and accept that what has happened has happened. The how and the what and the when are unimportant. And what is important is that I accept reality as it is and figure out how to go on living my life. I might as well just continue as always, for it changes nothing. And I wake up. Still, it lingers that dream. In that cloudy haze of the border between my conscious and unconscious, it sits, waiting to be devoured and taken in by my body as part of who I am. It's in these moments that I start to question myself. Did I do something so heinous and simply forget about it? If not, then why do I keep having dreams that I did? It all seems so familiar every time it happens, with the revelation being the clearest and most honest portion of it all. The head in the freezer. I know that isn't true. But the revelation leads me to very well could be. Only I know I'm no murderer. These dreams are just manifestations of an unresolved part of my psyche trying to make sense of itself. And it still hasn't found the true solution. But then again, maybe I'm just insane. Although I'm fairly certain I'm not. I'd never kill someone, I'm just not a violent person. Or by the virtue of me not being a violent person, I'm almost positive that I should, should I ever kill someone, it wouldn't be something I forget about. Again, this is why I discuss these things with you. They're the little thoughts that gnaw at my soul, leading me to question my stature. No, I didn't kill someone and ask my parents to hide the head. That's simply preposterous. But the larger question that remains is this. Do I really know myself? Or is all I see when I look in the mirror, figuratively or literally, although I tend to like what I see considerably more when it's the figurative mode, uh, simply a reflection of the me that I want to see? Is it a kind of twisted funhouse reflection where a reflection I see shows me, if not the fairest in the land, at least queen of the county fair? How horrible it would be to look at myself with another's eyes and see me for who I truly am, rotted and festering like Dorian Gray's portrait. Mr. Gray at least had the chance to see a portrait of his soul, uh, although he did little about it other than reject it and destroy it to live in denial. How I wish I had a portrait of my own, one that showed me for who I really am. Is my true face nothing but warts and scars and pus-filled lesions? Or would I simply see a handsome, righteous man? No, the mirror I hold is cracked and flawed, for it is but my own perception. It's only through the eyes of others that I can see myself clearly. Chapter 6. Would you like a drink? I'm parched. I already had a drink. Anyways, would you like a drink? I'm parched. I do say it's much easier to do all this with you here rather than in the inconvenience of a church. Not that I'm completely uncomfortable in a church, mind you, but you never know who could be listening or just sitting in the pews spying to see who enters the confessional, timing the length of their visits, judging them on their own, and making decisions and building constructs as to who that person must be. Me? For the amount of time we've already had at this, they would surely consider me a dastardly man. In and out, say a few prayers, and you consider clean by the flock. Spend too much time, though. Imagine it, hours spent in the confessional. The entire congregation would have their ears pressed flat against the walls by the time I was done. No, speaking here is much better. It allows for privacy and an openness that otherwise would be impossible. Here you are, your water. You want something stronger? Uh, I apologize, but I do think it would be better not to engage in anything more. At least not yet. Maybe once we've finished. I found that alcohol can impair the mind, as I'm sure you know. And even though I do abhor pressing my desires onto others, 
I do wish you'd stay as coherent as possible. Otherwise, what if I say something and you miss it, or don't, ta or don't take what would be a great revelation into account because you've had one too many? Yes, even one can be too many. This isn't a social gathering, after all. But what am I doing, offering you water only? What is this, a prison? Have I no manners at all? You must be hungry. I know I am. Starving. Hold on while I get something to nibble on. Well, if you're not hungry, I'll just leave this platter here in case you are. Perhaps you're lactose intolerant and just don't want to endure embarrassment. If that's the case, you don't need to be shy or dishonest. I can get you something else to eat. No? Maybe you're just not hungry. Forgive me. I need a break. Mental exhaustion definitely exists. This feels like something more. Spiritual exhaustion? Anyway, a short break will surely help. Break the book. Did you ever notice that you rub your temples when you thought too much? Like this. Is it, is it to massage the brain? I doubt it, since I've heard the brain has no sensory nerves and therefore can't physically feel anything. It is our center of feeling, to be certain, but it's, but its own physical pain or pleasure? The brain knows nothing of these. It merely interprets what, it's, what is sent to it through all its ganglionic tentacles of eyes and ears and fingers and toes. Maybe I do it to stimulate blood flow, like taking a deep breath with my brain. It's not from a headache, I don't have one. But as I get more agitated, I always end up mussing my hair. I must look like a mess, a crazed lunatic. Hopefully you don't mind. It's not post a selfie. Isn't that a strange phenomenon? The whole taking photos of yourselves and sharing them with the public to see? Rather narcissistic, no? Yet I admit I do it myself. Sometimes I wonder who they're taken for. For self-admiration? To see how many people approve of your looks or empathize with your phony despair or agreeing with jealousy at your good fortune? Or is it purely an aesthetic act, like any other kind of art? We frame our lives in the picture box we prefer, then we share the snapshots with the world. But is that any less of a representation of reality than just reality from a different given perspective? You can find beauty and ugliness in nearly anything depending on how you look at them. Starve yourself for a day, take yourself a hundred photos, and you'll surely end up with at least one stunning sh shot of yourself in that bikini. The other 99 are the same thing, but they're all ugly, unbearable and unfashionable. Still, they're all reality, both the ugly and the beautiful. We choose how we want to present ourselves. It reminds me of a favorite quote of mine from Shakespeare's Hamlet. There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. I've always felt that it was an excellent anecdotal examination of perspective. For as things exist, they merely exist. They are not beautiful or ugly or good or bad, they just are. It's not until we perceive something and filter it through our life's set of conceptions and biases that we can label them as such. And then we see the great, and then we see the great spiritualists and philosophers argue over which category these items or actions fall into. Like I said about Hitler before, to him his actions certainly weren't evil or ugly. So... Who are we to say they were? His reality was his reality. And had we lived his life and been the man, I hate to even call him a man, been the creature he was, we would have seen his actions as necessary and just as he did. His moral, comfort was different. his moral compass was different from most, but it still guided him. Nothing exists beyond our perception, but it doesn't matter because we still can't control what exists. Reality just is. What has happened outside of what we perceive only becomes real once we learn of it. And once we've learned of it, it then exists and becomes part of us. You may ask yourself, do others exist? Do I exist? Are you even here with me? Or am I just talking to myself? It doesn't matter because the I that exists in a reality where it believes you exist and we... Because the I that exists exists in reality where it believes you exist and we simply can't change our reality. We can change what we do with what we perceive, what makes of a reality, but even that remains out of our control. What rules we put forth to form our moral guides, as Hitler and other men of great evil did to form theirs, are the results of the reality in which we exist. What happens is the only thing that could happen, but to give up control to fate isn't what we do. We're free to do what we want, only what we want, and how we act, who we are, is the only choice and self that ever could have been. Continue to make the choice to exist, to live, to follow your compass. For if you give up yourself to fate, it has been your own decision to do so. Fate has nothing in store for you, and you know this. 
what happened happened. What happens next is what happens next. Now is the only now there ever could be. Fatalist? No. I find it to be hopeful and freeing. What if I didn't exist? How would it affect others? Would it? Would others exist at all at that point? If I didn't exist, I couldn't perceive any existence, meaning it wouldn't make no difference anyway. Recreate a man's life and a man's reality exactly as it was, and everything will be exactly as it is. Even a copy, a simulation in a machine, given all the same inputs, down to the tiniest grains of sand, molecules of air, atoms of an apple, and radio waves of the sun, and you'll end up with the exact same reality as exists now. But then, which one would be real? Both? To each individually, yes, their reality would be real. Both would exist, but to each other, but to each other the others would not. To the outsider, a third party, neither, because all that they perceive is what is real. None exists until it is the perceiver, then it is all that exists, meaning both are as real as the other when perceived through their own experience. Then we hit the question, can God exist then? As a third party outsider, all that would exist to him would be what he perceived, unless of course he could perceive all. But my, but my reality, the world in which I live, uh, live and which I make my choices and set my rules cannot exist to him. It is meaningless and so am I. And I don't know if God exists or if he follows a separate unknown set of rules of which I can't fathom. What I do know is that what is real to me is real. All realities exist, but all that exists is my own reality. You have your own. I accept it is real to you. But to me, it's sort of a nested reality of no consequence. But for what would logically happen to me as a result of my not accepting that my construct of you has its own existence within my perception of you. Your eyes glazed over as I spoke. I'm boring you. Uh, still, I care, and still, I care that I've wasted your time on such a distraction. Yet, if I chose not to care, the consequences wouldn't matter, and I continue to talk as if I had been. What matters most here is that I did care. I couldn't have not cared, not in the reality in which I exist, and it's unfathomable to think I could have done otherwise. We, we should just move on. Chapter 7. Fire is dying down, and I can see the evening is upon us already. It's mesmerizing, isn't it? Amazing how something so beautiful can be so destructive. Yet, we capture it in boxes of brick and stone, forcing it to dance for us and provide us with warmth. The blue and white tongues leaping about within the red coals, like silent tendrils searching for their next meal. Here you are, children. Consume, destroy, and serve your purpose. Allow me to feed another log to the fire. Do I cut my own firewood? I have no idea where it comes from. Maybe this was bought at some convenience store, or maybe the owner cut it himself. There's a big pile of it out the back door. No, uh, no, I don't really know much about the owner. I've never met him. But this sure is a nice house, isn't it? A bit small. Mm, the cottage style doesn't normally do it for me, but this is rather cozy. A lot of exposed wood, to be certain. Pine and oak, I think. It's like living in a pottery barn catalog. There's once this television show. I saw where a woman was sent to her own personal hell, and was a home decorated in naughty pine. Something like this, and I empathized with her dismay, but now that I'm here, I must say it's rather nice, especially on a day like today. I'd just as well snuggle up, like, snuggle up with a blanket and take a nap if we didn't have so much more to talk about. Didn't I tell you? Yeah, I'm borrowing the place for a few days. I'm not from here, only in town for a short stay. I discovered the place was available for a short-term rental on some internet site. One look at the photos, I knew this would be the perfect place for my stay. A place of safety. Neutral ground where I could have the chance to share all my thoughts with someone like you. Private, unknown, and safe. I like to spend my time in places where everyone is neutral. No one has a higher ground than the other, yet you still see levels of comfort differ for those there. Some view a coffee shop or a public part as a safe haven, with no one around who knows you. A new coffee shop is like the opposite of a bar from that cheer show. It's a place where nobody knows your name. It should be viewed as a place of refuge, I would think. But in my time in such establishments, I've learned that not to be the case at all. Not for everyone, at least. 
these places still have their regulars and their cliques, the people who do know each other. Hello, Jeff. A soy cappuccino coming right up. Good morning, Sally. How's the family? And those who are new, who are the strangers, take one of those stances and when such an innocuous scene, take one of those two stances when such an innocuous scene unfolds. Either they ignore it, happy to continue in their anonymity, or they suddenly become an outsider. One who is suddenly different from the others, to be ridiculed, judged, eyed, and considered fodder for hushed communication. And then what? Should you partake? Strike up conversation yourself to portray your outgoing persona, an olive branch of kindness, hopefully to be rejected so you can return to that safe inconspicuousness so as not be a threat to the establishment? Or do you wait, dreading the moment that someone else decides to speak to you, in doing, and in doing so, robs you of your peaceful solitude? I do neither. I don't have such anxieties. Any situation, no matter how undesirable, is no threat to me. But still, there are those who do have anxieties around others, and you can see it in them every time someone new walks in the door. They glance up, their fingers fidgeting with their coffee cup, while they anxiously attempt a nonchalant glance at the person placing the order. There's no sign of recognition. Safety. Back to what I was doing. For me, these concerns don't exist. I lift my head to watch the others, simply because I like to watch others. It takes a bit of skill to people watch without turning into an ogler, but I found it to be one of my favorite pastimes, and I've learned much about others simply by observing them, going about in their natural patterns. One could call me a naturalist of humanity. Look, observe, but don't interact. Leave nothing but footprints and take nothing but pictures. Metaphorically, of course. I'm no voyeur. The observations aren't of a personal nature, though. They're, they're not of the background check private detective variety but they're instead observations of man's nature and the multitude of different variants in which it can unfold. Yes, patterns occur, and you learn to spot them the more you watch. Stereotypes do exist for a reason, after all, and caricatures are often true, or truthful enough that we can use them to again build the rules for our reality and predict the responses one would have, regardless of the turns a situation might take. Like a strip mall psychic. One time, sitting in a cafe in Paris, at the time of the door, I glanced up to see a man and a woman enter. It was immediately apparent they were an item of some sort or another, husband and wife, or man and mistress, I couldn't be sure, but there was a palpable electricity between the two. One of familiarity and excitement. They went to order, and they were clearly not regulars of the establishment, as there were no recognition between them and the baristas or other staff. This and the inordinate amount of time it took for them to situate themselves in a place they found comfortable made it obvious they had never been there before. They sat in raised seats across from me at a small bistro table, sipping their drinks and speaking to each other in French, which, even though I was in Paris, I admit I couldn't understand. I don't speak a word of French. Okay, maybe a word. Oui, baguette, crepe. Uh, it's three. I... <laughs> I quickly got bored and returned to a book I was reading. Something by some French existentialist and another, yeah, cliche, I know, but I was in Paris. What else could I have read? Surely not some John Grisham paperback. After some time had passed, no more than a half hour, the they ever took on a new feeling, though, one where the electricity had suddenly been sucked from it completely. I noticed a new silence start to overtake the room, and looking up, I saw that others had also lifted their heads. The silence was the ceasing of conversations as eyes congealed to form a 360-degree living camera watching what was unfolding at the young lover's table. The event matured slowly, almost imperceptibly, and in any other location likely would have gone by unnoticed. But in a place such as this, where each individual was somehow more tuned in to the vibrations of reality, any disturbance was immediately felt and reverberated throughout the room. It started with the eyes man's eyes as he followed as he furrowed his thick brows his pupils dilated and the green took on a glassy sheen i can only describe as contempt the woman shrunk back in her chair a little shrinking violet at the sudden change in her partner's composure i didn't speak french but i knew she had said something he would have preferred not to hear the pace of the conversation accelerated and voices began to rise not to shouting levels, but more like the kind of raised whispers where you wish you could shout and yell and stomp your feet and pound your fists. But for decorum in public places, you must settle for a neutered, or neutered lecture. It was fantastic. 
the show was starting and everyone there knew it, even as they all pretended not to even notice. Cappuccinos were sipped, scones crunched, and eyes darted secretively toward the spectacle that was being birthed before them. To give it credence and attention, we all knew, would be to sentence it to death, or to force it to take refuge in the safety of some private hideaway or alley. No, for the best chance at show. We had to pretend there was nothing of interest occurring. To give it attention would be to give it awareness that it existed, and in its awareness, it would commit suicide for shame. Why do we enjoy watching train wrecks? Why do we rubberneck at the scene of an accident or stalk the internet in search of the latest scandal? Is it for superiority or safety? By observing something horrible happen to someone else, do we take solace in knowing that it isn't us? Is it much different from predicting the worst and being pleasantly surprised when it never happens? It's disturbing, the thought that we crane our necks as we pass a pile of twisted metal, searching for any sign of b blood, bone, or gristle. We still s breathe a sigh of relief when we see everyone is okay. <clears throat> I know of no one other than the sick who revel in the pain and death of others. I think we like to see these disasters unfold, imagining the horribleness that could have befallen those involved. Then we can walk away, fat and happy, knowing that even when terrible things happen, we'll be okay. Regret at our inquisitive nature only arises when we witness something that we dared not witness. The smash-up of the auto races, tearing steel and bouncing tires, ignites us, and we look unexpectedly, mouths agape. Did you see the terror unfold? What a majestic sight, everything suddenly falling apart into disarray. The driver pulls himself from the wreckage, shakes his head a bit, takes off his helmet, looks to the crowd and waves. Bonus points if the car explodes behind him as he walks away. <clears throat> our lives lack the drama that we've been so accustomed to seeing on our screens, in our books, and on our stages. Those types of events, which bring such excitement to us, are still distant and unreal, even when based on a true story, or presented to us documentary style. When we see a real drama unfold in front of us, it's simply exciting. It brings us to the present at a level of reality we don't normally live in, here, now, wow. <clears throat> but it must be dramatic to cause this effect. Something mundane, short of the type of spiritual epiphany that can happen when you see the early morning light filter through trees and mists for what feels like the first time. Something mundane cannot elicit such energy. Drama, actions, explosions, love, hate, violence, misery. We can feel them, but we do our best to avoid such extremes in our lives, and particularly those of the negative kind. For we have something no other beast possesses empathy and in that empathy we are able to envy the love and good fortune we see fall into others and we're able to take pride and comfort in our position when we see others fall victim to tragedy maybe not a smirk or even conscious joy but a feeling of strength in that we're not the one to suffer <clears throat> but it's not all about that sometimes our motives are much more sinister Sometimes we like to see others suffer simply because we enjoy seeing others in pain. It brings about a feeling of superiority. They are lesser and you are higher. Lashing out in violence, both physical and emotional, can be greatly satisfying, provided you don't consider the repercussions. It's why you see a child angry at his brother for taking his favorite toy, turn around and punch him in the chest. Punch his own brother! This is beyond metaphorical is actual honest violence among siblings in a vicious struggle for power within the constraints of their limited environment and attention in which their parents force them to exist and cohabitate. Struggles for power, for pleasure, for recognition, easily solved by violence. Until the other tattles, of course, then they learn the repercussions and how a plan, ill-conceived, will often backfire. I'm not quite certain why I was drawn to the scene unfolding in front of me at the cafe. I don't know the reasons for the other's piqued interest, either. But I do know that it was all-encompassing. Each had their own motive, I suppose, as I had my own, however unconscious it was. <laughs> the woman averted her eyes, first looking down away from her lover, then anxiously ser searching the room. She became immediately aware of the attention they'd drawn to themselves, even without any outburst of action. Her face flushed and she shrank further. The man spoke, loudly, sternly, angrily. I had no idea what they were arguing about. The woman threw up her arms and lunged forward in her seat, engaging her aggressor head-on in response to his remarks. 
Words were thrown back and forth, many on top of the other, until with a flourish of her hand, she toppled her drink to the table, spreading it viciously across the surface and into her now presumably ex-lover's lap. She stood, pulled a ring from her finger, and threw it on the table and marched out the door. It wasn't until this moment that the man, too, became visibly aware of the scene that had unfolded in the gawking crowd. He smiled, gave a nice little French wave, and took a napkin from the table next to him. He dabbed his pants to dry them, wiped clear what remained of the table or on the table, and straightened his collar. He then continued to drink his coffee. I returned to my book and the people of their conversations, and that was that. I did see her around the city a few times after that, often with others, but never with him. I never saw him again. Who knows what happened? He probably killed himself. One evening, I came across her at a club. She didn't recognize me, or at least didn't appear to. I tried to flirt. I tried to pick her up with alcohol-fueled dreams of carnal sport. It didn't work. She didn't speak English, and I didn't speak French. I went home alone, tried to masturbate, and fell asleep in the chair. If this were a real therapy session, I'm sure the next thing you'd want to talk would be something about my love life, or my sex life, to be uh, more clear with a Freudian way. Well, I'd rather not get into lascivious details with you. I'll save those for my therapist. I do suppose there are facts and events that may have bearing on this judgment, though. So we can talk about it. Although I have to admit, it's something even I have a hard time discussing openly with you. It's an area where I have certainly made many mistakes. Mistakes much more rancid than my little argument with the preacher's daughter. Nothing dastardly, I assure you. But perhaps, while being more painful to recount, are also more forgivable. For it is upon these items that I find myself ruminating the most and feeling the greatest level of shame and regret. It's one area where I truly am far from perfect. Yet, I'm not quite feeling up to it. Not for lack of courage, it's just not that I... It's still an area of myself that remains a bit raw. And I'd rather not poke those wounds. Not until we've continued to cover other ground. I fear that by pulling out those fresh scabs, we'll just open sores and end up with a mess from which I'd likely to bleed out. So, given the mortal risks, I'd rather wait. Chapter 8. Who displays shotguns over their fireplace these days? It's not antique country charm. It's just plain tacky. The pair on the wall bring the whole aesthetic down here considerably. From quaint cottage style to some sort of Lodge Nouveau. I imagine the owner prides himself as some sort of great hunter. But how they just detract from the wonderful mantle below. Surely he felt the guns complement the rest of the decor, but I vehemently disagree. The place could be so charming if it wasn't so bourgeois. Look at how fantastic the mantle is, though. Solid. A travesty to have one thing so beautiful, sullied by such gaudy taste with this whole hunter motif. Cut from just a single piece of lumber, affixed sturdily to the wall of the fireplace, unaware of the all-consuming vulnerability lurking below. Just out of reach of the flame, it exists so close to becoming fuel for the very item it embellishes. Utterly naive. I wonder how old it is. It appears hand-carved from one solid piece of wood. From the, smooth, from the smoothness of the corners and the patina of the surface, or patina of the surface, it must be quite old. Older than this house, to be sure. Did it start out as a mantelpiece, or was it something reclaimed and re repurposed? A mast from a ship. A beam from a barn's trusses. Or was its mother cut from the ground, it then birthed in a sawmill, and sent off to an artisan to, crash, to craft into utilitarian art? It surely had no idea of the life it would lead, or the secrets it would see. Its maker was blind to the future as well, just doing his job and earning a few dollars so he could heat his home. How many homes is this graced? Does it have a splendid and colorful history? Or is it just a hunk of wood, robotically cut from a template by a machine and treated with chemicals to with chemicals and tools and abuse to appear old. Only plucked from its home recently, shipped off, packaged, and sold in a furniture chain store. I like to think not. I like to think it does have a history, and if you look carefully, you can see subtle clues that support my theory. The rust on its iron and the unique design here in the wood can only result from years of hands and drinks and toys and memories. And look here. If you look from below, you can see a small gap in the wall between the wood and its mount. Feel there, it's rough and dry, like sawn wood, aged but never handled. Not like the rest of the piece. You see here it's smooth and shiny with oil. The edges are worn and the wood is stained with age. But there, where it's never seen exposure, it remains new but old, unvarnished and untarnished. 
It has been shielded from antiquity. How I'd love to take an axe to it. Oh, no, of course I won't. I, yeah, I see the hatchet there. I'm not going to touch the thing, not in a violent manner. It's so beautiful. I just would love to see what's inside. Truthfully, part of me would like to destroy it, maybe to feel power over it or to end its beauty. Such a thing of history so easily destroyed. But no, I'll leave it to be for others to enjoy. Nothing but footprints, remember? Besides, one day, perhaps when absurdity becomes reality, it will become conscious and live the rest of its days in abject horror of the fire below. Becoming so hot, it will be overcome with fear, and it itself will burst into flames. Psychological terror of impending doom, unaware and unassured that its maker placed it just out of harm's reach, and that it really has nothing to worry about. You look at me with such dread and disdain when I speak of such things. Surely you must see this as only a mental exercise, like much of what we discussed. What could happen? What would happen? If A, then B, you suddenly have C. But what if instead of C, you had D? Or worse still, you had C or D, and possibly even an E. Logic is logic, and what follows is what follows until it doesn't. And that lurking uncertainty is where fear hides. One evening, after a drunken night in the town, I stopped for a late-night snack with my fellow rabble-rousers. It was a little pizza shop, just off the main strip, frequented by the inebriated in the hours surrounding bar time. The name was something simple like Jack's or Eduardo's. I, I can't remember exactly, but it was quaint. Well, no, not quaint. It sounds too simple and charming. It was a little hole in the wall, and no one liked the pizza. They were just the only place that was open at 3 a.m. Standing in line with the rest of the cattle, I impatiently waited my turn to be fed. Then something happened. I can't remember what. Or I was far too gone to have my wits about me. But I must have done something somehow to upset the woman in line behind me. Words were said, and tempers flared. I punched her in the face, and she fell to the floor. Blood pouring from the hole where her nonsense about her mouth had previously been. In shock and completely, un and completely unable to conceive of what had just happened, I stood there dumbfounded, watching her bleed all over the concrete. Another person was kneeling next to her, concerned for her well-being, his hand on her back, while he looked up to confront her attacker. From the rage in his eyes, I knew for certain I was about to get a proper pounding. And I just ready myself to flee through the door when he said, Somebody grab him! Hold him down! Call the police! Some man or an extremely burly woman grabbed me from behind and held me tight, a prisoner in their arms with my arms locked behind me, unable to move. I considered escape, but gave up on that plan quickly when I saw the cop come through the door. There hadn't even been time to call him, much less for an officer to be dispatched. Well, the police didn't need calling. They were already on the scene. It seems Jack's or Eduardo's or whatever it was called, it was a hot spot for events like this. And at this hour of the night, on a weekend, they had made a part of their routine to just to set up camp outside. Needless to say, I was handcuffed and arrested. I don't recall much of that other than the tightness of the cuffs and the firm but controlled disgust of the officer as he pushed me into the back seat of his cruiser. The entire ride to lockup, I stupidly rambled and threatened the officer with such empty and cliched threats as, You're gonna be sorry for this, and... Don't you know who I am? It was then that I realized I was nobody. Jail's pretty horrible, despite what you might see on television. While only there for the night, I still had more than enough of that experience to last a lifetime. Once they booked me, rather than put me in with the rest of the population waiting for their initial hearing, they put me into solitary isolation. Supposedly I threatened some sort of violence and they couldn't risk having me around others or anything that I might use to hurt myself either. At least that's what they told me. They stripped me down and threw me in my prison garb and tossed me in a cell. So there I slept, in my own little room on a concrete bed with nothing but a steel toilet to keep me company. In the morning, they moved me in with the rest of the population. Apparently, I dried out and settled down enough for them to feel comfortable having me near others. Called my lawyer. He showed up for my bail hearing later that day. I was released on signature bond. The previous record, clean, except for a few traffic tickets several years earlier. Still, the charges against me were serious. There are rumors of charging with me attempted homicide, but those turned out to be exaggerations. What I ended up with was a looming conviction of aggravated assault. I had to get out of this somehow. Well, lo and behold, they have something in the criminal justice system called reform. So, I, with the aid of my very expensive attorney, managed to talk to the district attorney into giving me a pass. The woman I hit wasn't interested in pursuing the case, and as I said before, my record was clean. Besides, she was a stripper, so she wasn't very, up on the, very high up on the social totem pole as far as people go. If she didn't want to press charges, the DA sure as hell wasn't going to take things any farther than he absolutely had to. 
So I promised her some therapy and alcohol counseling, and I was well on my way back to freedom. But let me tell you, therapy and counseling are pretty much a joke. No, they're right. They're not as bad as going to jail would have been, but it wasn't a pleasant experience. First of all, you're surrounded by losers, people in and out of the system, serial offenders, nothing like me. To say they were scum would be to embellish, but they weren't shining beacons of society either. A few burned out yuppie junkies, some crackheads on furlough, and a bevy of people with more DUIs than I had birthdays. These people didn't need help. These people needed help. I didn't. But I went through with it anyway. The biggest thing they try to teach you in these counseling sessions is how to get in touch with your emotions. They encourage you to start every meeting explaining how you feel. And they won't let you get away with simple adjectives such as happy or sad or hungry. They want you to dig down deeper and get introspective. It's all part of the plan to help you get in touch with yourself, become mindful, and learn to cope with things like stress or anxiety or depression in a healthy, nonviolent, and chemical-free way. For some people, it seemed to work, I suppose. That's the power of faith, though. They must have gone into this situation actually believing that the methods would heal them. It's why 12-step programs like AA and NA are so popular, too, I think. There's faith there, and for those with faith, real spiritual faith, the knowledge that God will always be there to help them through and that he understands their weaknesses and accepts them even as they fail is encouraging. It propels them to find solutions where they already existed, but they've just been too blind to see. <clears throat> they accept they're broken and seek absolution and reformation. And if they believe they have found the path to doing so, they succeed in their goals. This wasn't a 12-step program. It was funded by taxpayer dollars and therefore immune to the infection of, reli of religious dogma. <coughs> Without that, though, it basically just turned into a new agey variation of Buddhism. A lot of talk about peace and serenity and mindfulness and meditation. It didn't hook me. I didn't care for it. And I didn't fall for it. I sure pretended to, though. When someone is guiding you on a path to somewhere, they're guiding you with a certain roadmap in mind. The map may take some adjusting, a little detour here and there, but what matters most is that you still hit all the landmarks along the way, checking them off one by one. The thing is, for a master of illusion, it's easily possible to fool someone through computer graphics and green screen projection. No, simple misdirection and smoke and mirrors won't work. You can't just trick someone into believing they're seeing something they aren't. You have to show it to them. And that's what I did. Each step of the way, it was made abundantly clear for anyone with half a brain what the end goal was. Promise not to drink or take drugs or whatever it was you were in for and then follow through on your promise. It's a temporary program, and you're paying your penance by following the rules. Is what keeps you out of real trouble. Best just to make the sacrifice and get it over with. As for the other signs of reconciliation healing, they were simple enough to showcase. Yeah, that's right, showcase, not fake. As with any other social interaction, all that was required was to follow the scripts and act as one was expected to act. Take part in group discussion. Show remorse. Dig up a painful memory to share with the group. Ideally, one that'll make you cry. Show your vulnerability. Break yourself down publicly until you can break down no further. Then you can be rebuilt. The morning of the day I was arrested, before any of the drinking or partying began, I went to the liquor store to pick up a few bottles of wine to restock my rack. Who should be working there but Brian, a guy from back in my hangout, take drugs and waste away on the couch days. I hadn't seen him for years. We exchanged small pleasantries. How are you doing? Have you seen Preston lately? No, me neither. Well, it was nice seeing you. Fucker. He's the one who should get out into rehab. Have you ever had to help someone through rehab? Seems like something you would do. It's a time when many seek out spiritual guidance. I've seen many atheists born again after devouring the big book. But what about the act of simply being an addict? Is that easily forgivable? Or does it carry a strong prerequisite of penance in and of itself? It is, after all, an act of slow motion suicide, committed consciously or unconsciously, and, as anyone knows, suicide is a mortal sin, so those that drink themselves to death or that are discovered one morning with a needle in their arm, do they go to hell for those transgressions? You're right. You, you could argue that the chemicals take away our free will, and as such, we are not responsible for what we do under their influence. The first drink, though, or the first hit, those were actual conscious decisions, and with the health education and anti-drug lobbying that goes on, we can assume with quite a bit of certainty that they didn't make this decision unaware of the potential consequences. Why don't we choose otherwise, then, when we have seen proof of the tragic destination this road can lead to? 
I presume it's because not everyone follows the road all the way to its end. Some are able to keep extending the road, or others move so slowly at such a bridal pace that they're never able to finally reach the destination. Some of us, though, myself included, I must admit, go into bad decisions with a bit of Superman complex. We are above the rules, and with our knowledge and superiority, we will avoid such a fate. So then, does pride not factor in as well? That's two sins now for the drunkard, pride and murder. Oh yes, and gluttony, that's three. So can forgiveness be granted? How do you ask for forgiveness when you're unaware of your transgressions? Once the path of destruction has begun, there is but little time to recognize you've taken a wrong turn. You don't know you've gone the wrong way until the night is dark, the bridge is out, and you plummet to your death. And here we are again, back at the conundrum of if forgiveness can be given to someone, even without them asking for it. Do we speculate, if Jim had known what he was doing to himself, he surely would have stopped. It is the drugs to be blamed, not Jim himself. Or, uh, or are the results of an action disregarded as specious on the onset what, are, what we are to blame for? You should have known better. You did know better. You made your decision rotten hell. Anyway, it's something to think about. I'm not concerned personally as I've gone through the process of rehabilitation. Although I would argue I never got to a point where I was unaware of my actions. I never really had an addiction so much as a preference for drink. I could control myself then would have continued to do so had society not stepped in and sat my freedom from me. Since that time over, I am proud to say I've never had another drink. My promises have been kept to society, but more importantly to myself. For if you can't keep a promise, if your hold, words hold no water, what value do you have as a man? Now, if you excuse me for a, minutes, for a few minutes, I need to take a quick break. I feel I've lost my purpose in this conversation. And I need some time to recollect myself. No, I won't be long. Just a quick smoke. My nerves need some calming so we can get back on track. At ease and finish before the night is through. And with that, I will take a drink of water. Any of you still here with me? Got a ways to go. But, uh... Fifth of the way through. Gets better, trust me. <laughs> Anyways, all right, chapter nine. The proprietors of this home do appear to be a rather well-read couple. The secret life of bees, the curious incident of the dog in the night, the kite runner, a few treatises by Gladwell, Freakonomics, like water for elephants. Oh, and see this. Even the works of E.L. James, positioned appropriately next to a copy of the Bible. How quaintly ironic. But it's getting rather chilly in here, don't you think? That log we added to the fire is nearly spent, and the flames are dying down. Let's say we add some fuel with one of these books. We can make it a game. I'll choose the most worthless one here, and you guess which one. Well, you made your guess? No, don't be ridiculous. It wasn't the Bible. I said the most worthless of them all. Aren't they all worthless? All of them written by men, or yes, women too, but I'm not worried about political correctness right now. Written by men who wanted to say something. Escape from reality, go on an adventure, share a great truth, elevate fellow men, entertain the masses, make a few bucks, and be immortalized in print. They're all just filled with words, each of which I'm sure the author felt were worth writing for some reason or another. <laughs> Would you look at that blaze? So instant and bright, it gives off so much heat, I can feel the flames licking my face, like a puppy loving his master. Comforting, and much better used to us than a mere decorative facade. The bookshelves and furniture stores are no different, with their fake book bindings all lined up in one neat row. It isn't until you go to pull one from the shelf that you realize it's nothing but an illusion of painted cardboard. You can't read the books, they're for show, just like they are in most people's homes and social media streams. Do you give up? Well, I can't answer either. I closed my eyes and I picked one at random. But I did steer myself away from the Bible, for that would have been extremely rude of me. Besides, it seems much too obvious, and I must admit a bit too dangerous. For all I know, as it was engulfed in flames, so should I be in eternity in judgment for my actions. I did say we were to leave nothing behind and take nothing from this place. You're right about that. There's still no trace of us here other than the disappearance of an item. But did we take it? Or was it merely transformed into something new? 
never left. It's still here. Don't you see it? It's still there, changing from one form to another, from paper to heat and ashes, but it remains. Do you think they'll even detect its absence? Stolen? Or merely misplaced? I've done them a favor, a favor of which will go unappreciated. I rid them of some bit of ridiculousness, and what's more, I've spared them of a small bit of shame. <laughs> to put these books out on display in their living room? No one randomly makes decisions as to what insights he or she might leave out in the most public of their private spaces. No, there was thought put into what would go here. How would they decorate the windows to their private lives? When visitors came to call, what kind of people did they want to be seen as? Thoughtful, current, righteous, informed? Yeah, still not af afraid to have a little fun and frivolity. I'll never even notice it's missing. They've never taken a second look at this library since putting it on display. It's only here for others to see, for them to build a frame in which to pose for their close-ups. What a disappointment. The meager flames that now emits. The cover is gone. Pages are slowly burning up, curling away into ash. But so slowly. Books never burn like you'd imagine them to. There is a fantastic conflagration, but instead just peeling away one page at a time. It would have done its job much better in its original form, the tree. All right, I'll go out and get another piece of wood for the, from the wood pile since this isn't helping at all. It's too, I'm way too cold, and here I am being forced to go back outside into the even colder world just to make up for the fact this book has failed to fulfill its purpose. My purpose? What a funny notion, although it's not a question I'm surprised you asked. Simply put, I fail to believe any of us has a purpose. In my younger years, I lived by the credo that every man's goal in life was to find and succeed in his purpose. But as I grew older and wiser with experience, it became clear to me that none of us actually has a purpose. We just are. It's a rather disappointing epiphany to come to, and you can definitely sink into a nadir of depression if you get lost in the thought. But what was more important, I realized, after wallowing in, after wallowing in the misery of this truth for much longer than I care to acknowledge, is that, yes, our lives have no purpose. They are given, or forced, rather, onto us. And short of suicide, the best we can do to continue... The best we can do is just continue to live and try to find joy and pleasure whenever and wherever we can. From your face, I can see you're wondering why I don't just commit suicide then. Or do I perhaps live in a bacchanalian existence, cavorting with women drunk on whatever chemicals I could find? Aside from alcohol, obviously. As I told you, I gave it up long a long time ago. <laughs> you think too little of me. I don't just lay about all day ruminating and philosophizing on life. I have lived, after all. And I find the best way to keep moving on, living through life, is to avoid thinking too much about it. For thought is a vicious circle. The solution is to simply invent goals and strive to reach them. To keep the mind preoccupied and fill days, months, and even years. Choose a goal, ideally focus on something that will provide pleasure, and not only will you receive pleasure from every step you take closer to the goal, but you also get pleasure from the reaching of the goal and from the results. As I've chosen these goals, my first question has been, what am I good at? Well, as you can tell from our conversation thus far, I, I excel at thought and action. In particular, I succeed at logical thought and how to put forth a strategy that leads to successes. I consider business, but as I've noted, I've, I was already free from want of money. My fortunate situation has a side effect of denying me the ability to gain pleasure in any additional monetary gains. The gains I had most enjoyed were those of sharing my abilities with my fellow man, bringing them the chance to live a more just and fulfilling existence. So... I entered politics. The decision to make such a commitment wasn't something I made at spur of the moment. You know, I considered it for years. As you know, public service is something I think rather highly of. No, it was something that always simmered in the back of my mind as a possibility. A dalliance that should opportunity present itself, and could I think of no one better for the position, I'd fill myself. In the summer, in the summer of my 43rd year, such an opportunity appeared. My propensity for service isn't for want of overarching power, not for something as grand and conspicuous as president, but still a smidge better than dog catcher. I was thrilled when I found news that a position on my city council had just opened. The incumbent had retired, and the field was wide open for candidates. Certainly, I had considered more prominent positions in the past. My papers for state con congressmen were all but in the mail at, the point, at one point in my late 30s, but I ultimately decided against it as I felt that politics at that level were better served by those who predisposed to remain part of the system. 
and the courage for that level of commitment. So I chose to forego the position and leave it to someone who might want to live their life out fully encumbered by the weight of politics. Yet, when the opportunity to serve at a more intimate, local level found its way into my sights, I could envision a future where my skills could be of great use. With no real risk of long-term commitment or even a requirement of fealty to one party or another, I'm a free thinker, you see, and though I do tend to side with one major political party more than the other, I can't bring myself to become fully dedicated to a single side, much less under the pressing thumbs of the financiers. Anyways, <clears throat> the opportunity came about from a rather sideways direction, like a thought never considered but when presented has been there all the time. Many years after going through my quarter of counseling, I'd found myself mired in self-doubt and in need of positive reinforcement and affirmation. I'd been wandering aimlessly for the better part of my 30s, traveling a bit of Europe and South America, but otherwise not doing much of anything worth a second thought. As my mid-30s became late 30s, with 40 looming on the horizon, I came to the realization that not only did my life have no meaning, for I was already well aware of that, but my life contained nothing worthy of celebration. When I was dead and gone, there would be no close friends or family to remember me, nor any valorous acts for which my life would be even memorialized. I was halfway through a meaningless existence, had done nothing much for which I was proud, and absolutely nothing for which I'd be venerated. My name would appear in an obituary somewhere, if obituaries even existed any longer at that point, since newspapers are more or less extinct, and that would be the end of me. It sent me into a wholly new depth of depression until I realized that only I had the power to change my legacy. Once upon a time, I had a family, a mother and father who cared for me, and a younger brother who loved me dearly despite all the torture I imbued upon him, as is necessary for any older sibling to serve unto his younger one. He was several years younger than me, three and a half to be exact. I'd been an only child, and had my parents' life story gone according to plan, would have remained an only child. But as they say, accidents happen. He was a happy accident, however, and never treated it as an inconvenience. We had a normal childhood, full of love, bickering, conspiracies, and, as he grew older, a few fistfights of his doing. I had moved out soon after high school and left him at home with my parents. There weren't any major problems in that situation, although I do feel at times he felt abandoned. I had been his mentor and his best friend, but I'd grown up and needed to spread my wings. So my oats, be free. Ironically, our relationship only strengthened through my absence. We held a deep love for one another, a love only brothers can have, Yet, family holidays often led to thrown punches on more than one occasion bloodied and broken noses. He did manage to grow up relatively fine without me, though, and as we both went down our own separate paths, he found great success at an early age in sunny California. David moved to L.A. straight out of high school with dreams of being a musician and making it big, getting his picture on the covers of Billboard and Rolling Stone. Even though the music industry was notoriously brutal, he, however the optimist, packed his bags and headed west to seek fame and fortune. Alas, fame was never to be found, but fortune, oh, fortune was upon him. He'd always been creative and in, a, and in tune with other people's feelings. Almost an empath, I'd say. But his passion and empathy were nearly the sole gifts that had, life had bestowed upon him. His talents lay in art and poetry. The boy could he write. I'd never seen such poetry from an unknown writer as what I received from his late-night emails. Some were pretty tortured and definitely not pop song material, but others held stunning lyrical truths. He always pined for my approval, you see, and with my guidance, he reigned in those raw, raw lyrics of emotion and made something much more palatable and universal, which he sold for a song. Yeah, a song, both literally and figuratively. His music career never took off, and he never headlined stages or made rancorous love to groupies. Oh, I could be wrong with the second one. I don't know the lives of songwriters, but he didn't perform, and he was never a superstar. But his songs were famous. The artists who made it big did so from his songs, and those words were what put many of those artists into the limelight, transforming them into stars of worth of becoming worthy of becoming tabloid fodder and shills for health and beauty products. Yet he never made the cover of Rolling Stone himself, not until he died. No, I can't say exactly what songs I did. No, I know what songs, I just can't say as in I'd rather not. Too personal. 
I'm sure you've heard a few of them, though. You probably even think they're written by the person singing them. A lot of people think that, that their favorite pop stars write their own lyrics. It would be funny if it weren't so sad. I remember seeing examples of a few letters from fans forwarded to the writers, but written to the singer, lauding them for their life-changing messages. <clears throat> Words that spoke to them filled them with such believable and understanding or understandable emotion. The singers who did them right did do their best to own the songs, though. If you didn't know any better, you'd think they pretty much you'd think they were truly worth singing from the heart sometimes. But it's all a show, packaged and presented as a facsimile of real art and emotion, and my brother is one of the better peddlers of these stories. Nothing new lately, no. He died a long time ago. Suicide, if you can believe it. My parents had died a few years earlier in an accident, so when David was gone, it really was alone. He'd been alone too, it turned out. He battled his own demons and addictions for years until one night he just decided he wanted out for good. Despite his professional success, he remained single. He was only 23 when he died, after all. And hadn't forged any real connections other than business and his dealer in the time since he moved to L.A. On the day of his death, I received a call from his attorney informing me of the news and that he'd left me as the sole beneficiary of his estate. When people tell you there's no money anymore in the music business, they're either lying or just plain stupid. There is still a lot of money out there but it's only going to a few people. Most who try their hand at it fail, or if they have a hit, it's a quick burner, fast rise to the top, just as fall, fast as a fall back down. That's the problem with pop music. It's always about what's popular, and popularity is fickle and never changing. Still, every once in a while, someone writes something that's referred to as an evergreen, a piece, though maybe not destined to join the great American songbook, that will continue to be performed and covered, recorded and re-recorded pretty much forever. <clears throat> My brother was one of these lucky writers, and he'd been smart. After writing a few songs as work for hire and seeing one of them become a mild hit, he got wise and realized it was in his best interest to retain a share of ownership in everything he wrote from then forward. He worked with various publishers, sold administration rights back and forth once or twice, but the copyrights always reverted back to him. And as a sole beneficiary, then they reverted to me. That's so how I've managed to live the majority of my adult life without any worries of having a profession. I had a few odd jobs out of college, but nothing that could be considered a career. And by the time I was 26, I'd fallen into enough money with an ongoing royalty stream that would very likely persist until after I was dead. I never managed the catalog myself, though I did have a hand in formulating the strategy of maximizing profits from it. I acquired the aid of a prominent entertainment lawyer, and he helped me manage the day-to-day -day details and finer points of contract negotiation. <clears throat> the strategy was simple, but it worked. We'd never enter into any sort of long-term administration contract, but instead shop the catalog every few years. Songs are popular enough on their own that demand was there to cause bidding wars, which drove the price up each time, and with increased costs came increased efforts to maximize profits on the songs. Publishers focused their efforts on maximizing the return on the investments and therefore gave a lot more attention to the catalog than it would have gotten if it just sat there with one administrator. A special rider in our contract required approval from me or my attorney for any placements, so we kept a strict leash on how and when the songs were used in films or commercials. Increased value through careful curation and artificial scarcity, and a commitment to only license to projects that we felt had a strong emotional resonance that would only increase the song's value over time due to their association with the products projects. Nothing makes a song... Nothing makes a popular sad love song go up in value like positioning it in a key emotional moment in a major film. The big money used, used to be in telephone commercials, then insurance, but those overstayed their welcome. Film, always a surefire hit. Or surefire bet. A strong inheritance with a calculated plan to maximize returns and you're practically guaranteed complete financial freedom. I lost a brother, but I had secured independence and the ability to do pretty much anything I ever wanted to do. It was a rough trade, but in the end, uh, I think I came out okay. So now you know about my brother and my family and my unearned riches. There's likely more to tell you on the subject, but this time I can't think of anything that would be of much bearing on today's conversation. As with any family, there's stories abound, but I don't think any of them have any bearing on the purpose of our conversation. If something does come to mind, though, I'll be sure to mention it. As I reminisce on his passing, I'm reminded of a curious thought I entertained at his internment. Despite all the context he made within his profession and the impact he made upon countless others in his music, his funeral was rather lonely. 
I remember the day clearly. It was wasn't dreary. No rain fell and no clouds blocked the sun. Nothing like today. No, the sun shone brightly and the sky remained clear. The heat was unbearable. So much so that I was forced to remove my shirt and jacket by the time we carried his casket to the burial hole. This is what I don't understand. Why do we bury our dead? First of all, it seems like a waste of space. Who knows how many thousands or millions of acres in the world are reserved for holding wooden boxes of dry bones and rotting corpses. With a planet so relatively limited in size, it just appears to me it's a waste of perfectly good real estate. But <clears throat> ignoring this poor management of space, why do we bury our dead? I believe it is for no other reason that we want to hide them. Once life has ceased, our bodies are nothing but cadaverous reminders of our own ultimate fate and the meaningless of life. All those years lived and all those people we've affected in the end were just gone. Nothing remaining but a pile of meat and bones. We'd be better off fed to dogs and buried. At least then in our final act we'd serve some purpose. Some people prefer to be cremated and stuffed in a jar instead of buried, but isn't that even more preposterous? Do people really want a constant reminder of their dead kin of their dead kin and their own impending death up on their shelf? It's disgusting, really. For some of us, I suppose it helps to realize the presence of now and to make the most of our lives. For others, it's a constant reminder of the past in which we can dwell, ruminate, and enjoy the pleasure of fond memories. Myself, I'd prefer neither. For one, there will likely be no one to care or even notice when I'm gone. No one that is aside from the lawyer wondering where to send the royalty checks, worried sick that he'll lose out on his percentage. No, no, when I'm gone, just throw my body in the sea and let the sharks and fish have at it. Allow the snails, shrimps, and crabs to pick apart the leftover bits that sink to the ocean floor. Or, should the pilgrimage to the sea be impossible, just leave me to be wherever my body finally falls. Or in some ditch, farm field, or wooded preserve. Let the foxes and raccoons and rats and birds just pull at my bones and tissue until they're fat and happy, crapping out what's left on the forest floor like rank little pellets. Or, if you're hungry, carve my meat and make a sandwich. Fill your freezer with my remains, enough to sustain you through the winter. Just don't have my body be as meaningless in death as it was in life. Chapter 10. Now, where were we? Ah, yes, I was about to tell you about my rise to political power. As I mentioned, in my late 30s, I found myself not only fully adrift, living a meaningless existence, but for the first time frightfully aware that my legacy was but a notion, hallucinatory in my mind and lacking for any objective reality. So I decided to make a name for myself so as not to end up simply a forgotten footnote in history. Now that I look back on it, it was probably no more than a midlife crisis. But at the time, it was revelatory. I myself had the power to make myself more or less immortal. And I'd do it by making myself unforgettable. I possessed no skills of creation like my brother. He would live on forever through his music, forever a liner note in history. Maybe not on the tip of tongues, but you know, constantly there, forever. The only other option that immediately came to mind was to become notorious. If I couldn't be a star, I could make myself front page news, which was as good or even better than being a star. <clears throat> a mass shooting or public bombing. I wouldn't do it, though. It was against my better nature. Yes, I'd be remembered, but the same as Ted Bundy and Charles Manson and James Holmes and the Sarnayev brothers. That wasn't the legacy I wanted. Nor did I want to risk the minute chance that my theories were wrong and eternal damnation did, did indeed await those of such evil. So without a solution, I decided to start with what had worked in the past. Looking back at my life, the only instances I could remember where I felt I'd actually influenced people was during my stint in rehab. I've been a strong shoulder, a great listener, empathetic, but with a strong guiding hand. I've been through the system, and I learned the basics of the trade. It was simple enough. I'd start my own support group. As it turns out, simply starting a support group isn't something that one just does. There are regulations, for one, and finding members without any sort of official relation to currently existing social programs is near impossible. My group was easily started, but it lacked members. I once again felt worthless, so at the nadir of my life, I did what anyone else would do. I went to the bar. <clears throat> I fully intended on drinking that night. Not just drinking, but getting ridiculously out of my mind. If I ever wake up, I expect to be in a pool of my own piss and vomit plastered. 
I realized at that moment that I missed the bottle much more than I ever thought possible. And the thought of alcohol burning its way down my throat and into my gullet was as enchanting as the thought of seeing a long-lost lover burst through your door like the Kool-Aid man, arms embraced and begging to be forgiven. <clears throat> when I got there, though, my courage was lacking and my enthusiasm had waned. Like the same group, all you have to do to not have a drink is just not have a drink. By the time I'd gotten dressed and walked down the street to the bar, enough time had passed, I just simply didn't have the desire any longer. <clears throat> I had gotten dressed over, and having walked a few blocks to the bar, I required a bit of a chill, so I decided to stop in for a bit anyway for a warm-up and a change of scenery. What I saw inside nearly brought me to tears. I'd never been in a bar completely sober before. The sight of one through steady eyes was quite unnerving. Bleary-eyed people sat alone at the bar, a few of them hopelessly trying to attract the attention and conversation of the passively pretty bartender. A few others were in a booth, a young girl sitting in, on an older man's lap, whispering in her ear as he took a pull from his whiskey. These were my people, and I would forgotten them. They needed saving, and I was the one to save them. I wouldn't say I became a preacher, I was more of a confidant. It took time to be sure. But I spent many a night at that bar drinking soda water, tipping generously, and slowly getting to know the regulars. We had some fantastic conversations. The lives others lead are simply amazing. No matter how small and meaningless any of them appeared at first glance, the more I learned of them, the richer and more valuable they became to me. Still, without, still even with all these adventures, some of which were absolutely sensational and awe-inspiring, it shocked me to see the falls some of these people had endured. That was the underlying issue with all of them, I learned. Not the weekend crowd or the person who just showed up for a night or two, but the regulars. They shared something in common. We shared something in common. All of us. An emptiness that couldn't be filled, no matter how much liquid we poured in. Over time, I lured several of them away from that place. <clears throat> Our conversations may have begun under the dim glow of fading neon lights, but they became much more friendly and fruitful under the incandescent bulbs of my home. The group started out as an innocuous, impromptu get-together at my place. Nothing formal, just a simple gathering of acquaintances. We'd all, we'd all already become familiar with each other through our liaisons at the bar. So although the concept was perceptibly uncomfortable for a few of them, after a little bit of prodding and a generous dose of peer pressure, we all agreed, let's have a dinner party. I provided drinks, of course. Now these men were sober, not yet. It lubricated our discussions, and knowing what I knew about each of them... I was able to eventually turn the evening into a serious, soul-searching discussion. At one point, one of them asked why I never have a drink. I replied simply, because I don't. And so, while not a preacher, I did evolve into a sort of savior. The get-togethers continued until they became a regular item on each of our weekly calendars, and over time, the drink slowed. It wasn't preaching. It was leading by example and by discussing things that were worth discussing. These men found a path again. And as weeks turned to months, others brought their friends. Those friends brought friends. We eventually had to run out of church basement. I became a veritable cult leader, and it was glorious. One of those nights, while talking with Harold, an elderly gentleman everybody knew, I realized I did have one thing none of them did. One thing none of them did. I had clarity. I wasn't lost in a bottle, but rather just lost and well aware of that fact. They had been searching for meaning and, having found none, resorted to oblivion. I could guide them through. I could give them clarity. Maybe not happiness, but clarity and truth. That evening, after the others had packed up and left, and the last of the stragglers' post-meaning conversations fizzled out, I saw him, Harold, sitting alone in his chair. His face held no feeling, just an empty stare of nothingness. I finished putting away my things and went to the door, planning to turn out the light. My hand rested on the switch, and I sighed and looked back at this lone, lonely, shattered man. I'm abandoned, he muttered, the words barely legible, muffled by his full mustache and thick beard of twisted gray whiskers. <coughs> I gave pause, considering if I should turn off the light and allow him to work through it himself, but something in me knew that despite the quiet nature of the whisper, this was a plea, a plea for me to save him. Taking my hand from the light switch, I, slowly, I, tur I turned slowly on my heel and strode to where he sat. Placing my bag on the seat next to him, I knelt down before him and looked up at him patiently. Neither of us spoke. 
The silence was unbearable, but we both held ourselves in it, trapped in time and space for what must have been nearly a half an hour. During that time, neither of us spoke. I just looked at him compassionately, waiting until he was ready. It took quite a bit of self-control to sit there so close to him. His heavy breath stank like an old ashtray filled with stale coffee. Eventually, I placed my hand on his knee, feeling his rough skin poking through the torn denim. When I looked at his face, though, I witnessed a stream of tears running down from his blue eyes, down his cheek, matting his beard. It was the most spiritual moment I had ever experienced. As he cried, so did I. We embraced and spiraled into a portmanteau of inconsolable tears. <clears throat> we wept together as one until all our tears had been spent. After a long silence, he pulled away from me, and his eyes, like lagoons, he said, they left me to die alone. Who? I asked gently. Who's left you? My family, he replied, choking back the words. They abandoned me long ago. He took a deep breath and leaned back in his chair. They left and never returned. My wife, my children, everyone I ever loved. In a show of compassion, I stood and put my hand firmly on his shoulder, the worn, cracked leather of his jacket sticking to my palm. I nodded understanding. Turned the plastic folding chair in front of him, him around and took a seat and listened. Years ago, he said, he had a happy family. Everything he had ever wanted. They hadn't spoken to him in nearly two decades. It turned out that one night, after several drinks too many, he lost complete control. It wasn't the first time, but it was the worst time. And it was the last. His wife had been nagging him. His words, not mine. All week to do some household job or another. One he procrastinated on forever. Not wanting to deal with the pressure, he started to drink. The first beer was gone before the clock struck nine in the morning. In frustration, his wife left for the day, and having nothing better to do, he continued to drink. Later in the afternoon, he was awoken from the nap at the sound of breaking glass. He pushed himself out of bed and stumbled down the stairs to find his teenage son standing in the living room, a shattered casserole dish at his feet. Pasta sauce and chips of ceramic splayed everywhere. What the hell, the father yelled. I'm dramatizing, of course. I don't know exactly what he said, but it was something loud, mean, and vulgar. The man looked at his father, then down to his own bare feet, which apparently had broken the fall of the dish and were now spouting copious amounts of blood under the parquet flooring. And overcome with rage at the mess, the father barely took notice of his son's injury. He instead berated his son and lunged at him and attacked. Pure fury had overtaken him, and he beat that boy until his face could have been mistaken for the spilled casserole. Afterwards, he stumbled back to the room and back to sleep, and while his son laid unconscious, bloody and beaten on the kitchen floor. <clears throat> the next time he woke, he was being put in the cuffs and being taken away. He never saw his wife or son again after that. A restraining order had been issued immediately, and the only communication the two ever had was, from then on was with attorneys as proxies. The story tore at my heart. An unthinking sin of unfathomable violence perpetrated amongst loved ones. He very easily could have labeled, been labeled an evil man and, in his estimation, had been called such by countless others through his life. After his time in prison, he was never able to find a steady job again, and he lived the next 15 or so years on and off the streets. A few years ago, he found some work as a janitor, enough to bribe money for a small apartment and new clothes, which over time had suffered their own wear, and enough food to survive. Not to grow fat, but more than enough not to starve. A few teeth rotted out, and I shuddered at what the thought of what this man's meals cons consisted of. I felt for the man, I truly did. You could see his heart was not just broken, but obliterated, and had been for a long time. Pieces of it were still there, but it was so crushed that it was almost beyond repair. I thought of telling him that he was a good man, and that he had just made the mistake, and it was their fault, and they hadn't been willing to forgive him, but I didn't. Instead, I told him the truth. I told him he was the one at fault. He was the one responsible for what had happened. It wasn't the alcohol's fault. And it wasn't just an accident, it was a choice he made long ago when he decided that drinking and avoiding his problems was more important than caring for his family. The only person at fault there was him, and it was no surprise they had left him. From the look of horror on his face, he could see no one had ever spoken to him like this before, at least not someone he trusted. I went on. The beating was his fault. The continued drinking and failure to amount to anything of value after the event, that was his fault. They were all his decisions. He was no victim. He wasn't sick. He made really bad choices. 
He made them early in his life, and he continued to make them. There was no redemption to come through God through a continuous life of self-flagellation. God had nothing to do with this. These were his failures as a man, and although there was nothing he could do about what had happened, it was time he accepted these failures, accepted the fact that he was not abandoned, but rather he abandoned them. Now, what was he going to do? That word didn't act as a revelation for him. He didn't jump from his seat, hug me dearly, and thank me. In silence, he picked up his belongings and turned to me and punched me in the face. When I woke up, he was gone and turned the lights off on his way out. He was back next week, though. Never spoke of it again. Never spoke of that night again. But there was a palpable bond between us, electrically present in each of our stares. Admiration lived in those glances. Admiration for, from each of us, each for the other. A few weeks later, he stopped coming, though, and I never saw him again. One night, a newcomer approached me as we were packing up for the evening to return to our individual homes. A lump formed in my throat, and my body tensed. I didn't have the energy to save someone that night. These people, they look up to you, he said. You're a real leader and an inspiration. I nodded and thanked him, continued to pack up my belongings as I so he could finally head home, but he continued... You know, we need people like you out in the real world. We need people who can lead. I asked him to explain what he was on about, and he suggested I try to run for a public office position. I laughed, laughed it off and left. Now, to say the comment was easily forgotten, though, would be to lie. It stuck with me, and I ruminated on it incessantly. Was he right? Was I a natural-born leader? My actions had built something rather grand. Nearly 100 people were coming to our meetings every week. I must have had some had something worthwhile to offer others, some special gift of wisdom, and wouldn't it be immoral for me not to try to share myself even further than I already had? During our next meeting, I searched for the man who had come up with the idea, but he was nowhere to be found, so I hesitantly proposed the concept to the congregation. The reaction was unbelievable. I was a star to them, a life-changing figurehead of, for prosperity, and these people loved me. A position on the city council was, an op was opening in my district, why don't I run for it? You're sure to win. You have our support. Cheers. Applause. A face flushed crimson. A broad grin leaking euphoria. This is where my concerns now surface and why I feel I must share these anecdotes with you. In saving that old man, I felt my being swell with great pride. I had helped him and probably made his life once again bearable and worth living. I had done it. My knowledge and generous outpouring had done something positive. Not only for him, of course but for everyone who came to these meetings. What I had inside me was something strong and worthy of sharing. They had said so as much that night when they joined in unison and cheered me on. But what? But was it wrong to feel such pride in my actions? I received great pleasure from them, and the pleasure born from the knowledge I held such, such, held such sway over these poor, lost individuals was not only hugely satisfying, but it was what drove me to build what I had built in the first place. A revelation, a revelation hit me recently, something I had not been aware of at the time, but now that I look back in retrospect, it's clear as day. I did what I did because it was important that I be important. But still, motives aside, the results of my actions were positive, were they not? So then, were they ethical? Were they just? Should I be begging forgiveness for my actions? Or do they instead give St. Peter reason to open his gates to me and roll out a red carpet when one day I approach? Short break.
All right, Twitter. It looks like you guys must have gotten lost somewhere along the way. Um, I restarted that, but um, sorry for whatever you guys have all missed. Um, apparently, the Twitter app crashed. So, yay, Twitter. Good job to keep working. So, well, uh, I'm sorry if you missed some, but we're back, and we are on Chapter 11 of A Confession. Side note. Facebook Live, still working. So, I guess, so far, Facebook beats Periscope. But I'm also going to run out of time on Facebook soon here. Actually, let me check what time it is. Quick. Let's say we've got about two hours left until Facebook is going to turn me off. Max time is four hours on a Facebook broadcast. So, we'll, uh, I think we'll we get a chance to make it to the end. We'll see. All right? Anyways. Chapter 11. I'm famished. Would you like some dinner? I think I'll make sandwiches. Turkey, lettuce, Swiss and whole grain, okay with you? Mustard and mayo? I'll be back with our food in a few minutes. Uh, feel free to close your eyes and take a quick rest. I'll wake you when I return. Sandwiches have to be one of the best inventions ever. A great sandwich can be delicious, yet it takes so little work. The best part is there really aren't any rules when it comes to a sandwich. You can make up any sandwich you want. It doesn't even have to have bread. I've seen people use lettuce instead of bread when they want to cut down on their carbohydrates. It's not for me, but to each his own. Uh, sandwich is much more in my taste wheelhouse. Classic. Simple. Utilitarian. Eat your grains, your protein, your vegetables. A uh, rather healthy meal, or so we've been led to believe. Thing is, you never can be sure about anything. You're told bread is good for you, then later you learn that it really isn't anything more than sugar, unless you're eating one with whole grains. You change whole grains, and there's a movement against carbs. I never bought into that silliness, of course, but there are plenty of people who did. Even if I had to decide to switch to lettuce as a bread replacement, I still would be unhealthy, because deli meats are processed meats, and they're... Bad for you and you'll kill you. Mayonnaise is just to be helping with cholesterol. Bread is just empty calories. The lettuce could have E. coli. It's so futile. I'll just continue to enjoy my sandwich. Living life in fear of death seems so preposterous, especially when you consider the undeniable truth that our lives are meaningless to begin with. If we're to make the most of this gift of life, shouldn't we try to make it as bearable as we can? So I say, eat sandwiches. Drink a milkshake. Have a candy bar. The rest of these kinds of choices are all presented to us relentlessly. Each and every person has an agenda. And these agendas rule our lives. They restrict our freedom. They restrict it through fear. Fear of sickness. Fear of death. Fear of repercussions. What happens if we live freely other than an increase in happiness? No. Taking freedom from others is, in my opinion, the ultimate sin. One shouldn't tell others how to live, who to love, or what to put into their bodies. Guidance. Yes, that, that's allowable. B and perhaps even a moral responsibility. But to manage others by threat or force is reprehensible. Nothing less than slavery. So, eat your sandwich or don't. I really don't care. <laughs> you look at me like, like I'm a hypocrite. I, I can see the contempt in your eyes even as you try to hide it. I'm not going to force you to do anything you don't want to. That's the beauty of a free life. Once we're presented with our options, what we do from those options, what choices we make or don't make are ours and ours alone. Yes, sometimes we find ourselves forced into situations we'd rather not be in, and you could argue that the person putting you into that position is doing wrong. Sometimes, however, one must consciously do wrong and sacrifice himself to, let, to help others see more clearly. If you don't want the sandwich, it's fine. I'm not going to make you something else. You're just going to have to deal with some hunger. The choice is yours. What's that? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, you want to know what happened? What became my bid for office? Yeah, I went all in. I ran for city council. I ran. <laughs> and I lost. Badly. Embarrassingly so. In my dejection, I gave up on my group and let them fend for themselves and returned to my previous pro solitary life. I had nearly returned to Hermitage, but a small ray of hope had managed to illuminate my darkness. No matter how much I tried to shut it out, it was still there, glowing in the cobwebs in the corner. Chapter 12. On the day of the vote, it was pretty clear I was going to lose. There wasn't a lot of polling or anything of that sort being done, since it was such a small race. 
but from the small amount that have been done, you know what, we're going to just check to make sure Twitter's still working. Hold on. All right, we're still live on Twitter. I got one person watching. Very, very big hit of a show we got going on here, I see. Um, nonetheless, I am recording the entire thing. Hopefully that will work. So let's continue. Back to chapter 12. On the day of the vote, it was pretty clear I was going to lose. There wasn't a lot of polling or anything of that sort being done since it was such a small race, but from the amount that it had been done and from the nasty looks I got as I walked down the street, it was pretty clear a lot of people didn't like me. I had no history in politics, and the few times that I did speak, my political stances were met with scorn and derision. Uh, a few times the crowd actually booed me. So that night as the polls were closing, I got my car and I drove to the bar where Janine Vellner was waiting with her friends for the votes to be counted and her inevitable win announced. The place was packed with locals and I spotted Janine sitting in the back of the room, surrounded by others. In the subdued glow of the lighting, her practice smiled at the room, standing there in a crisp white pantsuit. Her long red hair pulled back into a sensible ponytail and bangs down to her eyes. I had to admit she actually was quite beautiful. As I made my way across the bar, I glanced at a few of the patrons, who returned my look with sudden frowns. The farther I walked, the more people saw me, the quieter the room got. What do you want? Janine asked. She held a martini in her hand, and with the other, motioned for me to sit down. I've come to concede victory. But the votes haven't even been counted. Janine, you and I both know I have no chance of winning. The voters, I said, indicating the crowd with people watching us. The voters are your people, not mine. Her eyes twinkled in self-admiration as I said this, and she couldn't help but smile even further. Well, that's very nice of you. I appreciate you coming down here. You didn't have to do that. No, 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 I didn't. But I thought I should. It just seemed the proper thing to do. God, her eyes are beautiful. Deep jade that sent me spinning. She looked around the room anxiously. The others were looking at us curiously, almost as if waiting for a fight to break out. I reached out and shook her hand. Well then, congratulations. Her hands were so soft I didn't want to let go. Turning to leave, I added, would you like to have dinner or a drink sometime? And a peace, an official peace offering for me to you. Sure, she said offhandedly. You know how to get a hold of me. A few nights later, I called her up and she agreed to go out for drinks with me. I didn't drink, of course, but she didn't need to know I was an alcoholic. The outing was simple and unassuming. We met up later that evening at the same bar. She had her victory party on the night of the election. It was dead empty, though, due mostly to it being a Sunday. So we had the place more or less to ourselves. The jukebox played Fleetwood Mac's landslide, and we talked. Listen, I know we don't agree on politics, I said, giving her a little smile. So how about tonight we just spend, together, spend time together as two adults and talk about something completely different? Okay, she replied, Wrinkling your forehead while giving a slow nod. What exactly did you have in mind? Honestly, I hadn't thought that far ahead, I laughed. I don't know. Tell me your favorite movie. The conversation that evening went along those lines. Discussions of simple pleasures. Nothing of much deep meaning, but instead just the little things we enjoyed. We laughed together as we exchanged quotes from our favorite comedies and huddled closer as we, and huddled closer as we eagerly discussed the finer points of Hitchcock's career. She preferred rear window while I was a North by Northwest man, but it was good enough. As the minutes and hours passed, we learned that in spite of our political differences, we actually did share a lot of commonalities. The fact that she was beautiful didn't hurt either. On a few occasions, she'd nudge me, expecting a response when I'd gone silent in those eyes, but by the end of the night, I was completely infatuated. Thank you for a great night, she said, slipping on into her coat. No, no, thank you. It was my pleasure. The words felt awkward on my tongue. We walked together in silence to the door. Just as she reached out for the handle, I reached my own hand, stopping her. Janine, I said. She turned to face me, her eyes looking at me expectantly. I was wondering, well, you see, I was thinking that tonight was a lot of fun. A lot of fun? What is this, high school? I mean, I had a... I mean, I had a really great time with you tonight. She twisted her fingers to grip my hand tighter. I had forgotten I was even touching her. I had a great time, too. Thank you. So would you like to do it again? I asked. Absolutely, she replied. Then, giving me a small kiss, turned and opened the door. 
I consider chasing after. When would be a good time? Should I call you? Will you call me? Why the hell am I even following you like this? I, I should hate you. Instead, I just stood there like a dolt with a great big grin on my face, feeling the heat of her lips fade from my cheek. The date went on to spawn many more, and we got along splendidly. It was, if not a match made in heaven, at least a match worthy of its own lifetime special. We were both very happy in each other's company, and soon we were spending every available minute together. After about three months of dating, we moved in together. Then, after six months, we were engaged. We were married within a year. You see, my opponent wasn't altogether different than me. We argued on some core values. He was much more socialist than I, but by my gracious nature, I overcame my pride that election night, conceding defeat, allowing bygones to be bygones, and letting nature take its course. For all the arguing and mudslinging in our campaigns, what I didn't expect to discover was that we actually shared many mutual interests. Our lives outside of politics were oddly in sync, and that one dinner turned into another and another, then loved, and someone would even manage to evolve to marriage. Yes, nature took its course, and that course was something rather different than what I think either of us could have predicted. I married the woman who had previously, who had previously painted as my mortal enemy. I made a decision not to allow our past to cloud our future, and looked forward to the life we would have rather than dwell on the lives we had led. We disagreed vociferously, even violently at times, when it came to politics. But we both did our best to leave these discussions out of our daily interactions and enjoy each other for our similarities rather than our differences. After we married, we tried to expand our relationship through open discussions, attempting to connect by our similarities and to help each other grow through our differences. Different points of views, revelations, understandings, etc. But it quickly became evident that these discussions only caused fruitless argument and were better avoided. More often than not, my arguments for personal freedom ran counter to her desire for altruism. I'd argued that altruism was together, altogether a fallacy and that you could never do something without having a personal reason for doing so. Even gratification and knowing you've helped another, that positive feedback of dopamine you get from that rush, is proof altruism doesn't exist. These are merely semantic arguments, of course, for they really had no bearing on what actions we preferred. Where I drew the line, however, was when her arguments delved into socialism. As you know, I've always been a proponent of charity, both through action as well as finance, but I also strongly believe that to take from one person under threat of prison, prison as our tax laws threaten is akin to slavery. Forced labor, work hard, or in my case, simply manage your money wisely, and we're going to take some of it from you to give to someone else. When a man toils his life away and is forced to give his rewards to someone else, is that any different than working under, the force for, under force for that person's gain? All men are created equal, but after that creation, the equality no longer exists. We have no right to be equal. We only have a right to start from equality and then live our lives from there. The destination for a truly free man being our own to determine. Don't you think you have enough? Janine asked. Her back remaining turned to me as she poured a cup of coffee. The sun streaming through the window this Sunday morning lit the edges of her strawberry hair with a subtle glow. Dust motes floated around the, in the air around her, dancing and, agita and agitated by the wake of her movements, landing softly, then disappearing like snowflakes as they lit upon her sea green cardigan. Enough of what? I replied, wiping the coffee from my own cup off my lips. You know damn well what I mean. She turned to face me. I could barely make out a face, the sunlight behind her reducing her to just a silhouette. But standing there above me accusingly, I knew exactly what she meant. When are you going to realize there's more to life than just you? The world is a village, not an archipelago, archipelago of islands. <laughs> Can you read my own words sometimes? As she approached the kitchen table, her tan leather flats scraped against the dust and grit on the ceramic tiles. She stepped out of the direct rays of the sun, and I could see it in her face, the familiar frown of disdain and contempt. <laughs> Placing her coffee on the table, she remained standing, her pale blue skirt fluttering gently in the air of the open window. She stood there, hovering over me, tall and threatening, awaiting my response. The night before it ended in an argument, both of us in the same bed but facing our opposite directions, a wall of pillows between us. It was a common argument, but when the topic came up, but I had done my best to avoid such discussions. I knew how they always ended. Neither of us ever was happy, and heaven knows neither of us was ever going to convince the other to alter our dogmas. <clears throat> I just can't see how you're against it. 
It's only a small tax increase, and the money is all earmarked to go to improve our schools, for Christ's sake. I patted the chair next to me, inviting her to take a seat. She ignored me, picked up her cup, and moved over to the other side of the table. There she remained standing. The table became a physical barrier between us. Calmly, taking another sip of my own coffee, I remained seated. Well, Janine, I replied, it's because it's my money. That's why. If I had wanted to give money to the school, I could just write a check. Not that I want to, but I could. Don't you feel some kind of obligation to your community? She asked, repositioning her black frame Dion von Fosterberg's glasses on her nose. You'd never be where you are without the help of others. How? How? How are others helping me? I'm not on food stamps. She furred her brows and pressed her lips in disgust. Like I just forced federal lemon. Police, clean sidewalks, sewer, water, fire department, lighted streets. These things are all fine, and I pay for them happily, I replied, leaning back in my chair. But I don't see how they're related to a new football field. You honestly don't understand society, do you? For as smart and wise as you make yourself out to be, I would think you'd have a better grasp on how reality works. Everything is connected. Even something like the football field, which, by the way, isn't the only thing this money is for helps to build teamwork, discipline, strong, healthy bodies, and a common goal for the community. I don't want a new football field, and I definitely don't think it's up to others to make a decision for me as to what I want. Much worse, to just ignore my desires and rob me with their groupthink self-righteousness? Besides, it's people like you and I who will be footing the bill for this thing. With the house we have, we're the direct target of so-called fairness by property taxes. I don't get you. You act like we're part of this 1%. We're not being targeted. Yes, our taxes will go up some, but it's not. But it's the others who are going to take care of most of the bill. If you ask me, they have plenty of money, and it's time they give something back to our community. No, no, we're not part of the 1%, but we're close. And that's what's wrong with being in, and what's wrong with being in that 1% anyway. What's wrong with seeing success dangled in front of you so you then work harder and try to succeed yourself? There's nothing quite as motivating to a donkey as a carrot dangling in front of his nose. The donkey never gets the carrot. It just hangs there in front of him as he mindlessly trudges forward. Her face flushed red as anger got the better part of her, nearly hiding her freckles that decorated her thin face. Sighing, I took a deep drink of coffee. Oh, don't be daft. Of course he gets the carrot. Maybe not through his own doing. Maybe the driver gives it to him when he gets done with his work, but he gets it. Otherwise, the trick would never work again. And that's what it is, isn't it? A great big trick. Tease a bag of money, fast cars, fancy houses in front of the population, triggering their autonomic desire to have. We always desire more. No matter what we have, we always want more. You always want more. They may get the carrot, but it's not by their own doing. It's only given to a select few. Someone built up a scenario where there was an arbitrary prize held in front of that donkey, and that donkey did the work. More work than ever should have been necessary to get that carrot. The driver could have just as well split that carrot between himself and the donkey and carried the load himself. You're impossible, you know that? What part of it's mine and I should be given the right to decide for myself do you not understand? I'm not dangling some carrot here. I'm not forcing someone to do something they don't want to. I just don't want to pay for a goddamn football field. It's about the basic ideology. You talk of people working hard, living free, and reaping the rewards, but it's not about hard work all the time. Sometimes it's just about nothing but sheer dumb luck. You're a perfect example of that, you know. Me? What did I do? She stood there, her mouth agape, in utter shock that it could be so oblivious. Slowly, she dragged her chair back from the table, legs screeching across the tile, and took a seat. After calmly taking a drink of her own coffee, she continued. You've never really worked. A few odd jobs in your 20s, but you've never worked. Everything you have, and I mean everything, has been given to you. You live comfortably, without care or concern, simply from the work of your brother. I manage that money now, I interjected. Coasting along through life, she continued, it's the hard work of others that has allowed you to live as you have. The hackles were raised earlier, but this accusation brought things to a new level. I rose from my chair, slamming it back into the ground with a splintering crack. My brother, God rest his soul, was a good man. He worked. He created. And when he was taken from this world, he had no more need for his money and gave it to me so I could be free. And what have you done with that freedom other than simply satisfy your own desires? Have you used your freedom to help your fellow man? Or have you just gone along your merry way, oblivious to the plight of others, stepping over those you saw face down in a puddle? Oh, come off it. I've helped plenty. I've given to charities. I've opened doors for strangers. Hell, I started a self-help group, which you abandoned. 
I ran for a public office, for Christ's sake. It doesn't get much more benevolent than that. The woman was a hypocrite. Yes, yes, you did, and you lost. You lost to me, someone who has very different ideals than you. What does that say about you? I couldn't take any more. I turned and went to the counter. The only one was left of my coffee down the drain and setting my cup gently in the sink. You say your brother didn't need that money anymore. Neither did you. You didn't need it. You didn't need it, but you took it, and you kept it to fulfill whatever flights of fancy you had. What would you have me do? Donate it all to charity and go find some soul-sucking job? Maybe, for that matter, every time someone dies, their money should all just go to charity. Blood and relation be damned. Raising her eyebrows and cur curling her lips, she exposed her fangs. You've avoided the realities of life, ignoring the plight of others, and by doing so have forced them to suffer more than they should have. It's been in your power to raise people up, but your greed and unrelenting self-interest only continues to reinforce the distance between you and them. You are a selfish man, and yet you remain married to me. She opened her eyes, eyes wide and gasped. Then, pulling back her arm, splashing the coffee on the floor and the wall behind her as she did, threw the cup of coffee at me. Dismissing my face, it exploded on the canvas and left a brown stain of coffee dregs on their white facade. <clears throat> Shards and splinters of porcelain scattered everywhere. I looked at her, shook my head, and just walked out of the room. Have fun cleaning that up, I said over my shoulder. At a volume just loud enough for her to hear. Yes, people are born poor. They are born destitute. They acquire sicknesses and diseases. I agree with this. No, not everyone dives into the life from the same starting block. And that does seem unfair. But would it be right to take from others to drag down the more fortunate simply to try to level the playing field? We'd be stricting one man's freedom at the expense of another by a system devised by other purportedly wiser men who have somehow decided what constitutes fairness. Wouldn't it be better then to immediately give all children to the state upon birth? Start them with nothing, no benefits of family or background or position. Yes, that would level the playing field. But natural argus, naturalist arguments aside, it would also still require resources. Where would the money come from for such a program? I think things are much better as they are. Those in fortunate situations do have more opportunity. But it's up to them to realize that opportunity and turn into success. It's also up to them to squander it. Society exists in levels well beyond generations, and over time, everything may find balance. Still, no one said life is fair, and as long as we aren't taking from or inflicting pain and harm on others, how are others my responsibility? Many people, of course, do view this as our responsibility. Some are empathetic and simply can't stand to see others, in des others destitute or in pain. Others want to know that there's a safety net present. Should they ever switch positions and find themselves at the bottom rung? We've already discussed at length the virtues of charity, public service, and philanthropy. So there's no need to get into that further, but let me say this. Where there is society, there will always be those who wish to serve and improve it. It's a natural way of things. <clears throat> and just as there are evil people in the world who only want to hurt and maim, there are also those, like you, who want to lift and cure and heal. <coughs> Prosecute, prosecute those who hurt and maim. They take away freedom. Celebrate those who cure and heal. They enhance freedom. But those who don't want to be involved, let them be. They neither cause harm nor require assistance, but are neutral players in the game of life. This is an area where my wife and I could find no common ground, other than both agreeing that it's better for people to succeed than to fail. We both want mankind to reach higher levels of happiness, but our methods varied drastically. Still, in spite of these differences, our love was strong, or so it seemed to me. We fought regularly, but never failed to reconcile. And our passions for each other only ignited with larger flames than before when we, when we rediscovered the reasons for our union. On several occasions, however, the fights were not easily resolved until several days had passed. The nights when these occurred were fraught with tension, and more times than not, end up with one of us having a, leaving in a fit to go and release our pressure valves elsewhere. I remember one disagreement that nearly ended in thrown punches, and I'm sure it would have ended with a black eye for one or the other of us had I not stormed out the door to leave her behind. I was fuming with anger. Even now, remembering that night, I can feel the flush in my cheeks. My teeth are green together. Allow me a moment to regain my composure.
All right. Here we go. Chapter 13. <sighs> ah, yes. Yes, I'm feeling, ver I'm feeling better. No, no, I want to continue. The next event I feel is one I must share with you since it still weighs heavily on my conscience. I'm still unsure if I did anything wrong, but even the shame of simple possibilities, misdeeds considered yet unrealized may at times be nearly unbearable. Times like this were when the desire to drink again burned fiercest in my belly. In my Prius, my hands still shaking with rage, stomach dysphoric, I drove. I had no destination of mine, just anywhere that was away. The thought of going to a bar didn't even occur to me until I saw one in the distance. As I pulled in the parking lot and came to a stop, my face fell into my hands in anguish. I remained there in the car, attempting to regain control through controlled, through controlled breathing and silent contemplation. After about 20 minutes, I exhaled a final sigh, opened the door, crunched forward through the parking lot, and marched through the entrance of our town into the, to the entrance of our town's finest gentleman's club. I didn't drink, not alcohol at least. I ordered a soda water and sat at a table, watching the women writhe and gyrate disaffectedly. After some time, the music, haze, darkness, and undulations of the organisms in front of me pulled my thoughts from the earlier events, and I began to enjoy myself and the entertainment presented by my present location. I felt desires in my loins. I ached for something new. Like a fool, I tried to strike up a conversation with a short, well-endowed brunette. She must have been 20 years my junior, but she was exquisite. Playing her part, she chatted me up as she danced, increasing the attention she gave me with the more money I threw at her. I asked her what she was doing later, and she asked me to meet her outside the bar so we could go someplace else. Don't you have to finish working? I asked. No, plenty of other girls are on. Besides, it's one of the perks. She winked, turned, and walked through the doors, heading backstage. My blood pressure was dangerously high at that point. A man of my age shouldn't expose himself to such excitement. My doctor would argue. I excitedly pulled on my coat, threw a few dollars on the table, and strolled nonchalantly out into the cool dark of night. After waiting about 20 minutes, I was almost sure she had been putting me on. The back door opened and she sauntered out. Her heels dug into the sand and gravel as she made her way over to me. She might have been completely naked, but for the long jacket she was wearing, I couldn't tell for certain, and I never found out. Hey, honey, she said. I am so excited to have met you, but before we get started, I'll need payment up front. For safety's sake, I can't take another runner. Dan would kill me. I was flabbergasted. Of course I picked up a prostitute. I'd done it before, purposefully, but in my distressed state, the idea that I was in the situation never even crossed my mind. This was just a job, so to speak, a payday, and though my desire for her remained, I was disgusted at the thought of thinking of me as just simply another John. Moreover, I was honestly offended she hadn't given me even into me freely. I slammed her up against a brick wall, her head smashing against the stone, and screamed at her with righteous in indignation. I don't recall exactly what I said. By this time, all ability of conscious thought had escaped me, but I'm sure it was something like, You worthless bitch! I'll never pay for you, or something similar. Though she appeared visibly shaken, she also remained remarkably calm. Oh, I get it. You thought this was a freebie. You thought this was something real. I'm sorry, honey. She reached, slowed into her pur she reached slowly into her purse. Here, I have something for you. I pulled myself away from her body, cautiously, allowing a few inches of space to open between us. I looked down, and she pulled her hand from her bag, and she shot me with a taser. I fell to the ground, shaking violently and vomited. She kicked me in the gut several times and returned to the club by the rear entrance. Don't ever come here again, she said as the door closed behind her. After a few minutes, I got up, dusted myself off, and returned to my vehicle. I went home, sculpted across my bedroom, and crawled in bed next to my wife, our backs to each other throughout the night. I never spoke of the event to her, and she never asked where the bruises came from. I also never went back to that bar. A rapist? Yeah, good heavens, no. Chapter 15. A rapist? Good heavens, no. What would lead you to entertain such an idea? No, nothing of the sort. I was merely surprised at our misunderstanding. Oh, I must admit the prospect is rather titillating, having such control over another person. It's just that the act of such would be morally wrong. A theft of someone's freedom over the domain of their body? Besides, I must confess I fear if I ever were to attempt such a feat, I'd fail to achieve the desired arousal at the most inopportune of times. And what an embarrassment that would be. A man of my age must be honest with himself and accept that such a failure would be quite possible. Yes, officer. Or, yes, officer, the old man tried to rape me, but the poor bastard couldn't even get his little dinger up. 
What a laugh. Newspaper headlines and shame followed by self-imposed exile is all that would become of it. Sure, one could argue to the judge, no, your grace, rape was never the intention. I must have, I just have a peculiar fondness for flopping about on naked women. There was no intercourse, not even such an intention. Just a sickness and predilections. Rehab and counseling are necessary. It's just an illness. Still, the conceit that I should ever do such a thing is so preposterous that it's laughable at mere suggestion. Power and control and satisfaction through raw fleshly pleasure are all undeniably enviable things, but still, these are goals of which we must restrain ourselves and act within a set of ethical boundaries. To take away another's power for oneself is pure selfishness and, desire, and a denial of the most basic of human rights, freedom. So, while I appreciate your kind of nature, no, I would never force myself upon a woman. At least not through physicality alone. I mean, it's when you can manipulate the senses so that the decision is hers, made by her own free will, that you can move forward with such carnal passions. I have no qualms about fornicating with women who have been plied with alcohol or even shown but a limited perspective of myself. What I have issue with is relations based upon force or lies. A woman, or a man for that matter, makes his or, own his or her own decisions in life. Should she decide to take a drink, she alone is responsible for that and goes into it knowing well ahead of time that in doing so, she may be giving up her own reason. It's no different from the delusions brought on by lust, for those are nothing but chemical reactions in our bodies as well. You might even say that lust in itself is more dangerous than drugs or alcohol. Introducing those chemical reactions into ourselves is a choice we make of our own free will. What our body does in reaction to some new unexpected stimuli, such as a beautiful man or a woman, is a bit beyond our control, for natural causes have robbed us of our rationality. There are always options. Besides, should one such have a craving, I couldn't return to the bar, not without risk of bodily harm from the proprietor or staff, but I could find plenty of others in the trade, willing to trade coins for coitus, or whatever other debauchery currently tickled my fancy. Those in the business have rescued me from many restless nights, albeit never will I found myself entrenched in monogamy. You know, the monogamy of marriage or a serious relationship. Nevertheless, this event soon became but a fading memory. It held no bearing on my wife. She never knew of its existence, and for me, I chalked it up to a simple moment of weakness. Yes, I regretted my actions, but they were mine alone, and I was the one who suffered damages from them. Our marriage returned to its normal status of love and obstinate passion, and we remained happy for several more years. To her, however, the reality must have been altogether different. The marriage that I thought had stabilized had done so not from peace and joy between us, but rather from outside forces that managed to calm any potential, albeit unknown, frustrations. One evening, while she was out for a night of business with her fellow council members, I remained home alone, meddling with our computer. Our automated backups had been failing, and my goal for the night was to solve the mystery as to why. After looking into the problem further, I appeared we'd exceeded our data storage limit, causing backups to stop. So rather than just limit our, up the limit for a few extra dollars, though, I decided to do some digging to determine what was causing the spike in usage. After a few hours of sleuthing, I came across a recently added folder with a backup of my wife's mobile phone, and it contained a rather large file. I opened it, and my jaw dropped as my stomach turned itself inside out. The file opened to show a video of my wife and another council member engaged in carnal embrace. The video began from her point of view, looking down at the naked maths she ride upon. Soon, amongst all the jostling, the camera was dropped, only to be quickly retrieved by her partner and proceeded to film her from his point of view. He laughed joyously while she bounced about on top of him, tits flapping about like two flower sacks half-filled, one holding lies, the other deception. There was no question about it. I recognized her immediately, even with the hair covering her face as she screamed in passion. She pulled her hair behind her head and arched her back. I couldn't take any more. My, no my nausea quickly gave way to indignation, and I felt my thoughts start to race as my breathing quickened. I felt no dejection, only rage. I realized our marriage was over. It had been over, and I'd just been blind to this fact, happy in my own situation of a disjointed and possibly dysfunctional yet predictable existence I gave up on her. There was no sadness only anger. How could she do something like this to me? The cheating little bitch. Lies and deception were what really formed the foundation of our relationship. If she'd been there, I would have killed her. I would have beaten her face into the kitchen counter until there was nothing left. And then I'd thrown the body out on the curb in disgust. A wretched woman. 
But as she wasn't home, my anger slowly subsided, and my wits returned. This could not stand, of course, and it was an act for which there could be no excuse and no forgiveness. She needed to be taught a strict lesson in trust, one without violence or pain, but still one from which she would never recover. After careful consideration, I designed a rather simple but effective plan. Knowing her as I did, I was well aware that she used the same password for just about everything she did online. This applied to everything from email to shopping websites to social media accounts. I consider logging on directly from our shared computer then and there, but quickly revised my plan when I realized that posts are sometimes flagged with the manner in which they are uploaded. So, to make my deception all the more believable, I powered up my mobile phone. We both used the same mobile device and logged out of my account and on to hers. A few taps and an upload later, I had shared her sorted video online for everyone to see. I posted it from her own personal account, sharing it publicly to the City Council's social media page. A few seconds later, I visited the post as her and left a comment. OMG, how did this get posted? What happened? I can't delete it. I then changed her password and security codes, locking out of her account on her own phone, logging out of her account on my own, and returned all the phone's accounts and settings back to their previous owner, me. Sleep was difficult to come by after this. My curiosity as to the plan's effectiveness was on high alert. I spent the next several hours refreshing the page, watching common codes and shares grow, until around midnight the post disappeared, likely due to being flagged as inappropriate content. Didn't matter, though. Damage is already done. Thousands of citizens have commented on it and have been shared hundreds of times. Who knows how many people actually saw the video, but in a town of our size, word spread quickly and my plan had worked. When she came home later that evening, I could tell she was in a state. She obviously had been made aware of the event, as I could overhear hushed, worried conversations between her and several callers, even after she locked the front door. Pretending to be asleep, I remember pulling the pillow down across my face to hide the big grin on my face. Next morning, she broke the news to me. She had no choice. The, er the entire town was abuzz with word of the affair. While not everyone had been... While well, not everyone saw what had been shared, more than enough had for exaggerated descriptions to spread like wildfire. The truth was bad enough on its own. The exaggerations, they were an embarrassment. As she explained the situation to me, I performed my greatest feat of acting and played the part of the crushed and dejected lover. She had hurt me so badly. My heart was broken. The idea that I could have been behind it never even crossed her mind. I was too stupid for something like that. Not long after, civic wheels began to turn at a pace reserved only for the unfolding of public spectacle. Normally, you can't get a stop sign approved without months of bureaucracy, reams of petitions, and miles of red tape, but she lost her position on the board within a week. The seat was to remain open until a new face could be appointed, to remain in position until the next general election. Current, continuing my role as the wrong husband, I hung my head in false shame and moved out of our house. The board members had abandoned her completely, and what friends we shared of that group quickly assigned themselves with me to help me get through such a terrible time. One night, while pouring out my heart, I brought up the question of who they thought would be taking the position. They haven't chosen anyone yet. As far as I know, no one eligible has shown any marked interest, my friend replied. Well, that certainly is disappointing to hear, I replied. For what I know as her husband, as well as what I learned of the position during my own run for it, is a rather important role in the proper running of our city. My friend nodded in agreement, and our conversation returned to my sorrow and how I was holding up. The seed was planted. He nominated me the next day, and when formally approached, I allowed them to talk me into it. It took a little longer than originally planned, but I finally won the seat. Our divorce was finalized several months later. In her shame, she moved out of town. I have no idea where to, as we never spoke again after that morning. To maintain my veneer of innocence, it was important that I realize to the fullest extent the hurt and suffering and embarrassment she had caused me. Without these symptoms, I could be suspect, and if I were caught simply for shining a spotlight on a truth, the situation would have gone against both our favor. The world hates a cheer, but it appears to hate a snitch even more. Just ask Edward Snowden. You think it was cruel of me to publicly shame her like that? No. No different than painting a big red A on her forehead? That may be true, but you can't argue with a straight face that it wasn't deserved. The reasons she made were her. The decisions she made were hers and hers alone. 
sexual rendezvous, the act of recording said rendezvous, and even her poor attempts at file management? Pfft. All I did was hold up two items, a mirror and a window. There were no lies, aside from the identity of the actual person who uploaded the video. No special effects, no gossipy rumors or whispered scandals. What the world saw was the naked truth. Nothing more, nothing less. I only showed them who she was so they could decide if she was really the person they thought. My plan had involved taking over her position. Although, as events unfolded and the possibility of gaining the seat I had so desired became real, I did maneuver the outcome a bit to turn out in my favor. Nevertheless, we needed a new council member, and I was, quite frankly, the person best suited for the position. As the general election came up and I had a real campaign and, and I had to run a real campaign and win a popular vote, I managed to get a judge friend of mine to move up my divorce hearing. The divorce was finalized the week before the vote, and with me running for a previous position, there was no better news fodder than the coverage of the final chapters of the whole sordid affair. Recaps were run, everything was dredged up again. I remained stolid, yet showed signs of emotional pain when asked about our marriage in the interviews leading up to the election. I had the city in my hands. I could have been selling snake oil, and still they would have voted for me, if for no other reason than despite my evil, soon-to-be ex-wife. After news of the divorce died off and the election came and went, things changed. My role was now to be an actual politician, representing the district that voted for my wife instead of me the first time around. They couldn't have been less happy with me. One event in particular really raised the haggles of my constituents. An outdoor walking mall, populated by shops, boutiques, and artisan restaurants, had been seeing slow business and was on the verge of shutting down. Additional expansions had been discussed and concepts even drawn up that never made it past the planning stages. A large lot adjacent to the mall remained vacant. And with the dwindling amount of foot traffic and the existing tenants threatening to leave, the developer was in a tough spot, especially with the tax burden that comes with owning such a valuable lot downtown. <clears throat> he was approached by a large big box general goods retailer, which wa he wanted to reposition itself as a trendy store, or as trendy as a big box retailer could be. Downtown locale was not only perfect, but also within walking distance of the kinds of customers the retailer had been trying to broaden its appeal to. Needless to say, the guy who owned the property was thrilled with the prospect. Not only could he, manage, could he eliminate the money pit from his portfolio, but he could do so while reaping a rather meaningful profit. The residents of the area, however, were not thrilled. Not in my backyard mentality had plagued many attempts to bring change downtown. Gentrification was an ugly word for those who preferred honesty, reality, and fairness. Even proposed changes to allow wind turbines or chicken coops were met with derision. It's too loud. Too many birds will die. The smell will be atrocious. Given the type of people living in the area, you'd think these would have been celebrated as steps towards a better planet. Less fossil fuels, less food miles, and even fresh organic food. But, no, while they were happy to push for these things in theory, they didn't want them in their district. It was preferable to drive a hybrid and just visit the co-op when they wanted organic, vegetarian-fed, free-range eggs. So, when the plans to erect a 175,000 square foot monstrosity of corporate greed in their neighborhood came up, you can safely assume it was met with much scorn. Picket signs were raised, and protesters gathered to voice their distaste for the idea. Arguments that it would kill local business, or that it would send profits out of state, were advanced with fervor. This wasn't a battle I wanted to wage, so instead of having open hearings and one-on-one -on -one discussions with the people in my district, I just went ahead and voted in favor of the project. Any of the business owners of the shops in the mall, they were desperate for any reason to drive traffic through their doors, even if it meant adding in a competitor who would undercut them on price. A few were upset, of course, and rightfully so, because they went on a business soon afterward, but the majority of them were gracious. Besides, I was pretty good friends with the guy who owned the land, and I knew the trouble he was going through as well. This would have been his only chance to unload without a loss, so I gave him a helping hand. Rumors of recall had already started to swirl after only a few months of my term, and this whole business with the lot pushed things past the point of no return. People stormed the streets, going door to door with their clipboards, begging for signatures. They had, they had more than enough of them, given the territory, and my position would be brought to an early vote. I should have known better than to represent these people, but just because they didn't like me didn't mean no one else did. Throughout all this hubbub, I received a rather large amount of coverage in the local news. My district was the hippie district, full of rich college professors and others who always argued for fairness. 
but they still enjoyed the nice smooth ride of Alexis. They were not, however, representative of the rest of the city. So, just as everything was reaching fever pitch, I was approached by a few other city council members with an idea. You know, you're not the only one who thought that store was a good idea, right? You just gotta get out of that district. You'd be great anywhere else. Say, why don't you just resign and run for mayor? With the support you've gained from the rest of the city after all the coverage you've had, you'd be a shoo in for the position. At that point, I'd had enough. I hated politics. I wanted nothing to do with politics. It was all infighting and posturing and wasting of money. I could handle no more. The system of politics, like so many aspects of our lives, is nothing more than a lie consisting of promises of free choice. <clears throat> like newspapers and television and radio, we were presented with a multitude of options to choose from. But these choices are only the options which have achieved such a level of acceptance that they've been embraced by those with the finances to do so. Power begets power. And within our capitalist society, money lies at the absolute root. Now don't confuse yourself. I am a fat and happy capitalist pig. Without laws protecting the value of work, my brother's songs would be worth no more than the paper they were written on. But I am able to own those words and melodies through copyright laws and rights to property. This lets me leverage them for financial gain, and in doing so, I have procured a small fortune. And with that power, and with that, the power to do much as I prefer. Rules and laws still restrict me, of course, like any man. But at least with money, one can jump some hurdles and even more so affect change. In the world of radio, record labels had control over what music succeeded and what didn't. If you weren't on a label, you had little chance of distribution on radio, and especially no chance at benefiting from payola. So to get a start, you had to play within the set of rules, and you had the mercy of those who were in power, usually large corporations. For who else would have the money for radio towers? So, radio and television like it presented the listener with countless choices. But still, all of them curated and selected by a powerful few tastemakers and ideolo ideology pushers. Brainwashing of the masses had never been simpler. Are people nothing more than prisoners of the radio, boob tube, and silver screen? <clears throat> the advent of the internet did a lot to change that, and in my opinion, there hasn't been a greater disruptor of power in all of history. Printing presses would have been the other, but due to the cost of their operations, any true freedom of press still remained with those who could afford them or the services of those who owned them. With the level of influence on lives that a political position holds, it remains one of the few bastions of inequitable power distribution. <clears throat> any competition for office is honestly nothing short of one of the greatest repeated spectacles of illusion ever perpetrated on the people. We may live in a democracy, or a representative republic, to be more accurate, but when given choices between several variations of the same ideologies, how is the public actually choosing those who will act in society's best interest? The presentations on our screens showcasing various political stances. Even debates across party lines are still arguments performed by a few individuals selected, bought, and paid for by the prevailing oligarchical class. The internet, as I said, has done some to change this. But as the internet grows and media companies are swallowed up by large corporations, independent voices are continually extinguished, only to exist in the peripheries normally reserved for lunatics and conspiracy theorists. <coughs> a thousand voices speaking the real truth at once are still but a thousand solitary cries shouted out into the ether that is the network. Tied together by a hashtag, they burst to life in a spark of passion, and then just and then die just as quickly when the next trending topic takes over the top of their news feed. No, politics is nothing but shuffling of the same deck of cards, and the deck is missing its jokers. Loaded dice. The illusion of strategy and choice, and even the luck of chance, ultimately designed to resolve in but a few, few preferred eventualities. In life, the voice with the most money wins, even if people never even saw a contest. Behind closed doors, these decks are cut and stacked, and only then are they dealt out to the players. Politics was power. I love power. I love to have power and to confer power onto others. Power is freedom, and freedom power. It wasn't until the mayoral position was suggested that I realized I had now become at risk of influence by third parties. People had recognized my power and wanted to utilize it as proxy for their own. I could be bought and sold, and if I refused, then heaven forbid I learn of the consequences. So, I didn't run for mayor. I gave it all up and quit. I resigned my position and moved out of town. That's how I ended up here, alone, renewed, and once again free. You think I'm obsessed with freedom? I admit, it's an ideal for which I've lived my entire life. 
I wasn't born into servitude, no more so than any regular man, and one could argue I'd enjoyed greater freedom through my life than many others. Equality is not a place in which we are born, and therefore some are born with more freedom than others. What we do with that freedom is ours alone, and that is what is so fantastic about it. Should we want to enrich others' freedoms, we are able to do so. Should we decide to just float through life, that's our decision as well. I've done a little of both. Do no harm. That's my motto. Do no harm. Be free. And you just might make it through this bastard of a life with, if nothing else to show for it, pride. It's worthless in the end, once you're dead, of course, but at least it's something you can own and hold and hold on to for the time you're here. It's what keeps us from complete emptiness. Without pride, we'd all be better off simply killing ourselves. I recall the first time I lived a life of pure freedom. It was a lie, of course, for at the time I didn't realize. In reality, I had very little freedom, but my obliviousness to the actualities of life at the time precluded me from feeling any of the restrictions that existed. As a young child, I had none of these thoughts and worries of freedom, of fate, or death. Not even of the future. And being unaware of freedom, I was unable to dwell on its existence or lack thereof. Take a short break. This broadcast is not bought, brought to you by Mountain Dew Kickstart, but I am drinking it. Maybe someday they'll they'll pay for this ad, but for now, we're just lucky. Anyways, let's continue here. Chapter 15. It's getting rather late. I apologize for detaining you for so long, but we're making some definite progress here, don't you agree? You must, however, pause for a break. My head is swimming with so many thoughts. It appears the more one thinks about the past, the more forgotten threads are found, just yearning to be tugged at and unraveled. I fear if we don't pause, I'll go on forever, completely losing focus and turning this discussion into a memoir rather than, than the confession it's supposed to be. Yes, I understand your concerns. Not everything I said is some horrible wrongdoing. But as I said earlier, I believe everything I am telling you is worth telling, as it will put all the actions and concerns into their proper context. But enough of these nostalgic di di divertisements. Let's unwind a bit with some music. I see they have a proper record player here in the corner, behind the reading chair. Now, where then are their albums? Ah, here they are. Oh, what, a, what an atrocious collection. One would think that even having a record player in today's day and age would put someone into a place of higher taste. Nowadays, music collections like this are reserved for portable phones and gener computer-generated playlists. With music so readily available, the unfortunate side effect is that it has become even more disposable. Attention spans have shortened to a minuscule length, and with any song just a click or tap away, we have removed any investment other than time from its consumption. As art loses scarcity and personal investment, it also loses value, only to be quickly thrown away for the next pleasurable sensation. Now this collection of music, on the other hand, while not completely recently released pop garbage and arguably classic is a collection of classic garbage ABBA, Fleetwood Mac, The Eagles, Nora Jones what pure and utter trash I'll be chucked in the fire all of it, I'll refrain or, or I value my lungs and prefer not to breathe in the smoke of melted and burning vinyl oh, but look here, sandwich between the Oak Ridge Boys and Purple Rain finally something we can at least settle on They've never been my favorite, not something I picked for my desert island list, but they can do in a pinch, which, looking at the remainder of our options, we appear to be in. Just wait, I'll put it on, and you can listen and then give your opinion. I'm sure it's not music you listen to regularly, but I'm sure you've heard it sometime in your life. Perhaps in your deviant teenage days, when you were an outcast. Maybe isolation and dejection from society is what led you to your final occupation. If so, then I'm certain you'll be familiar. Listen. I can't actually turn on the music right now because I don't have rights to it, but 
Just pretend you're hearing it, okay? It starts out so simply, yet that steady pulse forebodes a nervous omen. The throbbing of a headache or the beating of a heart. Are the two that different? One does directly affect the other. And that laughter, <clears throat> it isn't laughter of joy, but of psychosis. You, can, you could even mistake it for screams of insanity. And there it goes. The build, the tension, the frightful agitation, only to be replaced with the musical equivalent of a blissful wave of relief. I like to think this transition is symbolic of the pressures and anxiety of life building until they become unbearable, until one can do nothing but either submit or find means of escape. And all that you touch and all that you see is all you will ever be. Such a simple truth, so often unrecognized. Run, rabbit, run, indeed. And then the spinning returns to convulsions of insanity. Voices in one's head, music spinning around and around until you're dizzy at the complexity and beauty. It's not the auditory, if that's not the auditory equivalent of life, I have no idea what is. Have you heard it? It's familiar? I know it by heart, but don't even own a copy. I'm sure I did at some point, but after a while, even the most sublime can become tired and monotonous after too much exposure. Honestly, it's become such a cliche, I can hardly listen to it any longer. But thankfully, however, it is a cliche simply because it's good. Overplayed and held on much higher prestige than it should be, but still, it's their best work and one of modern music's more valuable additions. So, let's leave it play then. It'll make good background music and has already done wonders to settle my mind into a more manageable state than it has already been spiraling into. I'm not a broken man, although you may see me as such. I simply am. I've accepted my wholeness in existence. <clears throat> Every part of me is my own. It's not until you break, as others refer to it, that you can accept the truth. You are here. That is all. Life has no meaning or purpose. When you truly accept this and realize you bear responsibility for no one but yourself, you are free. Any promises or obligations you have to others are of your own choosing. You are free to submit to them or disregard them completely. <clears throat> Just remember we exist in a society with its own set of rules. How you act within its confines has consequences, and you accept them even if you don't agree with them by simply continuing your existence within society. So while we may appear free, to enjoy our freedom we must still prostrate ourselves to some level of slavery. We are free to affect change within society's rules, but society as a whole retains rule over your absolute freedom. It's either that or you move to a desert island where you live your life freely, albeit destitute and alone. Living now in the present, free, or living now in the present frees us from the shackles of the past and the looming horizon of the future. Regrets and consequences fade away and the sole concern is ourselves, here and now. The present tense is the only reality that truly exists. And to embrace our true existence, an existence without goal or future purpose requires that we accept this. All that exists is now, and now is all that exists. Keep your mind focused on the present, and the terror of existence goes unnoticed. Think of now and enjoy now, but in the weight of the future, the results of your choices and the worries of consequence melt away. Stay focused on the present, and the future will cease to exist. Still, there will always be a future. It does not exist, but we create it through the actions of the present. Be mindful, make good decisions, and your present will flourish as it moves along the never-ending trajectory of time. Chapter 16. Should we add a log another log to the fire? Or is it perhaps time to let it fade and die? Our conversation may be coming to a close, and I'd rather not go back out into the rain. Besides, the wood is likely soaked through and unusable by now. <clears throat> I'm fairly certain I forgot to put the tarp back on after my errand. We'd be granted no further heat, but instead nothing but a choking smoke as the wood smothers the flames rather than ignites. <clears throat> oh, this brings back memories. Speaking of memories, where, where, where do we leave off? The divorce, leaving that horrid position, uh, yes, the feeling of freedom. I admit that was the freest I had felt in my entire life, or at least since the time I had discovered there was such a thing to concern oneself about. Children have the ultimate freedom. They live under the rule and order of those tasked with their upbringing, to be certain, but and they throw tantrums when they aren't allowed to do as they please, but they've also not yet discovered that there really is an existence where freedom is possible. And so they live their happy, their young lives happy in their ignorance. 
It's not until one truly experiences freedom and has it taken away that one can realize its value. Am I not right? Imagine a child living under the prescribed laws of his parents, going to bed when told, brushing his teeth as he is expected, doing his homework. These may not be, des be desired actions for him, but always, no matter the revolt, children always end up in compliance. It's because they know no possible life in which they don't do as they are told. They may be able to manipulate and wear their parents down, but those are only negotiating tactics. What if a child truly stood obstinate? What then? They are not free, so their freedom cannot be taken, only the noose further tightened, until balance returns and the inevitable honoring of thy mother and thy father happens. As children, we are at times frustrated, unable to fulfill all the dreams and fancies that light upon us, but we feel free. There are no great burdens put upon us. We know nothing of death or taxes or societal obligations. Our only goal is our own pleasure. As we grow older, our parents and other prominent figures impart on us their rules of morality and a sense of empathy, but when we are young, our lives and our happiness are our primary focus, and no one judges us for this. As a child, I too experienced this freedom. When I look back at that time, although the memories have faded like sunbaked photographs, I retain a memory of innocence. I had no cares or worries, but rather lived each day as its own, with contentment and joy my only goals. Everything was new, and every day seemed brighter than the last. Wide-eyed and worry-free, looking forward to birthdays and holidays, cakes and candies, Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, the magnificence of a summer night filled with the booming explosions of dancing lights. Then one day, this was all stolen from me, stolen from all of us eventually, but for some it's much more gradual than others. I remember the moment everything changed, and although I've shared many a memory with you this evening, this is by far the most precious and embarrassing of them all. I never speak of it, for I still harbor shame, but for you, I will make a gracious exception. Hold on, I need to flip the record. Chapter 17. It was late autumn of my eighth year. i just started second grade a few months earlier, and although bored by my studies, I was as happy as any seven-year-old can be. The first snow had fallen, and the ground was covered with a fine layer of fluff. Nothing deep enough to sled in, or wet enough for a snowball fight or rolling a snowman, but a dry dusting deep enough to hide the lawns and gardens in a layer of pure white. The morning was simply magical. Until this snowfall, I hadn't taken into account what time of year it was. Thanksgiving had come the previous week, but it was still too early to see Christmas on the horizon. Most years where I grew up, holiday decorations weren't set out until the beginning of December, at the earliest. This was still late November. I remember that morning clearly, standing at the bus stop with my mates as we all talked excitedly about the upcoming holiday. <clears throat> the sparkling snow had put it in front and center, fresh in our minds. What are we going to ask Santa for? Had any of us started a list? Did anyone know if Santa had set up shop in the mall yet? So much excitement! Our hearts were filled with wonder. The school morning passed like any other, although I do remember some hushed discussions behind the teacher's back if we would be allowed outside for recess. If so, could we somehow manage to get away with a snowball fight? The late morning sun had been softening the snow to the point where any accumulation on the pavement had long since melted, but surely the grass and the, s the snow on the grass would be perfect for packing. As it turns out, we were allowed outside for recess, but the teachers had been tasked with keeping a vigilant eye on us children to make sure we didn't go out onto the field. It turned into a soggy mess, and we'd be nothing but balls of mud if we gained access. Teachers generally frown on those kinds of messes, as they're the ones in charge of cleanup. Our enjoyment was instead relegated to the asphalt. A few friends and I did sneak our way over to the edge of the fence, though, and managed to pull up enough snow from the lawn on the other side to give and receive a few face washes, myself included. <clears throat> I remember the sharp pain of cold on my face and the chill as it melted and ran down my neck and under my sweater. I would have been irate if I had not been having so much fun. As my fingers furiously brushed the snow from my eyes, I heard a hushed silence fall upon the crowd. When I finally opened my eyes, everyone was staring, petrified at whatever lurked behind me. The feeling of utter dread I felt as I turned and saw who was standing there was far icier than that face full of snow had been. This immediately cut to my bone, and I stood there, simply terrified. What could Harvey James want? Whatever it was, it surely wasn't going to be good.
Hey, baby, he said, sneering. I heard you talking about Santa this morning. Oh, you heard me. We were on the same bus. I must not have noticed him walking by. I haven't been too preoccupied with my friends. His own crew of friends closed in behind him. Trapped by a wall of threatening humanity, I was cornered. What are you asking Santa for, baby? Are you going to ask him for a new fire truck? He said fire just like that, like fire. Are you going to sit on Santa's lap? Are you going to piss your pants like a little baby? He's just a fucking fake, you know. That guy at the mall? He's an old drunk guy with a fake beard and no real job. The crowd had grown behind Harvey and his gang of misfits. It seemed to me that the whole school was now watching. Students and teachers transfixed on the scene unfolding in front of them. Like I said... Everyone wants to watch a train wreck, and this was sure to be a bloody disaster. At that age, I had no idea if Santa was real or not. The question hadn't even entered my mind. The notion that he couldn't exist was simply preposterous. So I did what anyone else would have done. I stood up for myself and Santa. <clears throat> I'd never been in a fight before. I'd never even thrown a punch. My brother was too many years younger than me than would have allowed any of our fights to elevate to that level. I had seen a few brawls on the playground, but I'd never participated except as another gawking onlooker. But here I stood, with both my honor and Santa's honor at stake. Fire surged in my belly. I lost all sense of fear or self-preservation, and I leapt on him. I like to say it went like that scene from A Christmas Story, and I pummeled him until he was nothing but a bloodied, slobbering fool, but I didn't. His friends pulled me off, and one of them held me up, my arms locked behind me. Then Harvey James beat the living shit out of me. I mean it. He beat me until I pissed my pants and continued until I shit myself. When my friends finally let me go, I fell to the ground and received several more kicks. The stomach, the head, legs, my testicles, everywhere. As the kicks slowly subsided, I remember one thought that made its way through the pain. At least it's over. Hey, look, he shit his pants. The little baby actually shit his pants. I was beaten, bloodied, and ashamed. I lay there on the ground, sobbing uncontrollably until after the bell rang. No one came to help. None of my friends, not even a teacher. It was a sight too pathetic to even acknowledge. Eventually, I managed to pull myself together enough to go back into the school, but the doors were locked. I stumbled home, changed my clothes, and cleaned myself up as best I could. My mother still noticed, and when my father came home, he was pissed. What the hell were you thinking, son? You know that kid is twice your size. I was small, but somehow my dad made me feel even smaller. I wanted to find a mouse hole and crawl inside, living the rest of my life in seclusion. It's really nothing but scraps of food stolen, unseen in the night. This was my first experience in public humiliation. The mere concept of evil had never even occurred to me as a real possibility, yet here it was, in the form of Henry Harvey James. He'd literally beaten the crap out of me, and it took weeks to heal. But I never healed completely. In their shame, my friends all abandoned me. I became an outcast in the school mocked and ridiculed at every turn. This hurt much more than the beating. These were wounds that were continually reopened. That winter, the winter of second grade, I learned that what they said was not true. Sticks and stu stones could indeed break bones, but words? Words can always hurt you. The actual words Harvey spoke to me were of little consequence to me directly. I went on believing in Santa for a few more years, but the public scene, the shaming that went with rapidly spreading news of this sort, well, it led to immediate and utter destruction. Wounds of the flesh, when properly treated, can heal in a relatively short amount of time. Wounds of emotion or pride will also fade as seasons pass. But words that form another person's construct of you? Well, words inflicted by those, wounds inflicted by those kinds of words can be permanent. There's no incentive for those words to heal, or for those wounds to heal. They linger and fester until they become infections, easily spread and without any care. After several months, my parents eventually realized this was a shame from which I would never recover, at least not in the eyes of my peers. The only solution was to run and start somewhere completely new, some place where history books could be rewritten, leaving out all the bad parts. My parents, God bless them, overcame their anger and frustration and sacrificed greatly for me. Before the school year was out, we'd moved, not just to a new district, but to a whole new state, where, thankfully, nothing could follow me. These days, there is no escape. Everything follows you, no matter where you go. They leave a trail in your digital wake, one which quickly can be followed up to follow to dig up dirty truths or simply dastardly rumors by anyone. If someone wants to find out, out about you, they'll find out everything. And if something comes up that could destroy you, I assure you it will. Thankfully, that wasn't the case when I was seven or eight years old. Today, it would have been on Facebook and Vine and Instagram and YouTube and Snapchat before I'd even gotten back up from the ground. 
today you can destroy someone with just a simple tap of your finger. It's like magic. And now I'm living a life with the kind of freedom I haven't felt in many years. Free from obligations and commitments, I am once again a man with no restrictions other than my constantly approaching death. The only weights in my life are these questions I've shared with you. And while at times I can feel restricted by the fame my past has built for me, I also feel that recognizing and identifying these questions, I'm able to reject their effect on my current future decisions. I know the record is over. There's nothing else in the stack I want to listen to. Besides, the noise makes it hard for me to concentrate. Let's, let's just continue in silence. You see the clock? It's 11, 11. Make a wish. You never know, it might come true. Chapter 19. And now here we are, just about caught up to present events. This next bit, now that I think about it, really, it really is a catalyst that sparked my need to reach out to you. I struggled with many things in my life, as you now know, but this next truth, well, it's by far the largest of these burdens in my soul. I don't know if it's an event for which I'm culpable or if it's just an event that has happened within my life, but I feel I must end with this. Bear with me while I talk. It may take a while to fully explain. Uh, I feel I may have said too much and set this up to be a, a grand event. There surely will be parts of this that you will judge me on, events that may go against your morals of decency, but they're not, they aren't the dilemma of what I speak about. Uh, listen to me babbling. Okay, I've procrastinated so far, and still... I'm struggling to find diversions. I, I might as well get over with it. All right, here we go. Since I moved to this city, I've lived a life based purely on selfish pleasure. I've done nothing meaningful in the way of charity and have performed no great deeds. The move here was an opportunity to start over and to focus solely on myself. With all obligations laid to rest and my life reset, I was able to build a life where I was not only the main character, but the only character. My moral code remained intact for I did not seek pleasure at the expense of others. And the altruism I had gave way to a sort of nihilistic narcissism. And I must admit, I'm happier now than I've ever been. In my quest for pleasure, I made the acquaintance of a young woman. We met by chance at a record shop, of all places, as she dug through the crates of vinyl. I saw her retrieve a copy of New Order's Technique album, and I had to talk to her. She had previously caught my attention just by walking through the door. Such a young thing, dressed in artfully torn jeans, thigh-high black boots, oversized Lou Reed t-shirt that hung down to her knees. Her figure was quite alluring, uh, and I was instantly taken aback when I saw her face. Her full red lips and her eyes painted dark with makeup and her dyed hair, dyed black hair cropped short. She was like a young Chrissy Hind. In those eyes, I could see tales of experience beyond her years, and I immediately knew we were kindred spirits. I had to possess her. When you're in a record shop, talking to people can be a risky undertaking. First of all, it's difficult in and of itself, because most of the time the person behind the counter has some great new obscure find playing through the store at full volume. <clears throat> Not exactly an environment conducive to conversation. Thankfully, this day the owner was working, so even though... The clerk had his own esoteric college rock record on, and enough brains to keep it at a reasonable level. The second of these deterrents to conversation are the people themselves. The customers are pretty quiet, browsing through the crates, their minds switching from one song to another as they remember the music on the album in front of them. If it's nostalgic enough or hip enough, they pull the record. You can usually tell they're going to pull one, too, from that, man, I have to own this look that comes over their face. Still, some of them aren't quiet, and they're annoying, just annoying as the workers tend to be. There's the thing. When you go to a record shop, you're immediately judged. First and foremost by the clerks. They'll eye you up, check out what you're wearing, see what section you head off to first. If it's to the top sellers, they'll usually stop watching right off. You're of no interest. But if it's somewhere else, they'll keep an eye on you. First time you realize it's happening, you feel self-conscious. Just like they're waiting to trying to catch you to try to slip a record into your bag unseen. But that's not why they're watching. They're watching so they can categorize you and stack you up in their hierarchy of record school, store cool. Yes, people who work in record shops all have their own tastes, and they're all positive that their taste is best. But they also respect those who, like them, have a distinctive and unique taste. As long as it falls outside the purview of what is considered mainstream, it's fair game. Basically, if it's on the radio or has more than a million YouTube views, it's aberrant. Classics can get a reprieve, but only a select few. 
You'll never find a record shop guy going on about how great Invisible Touch is, even though you have to admit it's pretty great. Customers aren't absorbed in their search for that elusive record, or even the ones there to pick their newest hot album, however, aren't my problem. It's the ones that try to so show some sort of com camaraderie with the record store clerks. Inane banter about hipster bullshit drives me nuts. It was the same thing back in the days of folk rock, I suppose, but it's still just it's annoying. I was trying to out esotericize the other. Have you heard X? Oh man, you should check it out. Yeah, definitely. Have you heard Y? Ugh. The absolute worst, though, is when the workers try to engage you in a conversation. If you pick something they deem worthy, they'll immediately be your best friend and shower you with the graciousness of a rundown with their latest playlist and must have albums. Did you know a band name I've never heard of has an album coming out next week? I can hold you a copy if you want. Maybe I'm just not as personal a guy as I consider myself to be. I mean, I like to think I am, but I could just be that when I'm shopping for music, I just don't want to be bothered. It's my subjective thing, and I could care less what you like. Anyways, I watched as she continued to figure her way through the rows of records, her chip black nails tugging gently at the worn cardboard edges of the used records. There was a delicate assuredness to her movements. Soft touch, but the fingertips... The touch soft, but the fingertips sharp and damaged, clawing delicately with an eagerness to continue her quest for the next treasure. She rifled through these records for some time, and I simply stood there like a pubescent teen, stealing glances while still remitting myself from stalker status. <clears throat> it's not as good as Brotherhood, but I'll still give you some credit, I said as she brushed past me in the tight aisle on her way to the jazz section. I already have two copies of Brotherhood, she replied curtly. Why two? I already had a copy, and the second was a gift. The guy who gave it to me didn't know I already had it, and I didn't want to offend him by returning it. I struggled for a reason to continue speaking. Should I bring up the Velvet Underground, ask if she's a Pretenders fan, maybe wait and see what kind of jazz she was into? I had so little to go on. My mind grasped for any words that wouldn't make me come off as a creepy old man. I turned to leave and thought, I am an old man. What of it? Just ask her to dinner. So I asked her to dinner. She said yes, and we ate Asian fusion. They went back to my place and fucked. We fucked all night long. Taking breaks only for coffee and cigarettes, and it was glorious. I never met a woman like her before. I'd rather not get into the minute details, especially with present company, but let's say no perversion was taboo, to the point where she surprised me with some of her suggestions. Though, I never let on as much. Concepts and acts I'd never dreamed of. It was life-changing, and I was hooked. She was my new drug, and I had to have her. I had to have her all the time. She must have found it enjoyable as well. We've been together ever since. I mean, that was four months ago. And in the time since, my eyes have been open to a new level of freedom. <clears throat> a new level of freedom I never before had even considered existed. No fantasy depravity for that matter. No fantasy or depravity for that matter went unexplored or unfulfilled. And I've yet to become bored with her. The first morning, after a night of untold wickedness, I admit I felt guilt. The young and their wide-eyed naivete will often mistake age for wisdom and experience for certitude. Eager to please those they hold in esteem, they yearn attention and will pay for it with the most valuable courtesy they possess, their bodies. I've seen this before with others, in particular with young women I knew when I was her age. Money bought much, and I've known women to be seduced by it, by it and by power, and by what the combination of the two can buy. Had I debauched this woman? Had I licentiously bought her? Did, did I even care? I decided I didn't. She made her decision by her own free will, and guessing from her bag of tricks, she'd made similar decisions before. In this time of unprecedented access to, to any pornography available or imaginable, our young have expanded their tastes to what, in my younger years, would have not only been frowned upon, but shamed. But here she was, enjoying it and leading the way. She wasn't eager to please me. She's eager to please herself, and thusly, I complied. My worries of defilement were ultimately unfounded, I soon discovered. We got together again the next evening at a little vegan Ethiopian place. She had the Yashiro Alika, I had the Veggie Bonatu. Tomatoes were a little soft, and they'd use more garlic than I normally preferred. And I thought to myself, this is probably a really bad choice of a meal for a second date. I made a mental note to chew gum afterward. As we ate, I noticed her fidgeting in her seat. Her phone was on the table, and she glanced at it from time to time, like she was expecting a call or text. 
<clears throat> Throughout the dinner, she spent an inordinate amount of time fingering her straw, bending it back and forth until it cracked at the bend. By the time I finished my meal, I noticed she had hardly touched hers. She kept biting at her lips, her bone-white teeth pressing into the crimson flesh to the point where I feared she might draw blood. Is there something the matter? I don't mean to pry, and it's probably none of my business, but you seem preoccupied tonight. Her eyes met mine and softened. Reaching her hand across the table, she took mine in hers and held it firmly. Leaning forward, she sighed. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, love. It's just work. I've had a rough encounter today. Or I had a rough encounter today. We hadn't yet discussed much of our personal lives. The previous night's dinner consisted mostly of small talk. At the young age of just 25, she was a graduate student, finishing up her Master of Fine Arts at the local university. Originally from Philadelphia, she moved here to pursue her degree, courtesy of a full scholarship, with a stipend. She enjoyed literature and the arts and a great sense of humor, but other than that, I really didn't know much. The majority of our evening events were spent focused on uh, other endeavors. Care to talk about it? I implored hesitantly. My worries that she'd decided to break things off had already been sated by the touch of her hand on mine, but based on previous experience, I was still dreading her reply. Speaking to women about personal matters can be such a drain, as well as a bore, I've found. We hadn't yet reached the point in our relationship, it being so new that I knew what she would need from me emotionally. Some women just prefer that you listen attentively, nodding your head so they feel like you've been listening. Others, they expect action. Indignation, even, from your emphatic response to their plight. I secretly wish you'd just say no, fake a smile, and we get on with dinner. Not particularly, but I suppose I should, but... First, there's something important I need to tell you. Her eyes looked down at her half-eaten meal. I guess now is as good a time as any. As good a time as any for what? Jesus Christ, what was I in for? This wasn't looking promising. My hand started to sweat. Could she feel the hot wetness spreading across her palms through her own fingers? Her eyes reflexively darted around the room, looking for a quick exit. Or my eyes reflexively darted around the room, looking for a quick exit, but I forced them back to her. What do you need to tell me? She squeezed her hand. She returned her eyes to mine and squeezed my hand tighter. My panic subsided, and she, holding a firm, reassuring grip on me, continued. I have to be honest with you. I'm not telling you this to scare you or because I'm ashamed, but rather because I prefer honesty. She shuffled it in her seat. Actually, I should have told you this yesterday, but it just never seemed like the right time. I'm a cam girl. Several seconds passed in silence while I looked at her. My face was surely as blank as a recently stretched canvas, still untouched by an artist. No color, lines, shapes even considered. Not even a sketch or simple considered form. I had no idea what she was talking about. You know, a webcam girl. A performer. My head slowly began to nod. I still wasn't getting it. I'm a sexual animal, as I'm sure you've already figured out. She smirked, her eyes and nose scrunching up in an irresistible way. I'm also, to put it bluntly, pretty hot, and I'm smart. So I put the three of them together and decided to make a business out of it on the side. You know, online sex shows. My heart beat heavily in my chest. Was she going to tell me she had an STD? Was it gonorrhea? AIDS? I caught my breath and forced myself to keep calm. Well, she looked at me expectantly, spinning her hand to indicate she was waiting for a response. Is that it? I asked. This was no big deal. In fact, it was kind of exciting. I'd seen them before, of course. I just had no idea what they were called. Not that I, now that I thought of it, I th maybe even recognized her from a past lonely night. But I decided not to dwell on it. Yes, that's it. Her shoulders slumped as the anxiety left them. She smiled again. So are you okay with it? Uh, it's really not up to me to say one way or the other. I'm completely in favor of a woman doing what she wants with her body, and I certainly can't fault you for putting yours to good use, I replied. I suppose I'd like to know more about just what you do, though, so I can decide if I want to continue this. That's completely understandable. Now, let me clear something up straight away. I'm not swinging from a pole at a CD club, and I'm definitely not a porn star. I don't have patience to the first, and I don't have the body nor the desire for the amount of physical interaction for the latter. Porn's pretty tough. I know girls who do it. Definitely not for me. Not what, no, what I do is mostly solo stuff, and only online. I leaned in to listen. I'd never personally met someone in the sex industry before. I found it intriguing. 
Anyway, I enjoy it, she said matter-of-factly, and it brings in a good stream of extra money. Nothing crazy, just some stripping, touching for good tippers. Once in a while, a stream of shower, a stream of shower for my VIPs. So no actual sex then. <clears throat> well, that depends on how you define sex, she laughed, tossing her hair to the side. I try not to blush. I felt like an idiot. It's an all-girl site, no, so no sex sex. A few girl-on-girl -girl things with some of the other girls once in a while, but that's pretty rare. I charge a lot for that kind of thing, and believe it or not, a man's wallet does have limits. I shrug my shoulders. Yeah, I'm fine with it. Oh, good. I didn't want to kick you to the curb already. She laughed again. Oh, I love that laugh. So, then, care to tell me what happened to get you into such a funk? Taking a deep breath, she straightened herself in her chair. This was going to be interesting. First off, and I apologize for my bluntness, but guys can be assholes, she said. Girls too, for that matter, but I found much larger asshole probability factor coming into play when my viewer has a dick. Every session is usually one or two guys who goes too far, suggesting things that I don't list anywhere on my profile or just plain talking dirty and condescending. They're usually guests with no tokens in their account, so I ignore them. The only people I really care about are the paying customers. The rest? She shrugged. Today, though, there was this one guy. He'd been online before, and I'd done a few private shows for him. Good tipper. Anyway, tonight he asked me for a private show. I can see he doesn't have any tokens. I call him on it and get this. He promises he'll pay me back after he gets paid. I'm like, whatever, man. No cash, no show. He starts to get pissy, calling me rude names, etc. I don't have time for this kind of shit. There are plenty of other paying customers waiting for me to message them back. I'm just about to block it when he posts something like, Stupid bitch, if I see you on the street, I'm going to give you what you really need. Before I can block him, he logs off. I report him to our admin, though, and I'm pretty sure he'll at least get a temporary ban for that. Well, that's kind of scary, I said. Then, scrambling in my head for a way to help, I added, uh, Want me to kick his ass for you? Her eyes opened wide, a look of shock on her face. No, of course not. He's a dick, but I'll take care of myself. Obviously, this was the wrong way to deal with the problem. Please don't get up and leave. Sorry, I understand you're trying to help, but with some kind of misplaced masculine chivalry. I don't need it, though. I've dealt with plenty of people like him already. Usually, you just don't respond. Trolls love to be fed. A better way to deal with it is just block them and move on. It's when they start threatening that it gets to me. Not that I'm scared. His IP puts him in Oklahoma, so I highly doubt we'll be crossing paths anytime soon. It's just that I always, I'm always put out when I'm reminded of just how horrible people can be. I understood completely. Danielle was a woman, a human being, and as such was the sole owner of her own freedom. I respected this very much. No drug addiction or student debt or even a misguided desire to get back to her daddy for some ancient slight had been behind this life choice. One night, I made the mistake of joking that I should join her online sometime. I didn't push the matter, just a joke suggestion, as I had no real interest in actually following through. For one, I'm not turned down by the thought of others watching me. I might have a few fetishes, but public display isn't one of them. Secondly, I'm relatively certain no one wants to see me or my body engage in such gratuitous displays. Most importantly, however, I fear what would happen should my performance be captured someday, though, and used to shame or blackmail me. No offense, but you're not exactly in prime shape to be starting a career as a porn star, she said. Sure, I find you incredibly sexy, but you're just not camera ready. Besides, you can't just start broadcasting your sex life online. There are licenses you have to apply for, registration, tax liabilities, all kinds of extra bull you don't even want to know about. You'd be surprised at what a red tape bureaucracy there is running your own private red light district. Now, that's the last time I've ever brought up that idea. Now, it isn't these sexual actions, neither hers nor mine, that led me to come to you. Though they may be sinful in your eyes, I see no fault in them. Their depravity is arguably true, but it's nothing that but the acts of two consenting adults, both seeking their own gains and neither being harmed by the other. Well, there was some harm, strictly speaking, but it was all consensual. Our safe word was pickle. Anyways, you might call it perverted. Uh, yeah, I prefer instead to refer to our action simply as a sex-positive lifestyle. My predicament, my moral riddle, is something more complicated than fornication outside of marriage. It is, however, tied to and a direct result of our fornications. I should point out there is quite a bit more to our relationship than just frequent ex sexual escapades. 
As our connection grew, I took to walking with her to some of her classes on campus and meeting her for lunch dates. Some evenings, we'd go to the theater, take in a show. We received quite a few curious looks, the two of us together, but she didn't seem to notice or at least paid no attention. Her life, much like mine at her age, was one lived with reckless abandon. One week On weekend evenings, I'd regularly not see her until very late, oftentimes in the morning when she'd come by my, by my apartment after a night of partying at clubs with her friends. I'd grown well past the point in my life where that rigorous lifestyle was of any interest. I'd done my share of clubbing in my youth and had had enough of it. Still, I saw the draw and had no issue with her having fun with her friends. By the time the partying came to a close and she ended up at my door, she was already well on her way, and I, not totally gone. A few times I tried to catch up a bit with a bump or two, but they were no match for the line she had already gone up her nose and the drinks that had been consumed in the hours prior. So to say our relationship was purely sexual would be a lie. There was more to it, and I found myself beginning to crave her presence more and more. I can't say I was falling in love, but I did yearn for her. My feelings were complicated, and we never really discussed them, but something was happening. And every night she came to me, every night for months. We were together. I could see something growing. I can still see it. Seeing is believing, and Lord knows I see it every night. All this, however, was before the fight. Let me rephrase that. It wasn't a fight. It was, it was an argument. A disagreement on lifestyle and preferences one which stemmed from this godforsaken need to control another to mold them to my design. The attempted destruction of freedom for my own personal gain. Do you love me? The voice on the phone asked. It was a straightforward question, one for which I had no simple answer. I certainly hadn't expected it. Uh, I must be honest. I have no idea how to respond. We've still only just met. But still you ask for monogamy. Why do you think you even have the right to ask for it? That's an awfully big promise to make someone who, for all I know, values me for nothing but sex. You know that isn't true. I d care deeply for you, but love, what, what is love? I've been in love, and it was horrid. Love, true love, is nothing but the handing of one's fate to another. It's a state of absolute trust in the act of giving up some of yourself to another person to control. Well, come off it. I'm not asking for a lecture in semantics. You know what I mean. Her voice was turning cold. Do you love me? Fine. I suppose you could say I've fallen for you madly. Do you love me? Do you love me? Maybe. Good. I have no idea how to respond to that. It was a rather smug reply, and she knew this as well, but I knew better than to point that out. Well, you'll be happy to know I've decided to be monogamous. For as long as you want me, and I want you, I will be yours and yours alone. You don't have to give up your... Don't be stupid. Of course I'm not giving up my shows. I never let any person control me like that. They do you no harm, and I'll restrict them to solo performances. Who knows? Maybe someday I'll quit, and that would... But that would be my choice alone. Just like this is my choice. My choice, not yours. Fair enough. Uh, now can we see each other again? The line sat silent, but for her measured breathing on the other end. Three days had passed since the argument when I requested she be faithful to me or the relationship would have to end. I tried not being jealous. I never once logged on to see one of her shows. I had no idea what she was up to when I wasn't there, but I was able to imagine it. And imagination can very often be worse than reality. Still, the thought of her actually with another flesh and blood person, rather than at the other end of a digital connection, didn't sit well with me. It was selfish, I know, but I wanted to have her to myself, mine, and mine alone. There, there's something I have to tell you. Her voice is timid, cautious. I, well, we, well, I, I got pregnant. A load of bricks fell on me. Well, do you have anything to say? I didn't answer. Of course you don't. You don't have any, you don't have to say anything. I already know your response. I know from our trip to the movies the other week. I know from our walks in the park. Anytime you're around children, you can't help but spout off about how much you abhor them. Who brings their kids to movies at night, you'd say. Then he'd pull us from the theater when the kid won't stop crying, saying something inane like, the movie was rubbish anyways. Who takes their girlfriend to see a children's movie? Of course it was going to be rubbish. I had no interest in children. They were the antithesis of my life, a burden and destroyer of the very freedom I had held so dear. Parents were slaves of their children. Mine certainly were to me, and the mere thought of being responsible for a life so fragile and requiring such a commitment, a lifetime commitment, 
was petrifying. I wasn't annoyed at the crying child. Well, I suppose I was, but that wasn't why I wanted to leave, and it certainly wasn't why I disliked children, I replied. It's a factor, to be sure. I hate them because they're nothing more than living, breathing restrictions of freedom. They wake in the night, you wake in the night, they wake in the morning, you wake, you feed them, see them off to school, pick them up. When they're sick and expose yourself to their disgustingness, you, cl you clothe them, bathe them, dedicate your life to them. No, a child is not a bless blessing. A child simply makes you nothing but a slave. Now it was her turn to be silent. We both were for a while. An obligation to our species to procreate? I should say not. Of course, I've heard it argued countless times before, and I admit at times I've been nearly convinced, but, as always, reason and common sense prevailed. The mere thought makes me shudder. We have no moral responsibility to further our own species. In fact, one could argue the responsibility not to. To force life upon others is rather selfish, I think. For the new person you create has no choice in the matter. What responsibility do we have to continue society? To what end does civilization exist? It serves no ultimate purpose, and one could argue that hu once humans are gone, they will not only be unmissed, but the world will be better off for it. Besides, when I'm gone, I'll have no concept of what is happening here on Earth, and whether or not I shunted off little copies of myself into the world will be of no consequence to me. <clears throat> I thank those before me, for they have made life more bearable with modern conveniences and nice use of society, but I fault them for making me exist in the first place. I serve no purpose other than that which is constructed by myself and others. There is no ultimate purpose to man. Even if God should exist, what is our purpose other than to act as a mirror of his image? Or just a great experiment he conducted because he could. I serve no purpose. None of us do. The great absurdity of existence is that we simply are. That is all. The only argument I can understand for having children of one's own would be to make life more bearable for all the others who are born in the future. If existence will continue, regardless of our individual decisions, if it's a truth which we must simply accept and move on, then perhaps there's a responsibility for a select few to procreate in order to advance society. Those who are wise and who have strong philosophies are perhaps the only humans who could be argued to have an obligation to reproduce. Raise more children like ourselves. Children are easily influenced, are they not? How often is a grown man of a different faith than that in which he was raised? It's much easier to sow seeds and grow your own army than it is to try to turn the enemy. This is definitely true. But again, I argue, why is it my individual duty to make duplicates of myself other than for my own self-interest? Heaven forbid I create a child and that child realize that life has no meaning, which being my child truly would, and then just live in abject horror of this truth until he one day up and kills himself. I feel that that was quite a waste of resources, and, of course, my self-interest, as I've defined it, does not include becoming slave to another. It is, in fact, quite the opposite. Looking back, I made some bad choices. In the thrill of this affair, the thought of protection or contraception never crossed my mind. She had told me she was on the pill, but obviously it wasn't working. I know this was careless of me, but overcome by such passions, these worries were of little concern. Besides, one evening, to allay my concerns, I had somehow that had somehow been using her, she had confided me with a secret. She told me that a few months before we met, she'd been scraped, that is, had an abortion, and it had not been her first. Back in high school, she'd had one as well, after her boyfriend at the time had knocked her up. I was a bit put out by this, as I don't believe such an act is morally admissible. But it had happened, and what was I to do about it? To be raider would do no good, and it would definitely have the possibility of ruining the arrangement we have. Why would I consider abortion an inadmissible act? It's surprised you have to ask. My reasoning is the same as many others. I simply believe that life begins at, con at conception. At this point, there are two lives in one body, connected yet separate. I find it difficult to argue that it isn't until a baby is born and the physical tie is severed between it and its mother that a baby becomes a person. I know of all the arguments the other way around and the slippery slope one can find himself on when dealing with potentialities of life, but it's my strong belief that if you find yourself at a point where an actual abortion, meaning the purposeful killing of a living, evolving organism, must be performed, you are indeed taking a life. In taking a life, 
Are you not committing one of the greatest assaults on freedom ever? The forced denial of freedom? Freedom to exist? Yes, you can argue that a woman loses her freedom when she becomes pregnant and is a manner of slave to this new creature. In my opinion, however, I feel that any woman who is pregnant through her own choice to have sexual relations and who is aware of the natural evolutionary purpose behind this act is thereby responsible for any possible outcomes of such a choice. In questions of rape it is much more complicated, a grayer area, and I admit to finding a position in such instances rather difficult. But no matter, this has not been a case of rape. These were abortions as a form of birth control and therefore inadmissible. What good would it do to punish her for such actions? I'm not the one gifted with the ability to meet out punishments for wrongdoings. What she'd done was within the laws of society. No, I couldn't condone such actions, but they were actions of the past and I'm a man of the present. So we carried on and I made an assumption that given her two previous missteps, she had taken measures to ensure this didn't happen again. Of course it did. She can't choose on the pill, but at this point, I have no idea if I should believe her or not. Doesn't really matter though, because regardless of the situation, she got pregnant. We continued sitting there in silence for some time. I could hear her breathing on the other line, anticipating my reply. My silence continued. I still could think of no response. Don't worry about it. I took care of it. What? I lost all sense of what was going on. I took care of it. I don't want a kid. Not now, at least. An abortion yesterday. I hung up the phone. I never considered this possibility. In all my years and all the women I've been with, i never gotten anyone pregnant. Not that I knew of, at least. Emotions overcame me, and I simply hung up the phone, stupefied. This was three days ago. I haven't spoken to her since. And since I'm at a total loss of what to do, I didn't want a child, of course, and yet still I had made one, but the, I had the baby... I, I had no choice in the matter. That's it. That's the crux of it. A life was taken, and I had no choice in the matter. Would I have asked her to keep it? I have no idea what I would have done, but regardless, I was not consulted and not even notified that I'd made a life. That realization was impossible to grasp, for the life I created had also been exterminated before I'd even known of its existence. And this is why, when I look in the mirror, I see but a ghastly reflection. The man I see staring back to me is not the man I thought I was. No, I did not send her to this decision. I had absolutely nothing to do with it, other than my participation in the originating act. But that's it then. I knew she'd done this before and could have easily guessed she'd do it again had another tragedy happened inside her. Now I'm fraught with shame and regret. Am I this man before you, morally culpable? I, I, I'm sorry. I hadn't expected a breakdown like this. I don't normally cry. Whether I admitted it to myself for the time, my decision to, to continue relations with her was was an acceptance of this outcome of as a possibility. I accepted it. I accepted it and moved forward regardless of the consequences. In doing so, I accepted her choices as my own. Am I, am I, am I responsible? Am I responsible for this murder? Fuck you. Fuck you and your posturing and your crocodile tears. Why aren't you looking at me with hate and contempt? I'm sorry. Just, just let me gain my composure. This is just a lot tell me friend tell me does, hire, does hell and brim, fire and brimstone await me is the devil lurking below his jaws open eager to consume me and my filthy soul am I nothing but a sinner I fear this is something for which I can never be forgiven because I don't know if I'm actually sorry or this is just who I am I fear I am nothing but a wicked man back in a second Look at that, it's starting to snow. Beautiful, isn't it? The transition from snow, rain to snow late at night. The flakes are so big like cotton balls, fluttering in the light from the window. They only get big like this at these times of change, the edges of transformation. The wet drops, finally chilling enough to become snowflakes instead of rain, bulging from their moisture. They melt as they hit the ground, but on their way down, out of the darkness and into our view, they are simply beautiful. I'll open the window shade so you can see better. 
The hour is late, and I'm not concerned about onlookers anymore. We've spoken. We've said what we have to say. Or at least I have. I've stripped my soul bare to you. Peeled back my skin and flesh to expose to you that, other than a skeleton of thin white bone, there's nothing inside me but mere emptiness. My despair consumes me. I don't know what happens next. Not since that day long ago, as I lay battered and broken in my schoolyard, have I felt so broken and alone. Yet, here you remain, present, with me, listening, eagerly anticipating my every word. Can you smell it? The sorrow on my breath? It lingers, hanging like a cloud as the world, as the words tumble from within. I am lost. Guide me home. Chapter 21. Are you awake? I thought I heard you stirring. But it may be nothing but the shuffle of what these remain, as they, like their brothers and sisters, are stolen from their mothers by this unremitting wind. Everything has become barren. It is dark. Outside, there is only death. Inside? In here? In here is their life? Sleep. Get your rest. When you awake... Chapter 22. I really do wish you'd answer me or at least acknowledge what I've all said. I've been coming for as I've been I've come asking for absolution or at the very least some kind of affirmation, but still you sit there in silence. Chapter 23. It's time for you to wake up. Hello in there, hello? Wake up. Come on, wake up. Wake up. I said wake up. Chapter 24. There, I finally see you coming too. I apologize for the slap, but I could think of no other way to wake you, and I was getting rather bored here. You've been sleeping for hours now. I've been watching you, fading in and out of sleep myself as I did. It's already past three, and I do say you had me worried for a while there. I thought perhaps I'd lost you, but your pulse remained. I could still feel the blood pushing through your veins. Faint, unsteady, but still present. Still regaining your wits? It'll take some time. I did drug you up a little bit more than I realized. I'm no pharmacist, you know. I simply wanted you to be calm and receptive when I spoke. I can't think when there's a commotion. It agitates me and my focus simply dies. So again, I apologize for giving you too much, but at least you were able to hear me through to the end before you faded away. But what now? What comes next? If I finally let you talk, can we continue this discussion like civilized people? Or will you scream and shout and try to raise the neighbors? It makes no ni no difference. There are no neighbors. We're miles from anyone who would hear you. And the wind and the storm would muffle your cries anyway. I do think it best to close those shades again, though, just in case you do draw attention. So, should I remove the sock from your mouth? Yes? You promise to behave? Okay, then. I will, but if you make a sound... 25. I told you to behave, you bastard, you lying fucking bastard. I am sorry, though, for the pain you must be feeling. That cheek does look rather badly bruised, and your ear was bleeding quite a bit. But I cleaned you up. I offered you an ibuprofen, but honestly, I don't trust myself within range of your wretched mouth again. Yes, you got me good. I dare say if I hadn't knocked you with that lamp, you might have gotten away with my little finger. I failed to see how your strategy would have done any good, though. I might have lost a finger, but you'd still be sitting there tied to a chair with nothing but an old man's finger to fill your belly should I decide to leave you here all alone. You don't think I would leave you, do you? Well, you're probably right about that, but it's still not done. I still need to have this finished as a two-way discussion. You weren't brought here simply to be spoken at. I value, I value your opinion. So should we try this again? I can remove that thing and allow you to speak freely. But you must remain civilized. If you continue to upset me, if you end up being untrustworthy, then I swear to you, I will leave. I'll leave, and I'll just, and you'll just slowly die here. Understood? Good then. I thought I made this clear. I want, I need judgment. My whole life, I thought I had a moral code by which to live. A series of rules, a set of rules I could follow to determine right from wrong and stay on the path of being a decent man. But now, now that I've gone this far, I was forced to look back. And looking back, I now question many things in my past. As we spoke tonight, or as I spoke and you listened, I dredged up memories I'd long ago forgotten. 
when I finally decided to bring you here, I had an inkling of that massive amount of wrongs I had perpetrated. But now, after speaking so deeply, now I am glad to have done this, for things may be far worse than I imagined. But still, I fear I cannot determine right from wrong. I have never purposefully hurt anything. I've never hurt anyone until today. There was that stripper, I suppose, but that was the only, only time I ever had my hands on another person since my childhood. She was unharmed, and I've long ago done my penance for my attack on that young boy who bullied me. But have I? Have I done wrong? That's what I can't figure out. Every decision in my life of any moral substance has followed my guidelines. And never once have I lied or cheated or hurt anyone. I've questioned others' beliefs, made them accountable for explaining why they held them, I've exposed truths, I've engaged in passionate love, but never once did I knowingly make the decision to do wrong. Quick check. possible that Facebook may cut out because there's a four hour limit. If it does, I will stop and restart. So I'm going to take a couple, couple breaks here because we hit about four hours. As a child of 10, my brother, only six, we were perhaps the closest we'd ever been and have ever been since. Although we'd moved to the, inc moved on, although we'd moved after the incident on the playground, I had a hard time making friends. To be, to be completely truthful, I had no friends at all, but my brother, my brother was young and innocent and didn't judge me. I was his big brother and I was his hero. He knew nothing of the embarrassment I endured. He'd been much too young to even comprehend them when they happened or understand why we'd moved those few years ago. Our bond was strong, much stronger than that of a simple friend. We were comrades, bitter enemies at times, but at the core of our relationship, there was an interminable bond only brothers can have. I can see him still, that's how I remember him most. Playing on the floor of our living room, toy cars and wooden blocks strewn about like Dorothy's tornado had blown through a miniaturized car dealership. It was one of our favorite games, playing with those blocks and the little metal dime store cars, building up a perfect city, and then destroying it like a pair of human Godzillas. As the cars spread across the scuffed oak floor, one rolled out of the way under the couch, only to come rolling back towards us. I lowered my young cheek against the cool floorboards and, ignoring the sandy grit from open summer windows dirtying my skin, peered under the couch to see what had sent it back. There I saw a set of mischievous eyes looking back at me. If we stared at each other for a brief moment, then their owner lunged toward my face. Patches had joined our family only a few months earlier. She was our first pet at our new home, our first pet, actually, ever. Our parents, after weeks of begging, and in what I believe to have been an attempt to provide us with some connection aside from each other, had bought us a kitten of our very own. She was a scruffy little thing, Coco and Onyx, with a faint dab of brown in her nose like she got into a jar of peanut butter. She loved to bat things about, as any kitten does, and the car rolling under the couch was just as tempting a prey as a tiny gray mouse. She pawed and chased after it, darting from her dark spot, dark hiding spot with their secret ninja cat skills. I'm gonna check Facebook again. I'm sorry for interrupting. Patches, my brother cried in joy. Come here, kitty. You want to play? He found a few of the round red blocks and cleared a space amongst the mess of toys. He rolled a block like a miniature wheel, and the cat chased after, tackling it and flipping on her side as she attempted to devour the little wooden circle. While he continued to play, I picked up a few of the other blocks and started dropping them back into their bin where they clacked like firecrackers against the containers of plastic and each other. The sound of the wood pieces banging together was too much for curious cats to ignore, and her attention quickly shifted from her previous preoccupation to the wonder of what could be hiding within that box. Now, as anyone with a cat knows, they simply love boxes. Just like children, more often than not, you'll find a cat enjoying the package a toy comes in much more than the toy itself. Put a box in front of a cat, and it's a universal law that at some point the cat will jump into the box. Pat just tried to follow this law, but the box size were a little too high for her to jump in herself. I picked her up and helped her get in. Once in the box, she crouched down and flattened her furry little body against the blocks at the bottom. 
acting as though she were completely hidden and invisible. Hiding on the floor next to the box, David played a game where he'd slowly poke a finger over the top lip, sometimes scratching at the plastic gently to get Patch's attention. She'd look up, eye the little pink intruder, and attack. He'd pull back his finger, and she'd dive back down into her hidden pit, waiting for her prey to return. This went on for a while, and I eventually joined in on the game. Fingers invading from both sides, she even got more riled up. I peeked at her once or twice, and she, body flattened, would look up at me, her eyes little black and gold marbles. The sound of her purr was audible, even when the sounds of her stifled laughter and the banging of her happy tail as it knocked bricks around indiscriminately inside the box. The doorbell rang and pulled us from our games. I stood up and went to the door and see who it could be. I wasn't supposed to open the door for anyone, but it was a neighbor boy. So he'd stop by to see if we could play, and not having any friends and eager to make some, I invited him in. The boy appeared to be equipped for some serious expedition, decked out in oily rubber waders, felt-bottom boots, dirty, loose-fitting, grass-stained shirt, oversized khaki fishing hat engulfing his head, the sides drooping over his ears almost to his neck, uh, and he was wearing a spotlessly clean pair of mirrored aviators that he looked out from underneath. He looks like a molting bug. You want to go play at the creek? He shoved a mint-colored butterfly net in my face. It stunk of dried river muck. We could hunt frogs and crayfish. <laughs> sure, that would be great, I replied. I had no net of my own, much less a set of frog hunting gear, but simply being with someone new was enough to keep this from stopping me. David, I'm going to go play outside, I yelled. The floor, tr the floor trembled as a stampede of little footsteps echoed through the hall. Can I? David took a deep breath and wiped his brow. Can I come too? I looked at my new friend. I really didn't want my brother taking along, as he was certain to embarrass me somehow, but I also couldn't leave David home alone. My father was working, my mother had gone to the store. I was in charge, and if anything happened to David, I'd have been the one to bear the brunt of responsibility. Yeah, sure, he can come. Cool, I'll get my shoes. What are we doing? We're going hunting. You can be our lookout. What's a lookout do? You'll be a spotter. You'll stand on the shore and tell us when you see any crayfish or frogs and point so we can go catch them. Aye, aye, Captain, he replied, saluting us just before he ran off to the rear closet to get his shoes and whatever else a young boy brings on a crayfishing expedition. We spent hours at the creek. Our outing was cut short when we heard our mother's shouts calling to find out where we were. After her cries turned to threats, we finally gave in and ran back home. It had been a great afternoon, and we were sad to go home, but we also didn't want to risk the wrath of an angry mother. All right, Facebook, I'm sorry. I don't know when I lost you. Um, we're going to have to jump back just a little bit here and pick up. Hopefully we're in a good spot. Okay. So if you don't know what's happening, the uh, narrator and his brother are playing with the cat, and we're going to start there. So Patches, my brother cried in joy. Come here, kitty. You want to play? He found a few of the round red blocks and cleared a space amongst the mess of toys. He rolled a block like a miniature wheel, and the cat chased after, tackling and flipping on her side as she attempted to devour the little wooden circle. While he continued to play, I picked up a few of the other blocks and started dropping them back into their bin where they clacked like firecrackers against the container's plastic and each other. The sound of the wood pieces... The sound of the wood pieces banging together was too much for a curious cat to ignore, and her attention quickly shifted from her previous preoccupation to the wonder of what could be hiding in that box. Now, as anyone with a cat knows, they simply love boxes, just like children. More often than not, you'll find a cat enjoying the package a toy comes in, much more than the toy itself. 
Put a box in front of a cat, and it's a universal law that at some point the cat will jump into the box. Patches tried to follow this law, but the box sides were a little too high for her to jump in herself. I picked her up and helped her get in. Once in the box, she crouched down and flattened her furry little body against the blocks at the bottom, acting as though she were completely hidden and invisible. Hiding on the floor next to the box, David played a game where he'd slowly poke a thick finger over the top lip, sometimes scratching at the plastic lightly to get Patches' attention. She'd look up, eye the little pink intruder, and attack. He'd pull back his finger, and she'd dive back down to her hidden pit, waiting for her prey to return. This went on for a while, and I eventually joined in on the game. Fingers invading from both sides, the, she, even, she got even more riled up. I peeked at her once or twice, and she, body flattened, would look up at me. Her eyes was like big black and gold marbles. The sound of her purr was audible, even over the sounds of our stifled laughter, and the banging of as her happy tail knocked bricks around indiscriminately inside the box. The doorbell rang and pulled us from our games. I stood up and went to the door to see who it could be. It wasn't supposed, I wasn't supposed to open the door for anyone, but it was a neighbor boy. He stopped by to see if we could play, and not having any friends, yet eager to make some, I invited him in. The boy appeared to be equipped for some serious expedition, decked in only in oily rubber waders, felt bottom boots, and a dirty, loose-fitting, grass-stained shirt. Oversized, an oversized khaki fishing hat engulfed his head, the sides drooping down over his ears, almost to his neck. A spotlessly clean pair of mirrored aviators peered out from underneath. He looked like a molting bug. Do you want to play at the creek? He shoved a mint-colored butterfly net in my face. It stunk of dried river muck. We could hunt frogs and crayfish. Sure, that would be great, I replied. I had no net of my own, much less a full set of frog hunting gear, but simply being with someone new was enough to keep, me, keep this from stopping me. David, I'm going to play outside, I yelled. The floor trembled as a stampede of little footsteps echoed through the hall. Can I? David took a deep breath and wiped his brow. Can I come too? I looked at my new friend. I really didn't want my brother taking along as he was certain to embarrass me somehow, but I also couldn't leave David home alone. My father was working, and my mother had gone to the store. I was in charge, and if anything happened to David, I'd have been the one to bear the, front, the brunt of responsibility. Yeah, sure, he can come. Cool, I'll get my shoes. What are we doing? We're going hunting. You can bear a lookout. What's a lookout do? It'll be a spotter. You stand on the shore and tell us when you see any crayfish or frogs, then points we can catch them. Aye, aye, Captain, he replied, saluting us just before he ran off to the rear closet to get his shoes and whatever else a young boy brings on a crayfishing expedition. We spent a few hours at the creek. Our outing was cut short when we heard my mother's shouts, calling to find out where we were. After her cries turned to threats, we finally gave in and ran back home. It had been a great afternoon, and we were sad to go home, but we also didn't want to risk the wrath of an angry mother. When we got home, we took baths and ate dinner, and we each picked a book from the family bookshelf and sat down to read quietly to ourselves. Well, for me to read and for David to look at the drawings, he could read some words, but wasn't into chapter books yet like I was, so preferring to stick to his pictures. <laughs> My mother joined us, her nightly tea in hand. The cup clinked on the glass top table glass top on the side table and she settled back in the recliner as she opened her book I distinctly remembered seeing her looking around eyes searching the room has anyone seen Patches even though we'd only had her in the family for a few months Patches had become a regular fixture on mom's lap while she was reading I can still see her sitting there one hand holding her book the other gently stroking the cat's fur while she closed her eyes and purred contentedly I haven't seen her since earlier maybe she's sleeping somewhere my, my mother shrugged and opened her book. By the time bedtime came around, we still hadn't seen Patches. This was extremely notable because there hadn't been a night where she didn't show up at dinner time, looking eagerly toward us, waiting for a scrap of food to fall to the floor. Boy, it's time to brush teeth, wash up, and get ready for bed, my mother called up from the playroom. You have to clean, this mess, clean up this mess in here first, though. We left the playroom in quite a state when we went outside to play earlier. Blocks and cars were still everywhere. Thankfully, it wouldn't take much time to clean up. Everything just had to go back in the plastic bin and we'd be done. I grabbed a handful of cars, carried them to the bin, and removed the lid. Lying there, still and lifeless at the bottom, was Patches. She'd been shut in there for hours, suffocating to death. The plastic toy box had become her plastic coffin. 
The storage bin was one of those ones with the types, tops that seal tight. David must have closed it, closed her up in it while we were playing and forgotten to come back and let her out. This was the first time I'd ever seen something dead up close. It was horrific. She looked pretty much like normal, just lying there, except she wasn't breathing, and she didn't jump when we opened the box. A pile of crap lay on the floor, and she was wet from her own piss. My mother, at the sound of David's screams, came running to the room, and when she saw what lay before us, put her hands over both her eyes and tried to pull us away. David went with her and sobbed in her arms. I pushed her away and continued to, share, to stare into that green plastic box with the dead cat inside. I killed that cat, not on purpose, not even through my direct actions, but I killed her. Had I paid attention to my brother, had I been an attentive and responsible older sibling, it wouldn't have happened. If I had no friends, or even anyone who was interested in possibly being a friend who stopped by and distracted us, Patches would have been on Mother's lap, purring away while she read her book. I blame myself, and I didn't forgive myself. I still haven't. The memory faded over time, but I still bear responsibility. At the time, I projected some of the blame onto that friend. If he hadn't asked me to play, I wouldn't have killed Patches. I never played with him again. Cruelty to animals and to people, for that matter, is something I can't allow. That cat did nothing, and though, though the cruelty was, wasn't intentional, I can't help but see her in my mind's eye, trapped in the darkness, mewling at first then frantically struggling to find an exit. I'm surprised she didn't tip the box over, to be honest. Just horrible. Chapter 26. Many years ago, when I was in high school, one night I went out driving with my friends. We weren't going anywhere in particular, just spending time driving, enjoying the newfound freedom that a set of wheels provided. Night had fallen, we were traveling the back roads deep in the woods at what was certainly not a safe rate of speed. One of the guys spotted a reflection from the side of the road, a pair of glowing eyes. Raccoon, he shouted. Who wants road pizza? The driver replied. His wild eyes showed an eagerness no different than a young boy lost in a frenzy of torn paper awaits the next gift in his birthday pile. Looking to the others in the car, I saw nothing but the pitched fever of a forming mob. I had no idea what was happening here, but what I saw unnerved me. What the hell, guy? Or, I pushed my eyes closed tight and felt my stomach tighten. It was all I could do not to throw up when my, cars, when my ears were assaulted by the wet crunch of tire crushing bone. What the hell, guys? I pleaded. Hold on, watch this, said the driver, speaking to the others as they cheered him on, oblivious to my dismay. He turned the truck around and drove to the animal, flailing, still alive on the road, its rear half crushed. Dreading what was coming next, I felt the truck slowly creep up to the animal, steering around it at first, but turning slightly so the rear wheel lined up directly with the animal. When we stopped, the tire came in contact with its skull. Brake stand! The driver yelled with glee. The others cheered on. The truck's interior thick and damp with the hot breath of anticipation and the stink of teenage boys. We then proceeded to spin the tires for what felt like an eternity on the poor animal's head. Bones crushing, the slippery feel of wetness under the wheel as it spun, and eventually smoke, squeals, and the smell of burning rubber. It was incomprehensible. Most horrible thing I'd ever encountered in my life, and I'd never, ever since seen such blatant disregard. No, utter contempt for another's life. And yet this, too, was in part my doing. Had I acted, had I shouted loud enough or grabbed the wheel from him, that animal, too, would have lived. Maybe I'm innocent. If you do wrong without meaning to do wrong, is the act still wrong? Or is it simply an act? Is the decision or failure to take action an act in itself? Without a conscious choice, am I truly to blame? What if I blacked out? What if I were blind? If I couldn't see, would the consequence of my blindness put me to blame? As a blind man walks through a museum and knocks a priceless artifact to the floor, where it shatters into a thousand pieces, is he a vandal? Perhaps he should have remained home. Perhaps by doing so, he would not have risked the repercussions of his choice. But then, self-imprisoned, he will either destine himself to starvation or require the help of another to remain fed. What then if the person was to die in a car crash on the way to bring him his dinner? Was the blind man's selfishness the cause for his Samaritan's death? Simply by existing, we affect others. Our actions reverberate throughout time and space, and the ultimate results of our actions remain unknown and unseen to us. My baby, 
her life so quickly ended would not have existed had it not been for me. My existence and choice to exist had, through my actions and efforts, caused another person to exist and to have its freedom stolen forever. Someone to t- has to take the fall. Why not me? We don't exist before we're brought into being. Until that moment of conception, that moment when two cells unite and a new life sparks, we simply never were. The problem is that this is a gift, or more accurately, a curse we never asked for. Had I known then, at the time of my creation, the massive effect and responsibility mere existence entails, how it spins and alters all existence of others and the desperate meaningless of it all, I would have chosen not to be. But you can't choose not to be. To possess the knowledge and faculty to make such a decision, you must already be, and as such cannot be presented with a choice without existing in the first place. By that spark from which our existence ignites, we are forever ordained to exist from thenceforward. We exist for eternity. Even after we've rotted to nothing, the ripples of consequence flowing from our existence still remain and reverberate forever. Every person I touched, directly or indirectly, had their trajectory altered by my presence. Even after I'm long gone, my presence will still have repercussions. Perhaps one day a man will come across my gravestone, twist his ankle while bending down to read the fading words, and be sent to the hospital. Maybe he'll fall in love with the doctor at the hospital, marry and have a full, wonderful, and joyful life. Or maybe he'll contract a horrible disease from another patient, and his life will be cut tragically short. Even when I no longer live, I still exist. Will I then be the one to blame for the man's sickness and death? If only I die a day earlier or later, if only I'd been stranded at sea, washed up on a desert island and died there, alone, forgotten. These variances would merely alter the future in different ways. Still, I would exist, forever altering the trajectory of time, only the resulting reality would be changed. Changed, but still affected by my having lived. That baby, that poor dead baby, she will now always have existed. She'll have changed the life of me, the abortionist, Danielle, you. She did not choose to exist, but without her having existed, you'd very likely be at home sleeping in your bed. You and I never would have met, and your life would have gone a very different direction than the turn it took today. Probably just a continued trajectory among among your straight path, but I, Danielle, the abortionist, the maker of my mattress, the owner of the vineyard that grew the grapes for the wine that led to that specific intercourse, we all pulled you astray. I may have forced this on you, but still you listened to me attentively. As I spoke, your eyes never wavered from my face. Your full attention was mine. I wonder, if I had given you the choice, would you have run, or would you have stayed, anticipating the next words to flow from my tongue as I told my stories? Confined... You are not truly a prisoner until your goal is escape. Was that secretly your wish? To escape? Or was it instead to listen? To listen and judge? I'm sorry, but I... I just can't. Chapter 27 I thought myself broken here. Broken and beaten until at last I was nothing. But now I see that I've only just increased my freedom further. My actions, I see, are mine alone. Everything that has happened here has been due to me embracing my freedom and by extension restricting and assaulting yours. I do feel bad for having forced you, for it was rather selfish. But it was also spectacularly helpful. I'd get down on my knees and pray, but I have no true faith. My life is unfettered by complexities and duties to that which I cannot witness existing. Thank you for being there for me. Thank you for listening. My life has been simple, and I've done wrongs. But they are my wrongs, and I must accept them. My problem wasn't a mistake in my codes, but rather a mistake in understanding the consequences of my actions. I feel for that dead child. I do, but it is dead. It cannot ever not be dead. Danielle cannot ever have not gotten impregnated by me. These are the results of my existence, and as I can now see, results of my existence will continue well beyond my passing. 
The difference, though, with the effects of my existence once I have gone, they are no longer by my choice, and above all, they are no longer of my concern. So now the question, what do we do with you? You and I both know I can't just let you go. Don't be silly, I can't kill you. I have something better in mind. Chapter 28. It still amazes me what these devices are capable of. When I was a child, the mere idea hadn't even existed. And now here we are carrying supercomputers around in our jacket pockets. Access to anything, anywhere. Capable of so much more than even the simple phones they started as. A phone, a watch, a television, a record collection, a library of knowledge, a public soapbox, a social connector, and social destroyer. All here in a little brick small enough to fit in a single hand. I researched you before I chose you. I tracked you down like a dog. I didn't have just a fleeing fancy one evening and exclaim, Hey, you know what would be a splendid idea for a night of fun? And then run down the street and grab the first I could find first person I could find. No, it was nothing like that. With this technology I hold in my hand, we have access to everything. Some of it you shared yourself. Other tidbits I was able to find out just by backtracking through your trail of friends, connections, tweets, and tags. <clears throat> it's crazy what people share now. Share of their own free will. There were many others like you who would have been easier to work with, but they were also clean. You weren't, though. You had dirt. Under that rug of yours, you've swept many things. But the problem with the rug is that it can always be lifted. There's nowhere for secrets to go anymore. The incinerators of truth stopped burning long ago when everything was digitized, uploaded, and stored in this nebulous cloud. Now our secrets can only be hidden, shuffled off to corners in dark places, nested subfolders in forgotten servers where, however distant, they continue to persist. Sometimes we forget about them, other times their continued presence gnaws at us, like an infestation in our walls that we just can't kill off. But our secrets don't die. Not when someone knows where to look. If you get the right building inspector in your home, secrets will be revealed. Your secrets were rather easy to uncover. He might have tried to hide them, but you're oblivious to the footprints you've left in this 21st century digital sand. I followed your footprints. I know who you are. Chapter 29 I wonder, could you be damned? What if I were to expose a truth about you that would be sure to end your life as you know it? Something to send you off in shame and exile, hoping only to be forgotten so you can find some semblance of a life. I've shared my deepest, darkest secrets with you. I've told you things for which I am ashamed, and some of which, should the truth come to light, could do me harm. What's more, I've damaged you. Why would you not hurt me in return? Share my secrets to the world. Turn me into the authorities. Truthfully, there's no proof we were ever here tonight. I didn't rent this place online, but rather found it online. A great little house, far from the unmasking lights of the city, devoid of the prying eyes of neighbors, and most of all, free from any tenants. It's simply amazing what information people will share on the internet, practically begging someone to come rob them while they're away. Now, I'll clean up after we've gone, and it would be just your word against mine should you choose to report me to the police the people I know however those who you could contact those you could share my stories with in an attempt to destroy the life I have so carefully curated if my history were to be made public there are places where I've been where that would be very interesting news indeed and that news would follow me everywhere I go but what I know about you puts us in a stalemate, which, let's be honest, is about the best we can ask for for now. What do you have to say for yourself? Chapter 30. Perhaps it's time I called Danielle to tell her I'm sorry. Please do your best to stay quiet, will you? I'm having a hard enough time concentrating as it is. Maybe a quick conversation with someone I love will pull me out of her present situation and reveal a hidden epiphany so we can finish this. Chapter 31 Hello? 
Yes, I know what time it is. I had to call you. I've had a long night searching my soul, really working through everything with the help of a friend. And I realized I was wrong. I was wrong to have reacted the way I did. But more so, I was wrong to have influenced you in such a way. Yes, I know it was your decision. I accept that. I just thought maybe I... Perhaps I'd influenced you somehow. Okay, the choice was yours to make. I just wish you told me first. It's not something I was ready for. Can we move on past this? I'm so sorry. But I do want to. There was so much more than that. I love you. I realize that now. I love you and I want to be with you. Doesn't that change anything? What do you mean just for fun? Just don't say that. It was more. I know it was. Danny. I love you. Hello, Danny. Are you there? Hello? The bitch hung up on me. The fucking bitch hung up on me. I told her I loved her. Wasn't that what she needed? To feel that I was hers? For me to admit it freely? That I'd given myself to her? I don't understand. What do I do now? It's done. This. This is all done. I have nothing left. I don't know what to do. I just can't. Fuck. It truly is over with her, and I, I feared it would be, but nonetheless hoped otherwise. My, tr my pride has destroyed me again. Why do I do these things? Why do I continually destroy myself time and time again? Do I act in love or in self-defense? Is there even a difference between the two? I haven't experienced love beyond love for myself. I don't know that it can even exist. So when I ask for her back, when I apologize, it's to repair myself. To make myself once again whole. I feared restrictions from love, but now I see that love is nothing but acting in one's own self-interest. To improve oneself by uplifting another. So love, self-defense... These are both acts with the same purpose, to preserve and protect oneself. In the end, though, no matter what, I just, I just end up destroyed. Chapter 32. The sun's coming up. I can make it out through the trees. The light just breaking over the horizon. It's funny how the light precedes it. Even before you can catch the glimpse of the sun itself, the sky is already brightening. A soft glow... Lighting the skyline subtly, hinting at the new day to come. I'll leave the shades open so we can continue, or so we can enjoy together this beautiful dawning of a new day. It looks like the storm's passed. It's still hard to see much out there, but the leaves all appear to be gone from their branches. Now I'm just thrown like a ruffled blanket across the ground. Once the sun rises and they dry, they'll begin to be shifted again by the wind, scattered to find new homes, new graves. New places to get stuck, settle and freeze, only to rot away in the coming spring thaw. For now, they'll fill our noses with their sweet autumn air, but in time they too will be gone. Return to the earth to feed their mothers and to birth new creatures. Salamander eggs, toad homes, a feast for the worms. They'll dance again soon, but their dancing days are numbered. I hope they enjoy their final dances. I hope someone gets to see their last graceful ballet. As autumn turns to winter, these comforting scents fade. As the cold extinguishes the perfume from the air, we're only left with drippy noses, interrupted only by the occasional whiff of fresh-cut pine as we quest for our perfect Christmas tree. The poor trees, their only purpose for existing is to grow until they are just right, their lives snuffed out, not in their youth, nor in their prime, but in their adolescence when they're tall enough to grace the festive homes but not yet fully formed adults. Then they die, slowly, in front of our holiday fires, sucking up what water they can during their last days, yearning for a reprieve from their sentence, but only prolonging their slow, inevitable, withering death. Then they're gone. Dry, brittle, and brown, we leave them on our curbs, only to be carelessly thrown into a wood chipper to become mulched to protect the tender roots of new saplings, awaiting their fates as well, unknowingly being grown for our own selfishly human purposes. That smell, that smell of winter, of trees, 
It's a scent I remember fondly. Not for Christmases and Santa Claus and stars and mangers, but rather because it's so reminiscent of juniper. Most people don't choose juniper for their trees, instead preferring something like a Norway spruce. But a fragrance is similar nonetheless. The smell of juniper, the way the bouquet rolls and fills your nostrils. Like a good, strong gin. Flushed all my drugs, those I still had at least. And I heard the news from Danny. The habit had been mostly behind me prior to her entrance in my life, but in her youth, youthful exuberance, I found a desire to join her. To regain my own youth, I partied with her like a rock star. I lied to you earlier. I lied out of shame. I went with her and her friends out to the club once, very early in our relationship. The clubs hadn't changed much since my time, still dark, bright, flashing lights striking you as they pulsed the music. Illuminating eyes, a cheekbone, an exposed thigh. Loud music, bright lights, drinks and drugs. The only thing missing was a layer of cigarette smoke. Why they ban cigarettes in such places is beyond my comprehension. They are by far the least dangerous thing ingested there. And without the cloudiness they bring, I frankly felt naked and exposed. There's nowhere to hide when the lights hit you. When the lights hit me. The eyes, the eyes stung like daggers. There's nothing that can make you feel obsolete, quite like being surrounded by youth. When that youth is aware of you and stares at you, you just don't have any way out. You can't hide, you can't turn back the clocks. Danielle didn't mind the looks she got when she was with me. She enjoyed them, I think. She enjoyed the thoughts of others judging her, thinking she was just a stupid little girl being used and abused by some sick older man. She knew better, of course, and secretly this knowledge gave her pleasure. The pleasure in knowing that the representation... The view you give of yourselves to others is interpreted in all but its true form. She was the center of an apparent scandal, and it showered her with attention. Yet she was no victim. If anyone was a victim, it was me. I just really didn't mind. What I did mind, though, were the judging eyes on me. Danny could use me all she wanted. We both were using each other, after all. Each of us had our own goals in mind for the relationship. And so long as they didn't contradict one another, that was completely fine. The ends were what mattered, and we both certainly got ours. No, I was naked and exposed at those clubs. It was a world I didn't fit in any longer. 20 years ago? Yeah. But dance clubs are no place for a 46-year-old man. I found no pleasure there. Alone with Danny, yes, but in her other youthful world, a world I'd lived in and left behind many, many years ago? No. Still, I envied her youth. She was alive. In all parts of her being, she was alive. Parties didn't end when she came to my place. They just morphed into a new form. She reintroduced me to the sugar-sweet coma of a good hit. Waking and sleeping, the habit had taken me over again. I lived in nothing but bliss, except for the times when I was coming down. But then all I had to do was give her a call. She'd come, and we'd hit it again. But that night, after she told me of her pregnancy, of her pregnancy and the abortion, that news brought me down. I was disgusted with myself, and it was one of those moments where you decide to regain control of your life to get your shit together. Everything I have flushed, everything I had I have flushed, flushed or poured down the drain. It was time to clean up, to think clearly, to figure out what to do next. And here we are. That smell. That smell is fantastic. I hadn't realized how much I missed it. God, that deep breaths filling my nostrils I can taste how good it feels and I can't I haven't even had a drink I don't know if you call it luck or simply the devil's work but I think it's providence that this home should have a fully stocked liquor cabinet it's all top shelf stuff too some of the best scotch I've seen in a personal collection but scotch has never been my poison no my poison was and always will be gin and this gin this is the stuff I used to drink like water I forgot how as you take your first sip, you can feel it burn against your cheeks, an involuntary shiver as you swallow. Swallow it down into your gullet. Then, even after the drink, its ghost remains, floating through your mouth and inhabiting your cranium, waiting for the next sip to come and refill your mouth and sinuses and head again. I can feel it now. That little swimming as the alcohol enters my bloodstream. It's why I prefer gin, you know. A good gin goes down smooth and hits you gently, but still, suddenly, your world begins to swirl as the buzz washes over you, sending things spinning just a bit. 
enough to forget the cares of life, to forget your worries. You're just there, slightly off, slightly off kilter, drinking some gin, just being. I can't tell you when the last time was I felt this way. So numb, yet so pained. I feel I've shared everything with you. I've exposed more of myself than I ever knew was there, and it both surprises and disgusts me. Not a visceral disgust, where I want to push myself away at my mere reflection, but it's a disgust filled with pity and sorrow. Such a sad, pathetic man I've become. I think I'll have another drink. I'd offer you one, but whatever. Chapter 33. So here we find ourselves. I've told you so much, much more than I ever imagined, more than I ever knew about myself before tonight. My truth has been given to you completely, yet what I've confessed isn't something I want the world to know. If I let you go, the consequences are unfathomable. I go to prison. I can't live a life where my freedom has been stripped of me. I'd lose any freedom that remains. But can I kill you? I don't think I have that in me either. As I said, I've n I'm no murderer, not by conscious decision. Can I kill myself? No. I have too much pride. And again, I'm not a murderer. So I ask you, what options remain? How do we break from this stalemate? This position where if I just let you go, You'll destroy me. I suppose I could try to destroy you in turn, but who would believe someone like me? Your secrets, I don't even know if I can compare them to my own. Now that I've really looked at myself. Even if you were to personally forgive me and promise your silence, even then I have nothing but your word to allow me to sleep at night. It will always be there, hovering over me. The fact that someone knows my true nature, someone other than myself, that at any time, he could share it with the world. <sighs> and so I can only come up with one solution. The only solution is for you to kill me. I'm certainly not going to kill myself. Take the gun. Feel its tough walnut and cold steel in your hands. It's heavier than it looks, isn't it? Chamber's loaded. I found the shells stashed away in a drawer while you were sleeping. All you have to do is point and shoot, and our time will be done. Kill me. I told you, I cannot do it myself. I said, kill me. And still you refuse. You must kill me or I will be forced to kill you. Either way, only one of us can make it out of here. It's the only way either of us can live with any modicum of freedom after tonight. Take your gun in your hands, put your finger on the trigger, and point it at my face. I'll point the other at you. If you can't kill me by the count of three, my hand will be forced. I pray it doesn't come to that. I really don't want to become a murderer. <laughs> Would you look at that? The sun has risen. It's a new day. Now on three. One, two, thank you. Uh, for those of you who watched, I really appreciate it. Um, I hope you found the story enjoyable. Um, that's it. That is how it ends. That is the story of A Confession, my novel. Uh, if you would like to buy a copy, they're available on Amazon.com. You can always go to my website at William F. Eicher. That's A-I-C-H-E-R dot com at the end there. Um, and that's it. Thank you.